Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you as I read the prayer to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Uh, President, a committee has lodged a proposal as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I call the clerk. Private Senators' Bills, Order of the Day No. 25, Commonwealth Electoral Amendment Banning Dirty Donations Bill 2022, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. I'm just waiting for the deputy. <laughs> Senator Thanks very much, uh, Deputy President. And I welcome the opportunity to reintroduce this bill today and to continue our efforts to get big money out of politics. If passed, this bill would stop dirty industries with a track record of seeking to influence decision makers through donations. The fossil fuel sector, banking, defence, pharmaceutical, liquor, tobacco and gambling industries. It would stop them from making political donations to buy outcomes to suit them. This bill would also limit the amount that can be donated by individuals and all other entities to $3,000 per electoral term, minimising the opportunity for anybody's big money to buy outcomes. There's never been a more important time for donation reform. Our democracy is in trouble. Public trust in parliament and politicians is at an all-time low and the community feels less and less confident that their representatives represent them as opposed to the corporate donors. It's no wonder. $230 million have flowed in corporate donations to the Labor, Liberal and National parties in the past decade, from the likes of the big banks, from industries like mining, defence and big pharma, from property developers and from alcohol, tobacco and gambling companies. These are just some of the industries that have paid the Liberal, National and Labor parties to put their private profits ahead of the needs of our community. Now, these industries are not donating millions of dollars because they believe in the institution of strong democracy. They're donating because it gets results for them. The Greens have maintained the Democracy for Sale website for over a decade, tracking publicly disclosed political donations and putting the spotlight on influence peddling. In 2018, the Select Senate Committee on the Political Influence of Donations laid out examples of the nexus between donations made by industry bodies and public policy outcomes or project approvals. The cosy relationships and the proximity of donations and policy outcomes that boost industry profits suggest undue influence. And the community continues to pay the price through climate inaction, propping up destructive gambling practices, and governments that refuse to make corporations pay their fair share of tax so that everyday people can get the education, health care, dental care and income support that they need. Until we break the hold of dirty donations over the big parties, over all parties, big corporations will keep winning and the community will keep losing. 
recognising the corrosive influence of donations from the development sector uh, and the influence that they'd had on planning policy, infrastructure and development, the Queensland and New South Wales uh, governments have both legislated to restrict political donations from property developers. The High Court has upheld those regulations, and this bill seeks to extend those to the federal arena, but it also recognises the influence of other key industries. Since 2012, the fossil fuel and resources industries have donated over $9 million to both of the major political parties. The Australia Institute estimates that in 2021 to 2022 alone, Australian governments handed out $11.6 billion in subsidies to fossil fuel giants in things like grants, loans, cheap fuel and accelerated depreciation. That was $1.3 billion more than in the previous year, despite there being a COVID crisis that saw so many ordinary Australians struggling to make ends meet. What a great return on investment. Rather than turning off the tap in the most recent budget, the new Labor government gifted $1.9 billion of new money for gas in the Northern Territory, on top of continuing the nearly $40 billion uh, in Morrison government uh, fossil fuel subsidies, including $40 million for fuel tax credits enjoyed by that industry. Again, a very good return on investment for fossil fuel donors and a terrible deal for the climate and the rest of us. Generous donations uh, bought a Liberal government at the time that was completely paralysed by the words climate change. At the same time as the Australian community was facing a future of more extreme bushfires, crippling droughts and floods. Donations continue to cloud the judgment of the Albanese Labor government as new coal and gas projects keep getting approvals and public money. The gas industry donates millions of dollars, so it was no great surprise when the former Prime Minister appointed his gas industry mates to a National COVID Coordination Commission without even needing to declare their conflicts of interest. It was also no surprise that the Commission then ultimately called for a gas-led recovery that directly benefited the gas industry despite strong support for a renewables-led recovery from scientists, from economists and from policy analysts. Again, the community lost the opportunity for a sustainable recovery because governments are beholden to fossil fuel donors. The cosy relationships and financial support have led to a situation where, despite overwhelming scientific and economic evidence that we will not even reach the weak 43 per cent emissions reductions targets unless we end our attachment to fossil fuels, the Albanese government refuses to rule out any of the 113 coal and gas projects that are currently under consideration. In fact, they continue to hand out public money to support destructive new projects in the Beedaloo Basin, Scarborough and more. We saw the bullying tactics by the Minerals Council kill the Rudd government's mining super profits tax, and now we're seeing the Minerals Council use the same tactics against the Queensland Labor government's current plans to get resources companies to pay more. Those threats only work because the major parties rely on donations. The possibility generous donations will be withdrawn is the leverage the industry uses to keep governments in check. The banking and financial sector is also a regular contributor and beneficiary. The sector has donated about $76 million since 2012 to both sides of politics, and that support secured them immunity for some time, despite the evidence of customers being ripped off right around the country. Both of the major parties had to be dragged to the Banking Royal Commission, something the Greens had campaigned for since 2014, following scandal after scandal and public backlash over their inaction. How much faster would the Commission have happened if the Liberal, National and Labor parties weren't on the payroll of the banks? And would we have seen stronger action in response to the scathing Royal Commission report? The gambling industry is another significant uh, donor to state and federal political parties, and their influence can be seen in the deeply entrenched support for poker machines throughout Australia, including exemptions for clubs from COVID restrictions, even when so many other venues suffered. And despite the innumerable uh, human uh, suffering and toll that the gambling industry wreaks on ordinary people, property developers also continue to throw their donations weight around while fighting against planning restrictions or tax reforms or stronger environmental laws. In Queensland, a destructive proposal for a canal estate within a Ramsar-listed Toonda wetlands, the gateway to Minjerabar or Strobark Island, as um, Mianjin folk know it, that should never have gotten past the first hurdle. 
The department, the Federal Environment Department, recommended that the project be rejected as clearly unacceptable. And yet the property developer, Walker Corporation, was a generous political donor. And hey presto, the minister then allowed the deeply flawed proposal to proceed through the assessment phase. It was not rejected at the outset, like the department had suggested it should be. The minister at the time, who was uh, Mr Frydenberg, even explored the possibility of changing the Ramsar boundaries to accommodate the proposal. And we have the documentary evidence of that. I live in hope that the new environment minister will finally reject this destructive proposal, but the local community should never have had to fight so hard and for so long against such a clearly unacceptable development. Now, these are only the donations that we know about, none of which have been illegal. It doesn't include the money paid to attend business forums or cash for access meetings. It ignores the exorbitant subscription or membership fees, and it doesn't include money funneled through representative and fundraising bodies. But regardless of the source or the amount, the obvious expectation from industry is that donations will return results. They're buying outcomes. This feeds the public perception that decisions in this place are made improperly with self-interest and with the interests of donors and mates consistently overriding the public interest. In banning political donations from those industries that have a history of seeking to influence policy decisions, this bill implements a key recommendation of the Senate Select Committee into the political influence of donations. It would make it an offence for a prohibited donor to make a donation or solicit another person to make a donation on their behalf. It would also be an offence to accept a donation from a prohibited donor. Another committee recommendation that this bill seeks to implement is to limit other political donations to $3,000 in an election term, or $1,000 per year. As the High Court recognised in McCloy v New South Wales, the uncontrolled use of wealth to influence decision-making compromises equal participation in democracy. By aggregating and capping political donations made by any person or entity, this bill seeks to level the playing field and avoid those with more money getting greater access to decision makers. The bill will limit donations made for political purposes, but is not intended to limit donations made to third parties to support their non-campaign activities. The important work done by civil society organisations, many of them charities, must be allowed to continue. We will continue to call for the introduction of electoral expenditure caps to balance the participation of civil society organisations in the political process. This bill complements other reforms to strengthen the disclosure regime that the government has finally committed to acting on, including lowering the disclosure threshold and requiring real-time disclosure of donations so people aren't waiting 18 months to find out who's buying who. The Greens strongly support these measures, but we recognise that transparency alone will not remove the corrupting influence of political donations. The 2022 election results confirms that the Australian public want more transparent and representative governments that act in the public interest. This bill is an important first step towards getting big money out of politics and restoring public confidence in our democracy. If we are committed to enhancing the democratic process, which is surely something that every parliament should regularly turn its mind to, this should be a priority. This bill does not stifle debate or prevent individuals from donating a small amount to support a political party. It bans donations from industries that have become associated with having a corrupting influence on how we work as decision makers, and it will return democracy to the community. Democracy should not be for sale to the highest bidder. And it's about time that we banned those big corrupting uh, donations to political parties and capped the amount that anyone can donate to support the political party or grouping of their choice. I commend this bill to the Senate. Senator McAllister. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Well, democracy is precious. And it's one of the most important features of our obligations here in the Senate to think carefully about the work that we do here and the way that it protects and bolsters our really proud legacy as a multicultural democratic nation, a nation with a universal franchise. And we should always be thinking carefully about the way that our system supports and recognises that. 
One of the puzzling things about being a participant in debates in this chamber over the last few years is the consistent approach that the Greens political party takes to democratic institutions. Because almost every occasion that sees the Senate debate these questions sees members of the Greens political party come into this chamber and talk endlessly about how democracy is broken. Strangely, for a party that I think would see democracy as a core part of their tenets, the Greens political party choose always to assert that democracy doesn't work. And I would invite Green senators to carefully reflect on the consequences of that narrative. Because one of the interesting things from sitting in this part of the chamber as a, a member of a party or government and sitting on that side of the chamber as a member of a major political party that seeks to form government and enact change through the institution of government, I observe very close relationships between the rhetorical positioning of members who sit on that side of the crossbench and members who sit on that side of the crossbench. Because what the Greens political party and One Nation have in common is a determination to tell their voters and their supporters that democracy doesn't work. And that's the basis of their pitch to voters. It's important that we talk about our democratic institutions, and we'll always welcome that conversation. And I do thank the Greens for putting it on the agenda today. But I invite you, as a political party, to think about the consequences of that contribution and to reflect on the similarities between your own approach and the rhetorical approach taken by some of the people that I know that you do not agree with. I look, I look forward to your Senator Shoebridge, I look forward to your second reading when it comes. The, um, the truth is that electoral reform requires support from across the parliament. Um, and in August this year, as is always the case after an election, the special minister of state asked the joint standing committee on electoral matters to inquire into and report into on all aspects of the conduct of the 2022 federal election. And I think the terms of that referral are important and significant and provide an important opportunity for all senators in this chamber to participate in a structured way in a dialogue with other political parties and civil society about how we best conduct elections. But it is worth looking at the terms because they refer to reforms to political donation laws, particularly the applicability of real-time disclosure and a reduction of the disclosure threshold to a fixed $1,000. Potential reforms to the funding of elections, particularly regarding electoral expenditure caps and public funding of political parties and candidates. And thirdly, the potential for truth in political advertising laws to enhance the integrity and transparency of the electoral system. As a government, we are interested in exploring with the parliament the ways that we can improve and enhance our electoral systems, and we're interested in doing that in a collaborative way, not in a way that seeks to score cheap political points uh, off political opponents. And the truth is that we are very proud, as a party, of the contribution that we have made in leading reforms to electoral laws. It was Labor that secured the ban on foreign donations, protecting our political system from foreign interference. It was Labor's amendments that linked public funding to campaign expenditure, preventing parties from profiting from the political system. You go back to Bob Hawke in 1983. Under, under Labor, under Prime Minister Hawke, we introduced a donations disclosure regime for the first time. It's a Labor reform. And we do those things because we know that transparency is the key to preventing and identifying corruption. I think that those are shared values across the chamber, or at least I hope that they are. And it's why we continue to drive a reform agenda. It's actually Labor, not the opposition or indeed the Greens, who have been driving the agenda for political donation reform over a very long time, driving the agenda for transparency and driving 
the agenda for government accountability. It was Labor who fought for that ban on foreign political donations. The Liberal Party didn't want to stop taking donations from foreign sources despite the risk of foreign influence to our democracy, and they had to be dragged kicking and screaming to accept those amendments. It was Labor, of course, who protected charities and Thank you, Deputy President. I do want to draw your attention to the interjections persistently coming from Senator Shoebridge. I know you've already raised the matter directly with him in the chamber, but I do ask that you draw his attention to your ruling earlier. Senator Shoebridge, please exercise restraint. It is Labor working to protect charities and not-for-profits from government legislation from the previous government that sought to silence and suppress their political advocacy. It's Labor again delivering an independent anti-corruption commission. Now, we should in this chamber hold ourselves to the highest standards. We should be concerned about the persistent data and information that comes to us about declining trust in public institutions. I'd like to see this chamber firmly commit to an entirely cross-party approach to improving the standard of democratic institutions and improving trust in the parliament and all of the institutions of government. But I would make the point that I began with. I think it's important that we talk up our democracy. I think we should talk up how incredibly successful we are in having transparent elections conducted with integrity, with universal franchise that the public have confidence in. I don't think it's helpful to constantly and repeatedly assert that those processes are not working for Australians. And I do think it has real consequences when people persist in that approach. We will take a different approach. It is to say that we have done well, but we can always do better. Everyone in this chamber has the opportunity to do so. I note the process going along uh, that is on foot at the moment through the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. But this is an important opportunity for a conversation, and I look forward to the contributions from other senators. Senator McGrath. Oh, thank you, Deputy President. Imagine waking up a Green. Just imagine waking up a member of, of the Greens of Australia. Just, you'd just wake up each morning, just be so angry with the world. You'd wake up and they just they wake up and they just punch the pillows because they're so angry with the world. I just I feel sorry for the Greens that, that woe is me, woe is me that Australia was such a bad place that we're all going to hell in a handcart and guess, guess what's going to make Australia a better place? We're going to stop someone who owns a pub from giving a donation to a political party. Because that's, that's, that's what this bill is about. This bill is about, about stopping someone who own, owns a pub, whether it's the Queen's Arm or the Sandy Creek pub down the road from me, um, uh, the Ainsley Hotel, any of the, the many pubs across Queensland that if, if the, the publican and, and their family want to give 50 bucks or 100 bucks to, to a local political party, whether it's the, you know, the Sun, Ripe, Sun Ripe and Warm Tomato Party or the, or the Greens um, uh, or, the, or the LNP or Labor, that nah, you own a pub, you support so many community groups, but we, we, you can't give 50 or 100 bucks to your local political party, because that's going to make Australia a better place by stopping, by stopping people who own pubs uh, Waters, from giving donations. Senator McGrath, I have a point of order. Thank you. A point of order on misleading the Senate. The limit is $1,000 a year, and I'm sure Senator McGrath will get enough free booze anyway based on previous years. Well, I, I, thank you for uh, alerting Senator McGrath to the, to the, the, the um, Clauses in the bill. I haven't read. I haven't read the bill, but I think Senator McGrath was referring to, not necessarily the maximum, but anyway. 
Oh, under, under, and, and you're a very lucky deputy president. Um, you do read the bill. It's about five minutes of your life. You're not going to get back in a hurry. So um, I'd suggest you go for a walk. You know, that's my get, choice. Get, in you know, car. pat a cat. My choice. You know, how I deal with my life. Uh, kiss a dog. Do something like that. But do not read this bill because this, this is uh, a waste of space, a waste of time in writing. Um, in writing. This is what this is. It, people wonder what people in Canberra get up to. Well, guess what? We waste time on pointless bills like this. Pointless bills that want to stop law-abiding Australians from supporting the political party or the political cause of their choice. That's what this is about. This is about the Greens who have become the Puritans of, of Australian politics. They've become the Puritans. You know, soon we're going to be all walking around um, sort of like the brides of green, sort of wearing these sort of dark green, soft green sort of outfits, covering up any, any bodily features because the, the greens have become so puritanical in wanting to stop people from having fun unless it's their type of fun. And quite frankly, what the Greens uh, get up to in their spare time is, I, I don't care, I'm a libertarian. If they want to um, do things behind closed doors with the windows shut, they can do it. Um, but if someone is involved in a legal industry, if someone, if someone is running a pub, oh, because pubs are terrible places, aren't they, ladies and gentlemen? Pubs are terrible places. This shows how out of touch the Greens are, because around Queensland, and I'm someone, Deputy President, who each year sends out a pub calendar. I pay for it myself and send out a pub calendar because guess what pubs do? Pubs are actually community groups. Pubs are a community organisation. Country pubs do so much for their local organisations. And I look at the pubs in my district and in the Darling Downs, and I look and you go past, and so often you'll see. Um, a, 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 a ton of cars out the front of a pub at 11 o'clock in the morning. You think, geez, people are you know, starting early today. You know, you know what it is? Often they're having community meetings there. They're, they're using the pub as the local community hall to talk about land care, to talk about, to talk about, to talk about issues impacting the local community. Because what pubs do is they are the bastion of their local community. But under, under, under this bill by the Greens, they don't want those people supporting political parties or supporting political causes. Heaven help me. Ah, oh, because publicans are such bad people. So if you don't think that people should, be should, should participate in the democratic process, well, why don't you just go and ban them? Go and ban pubs. Look, because this is why the Greens are the Puritans, the Puritans of Australian politics. They don't want you to have fun. They want to ban stuff that they don't like. They're quite happy you know, to sit in their, their darkened corners and you know, munch on a bit of moss and sort of talk to each other about the grand old days when Bob Brown was lead and wasn't it fantastic? Uh, we stopped everything from happening in Tasmania. Isn't it brilliant? Unemployment rates up to 20 per cent under our policies. That's, that's what the Greens are all about because they're the party of misery. I'm just waking up a Green each morning. I suppose it could be worse. You could wake up next to a Green. But anyway. Um, but the other thing they want to ban, the other thing they want to ban is they want to ban. Um, and I, you know, I have wasted five or ten minutes of my life, you know, reading this bill because, quite frankly, um, uh, you know, an episode of Andor hasn't come out. Andor is a great series for those people who are, um, who are watching it. Anyway, I got up to episode 12 last week. Got to wait for the next series to come out. So um, they also want to stop um, people who who. Um, to give money to political parties who are involved in the sale, marketing or distribution of pharmaceutical products. So they want to stop pharmacists. They want to stop chemists. They want to stop community pharmacy. So the other bastion of, of, of regional towns and of suburbs and of the villages across Australia, those evil people, are pharmacists. Um, do you know who one of the most trusted professions in Australia are? Pharmacists, community pharmacy. So they want to stop community pharmacists, those people who do so much for, for the health and well-being of, of, of Australians, they want to stop that evil industry, pharmacists, from getting involved in the political process by supporting a political cause. I mean, are you serious? Like, what were you on when you wrote this? Like, 
You probably were on something that was either prescribed to you by a pharmacist and you overdosed on it, or quite frankly, you should go to a pharmacist and get some medication to stop you from writing such rubbish. This is just bonkers stuff. There are so many more important issues in Australia at the moment that I'm sure this chamber couldn't be united upon in terms of how we can make the best country in the world that much better. But quite frankly, um, being a bunch of wowsers on heat and wandering down the main streets of, of, of the towns and villages of, of Australia, being these Puritans and stopping law-abiding citizens from participating in the democratic process does not assist, doesn't help democracy at all. What this does is it stops people from participating in democracy. It stops law-abiding people from participating in democracy, and that is not a good thing. That is not a good thing. I, I refer to the comments by, by Senator McAllister. In the government, as is the case, after each election, regardless of the political colours of, of the government, write to, to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters and ask them to conduct an inquiry into into the previous election. And there are specific terms of reference that, that uh, Senator Farrell has put in his letter asking the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters to inquire into. And I sit on this, this committee um, along with Senator Cadell, and, and we are taking a very serious and sober look into, into the, the running of the 2022 election and also looking into the proposals by by the Labor Party that they have outlined. And it, and it won't surprise people in this chamber to know that, of course, we do oppose uh, uh, um, many of the proposals that have been put forward by the Labor Party, for example, giving New Zealanders, uh, the, the, uh, uh, New Zealanders and, and other foreigners the right to vote in Australian elections. We, we oppose that. Um, uh, we, we certainly will, will oppose uh, spending caps, because uh, we do not believe that spending caps will assist in, in promoting a pluralistic democracy, when you look at what's happened in Queensland, which is not run, the Queensland state elections are not run on an electoral system that is fair in Queensland, there is a financial gerrymander. The political parties in Queensland, for example, are capped at spending $15 million, uh, but unions are capped at $10 million. Uh, there are 26 registered trade unions in Queensland. Uh, there is one Labor Party, there is one Liberal National Party and the Greens and, and various other minor parties. But what it means is that those on, on the centre-right of politics are capped at spending $15 million in an electoral cycle, but those on the left, the Greens, Labor, 26 unions, uh, well, 26 times 10 is 260 for those who are arithmetically challenged. That's $260 million that the, uh, the, that the unions can spend campaigning against the election of a Liberal National Party government, plus $30 million from the Greens. That's $290 million, whereas my party is limited to $15 million. So there is a complete and utter financial gerrymander. There is no fair electoral system in Queensland. And what, what under the pros, proposals that I suspect Labor may bring forward, is that they will bring in a, attempt to bring in a financial gerrymander at a federal level. And that would not be fair and that would not be appropriate. But also what is not fair and not appropriate is, is, is to bring in a, 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 a similar financial gerrymander that locks out those who are engaged in legal industries, locks them out from participating in the democratic process. So if you don't think to go through that, 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 that someone who is involved in uh, the defence industry or a financial institution or work, who has a pub or in the resource sector or um, in the, it, you know, runs a chemist or anything like that, if you, or a property developer. Now, if you don't think that those people should participate in, a, in the democratic process, well, that just shows the Stalinistic approach of the Greens to a pluralistic democracy, uh, but it also shows that the failure to understand how the Australian economy works, because you talk at, at the tens of thousands of people, indeed the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Australians who depend on these industries. And so what the Greens are saying, Deputy President, is that you might work for your local pub, 
but you're a bad person because you work for a pub. We don't like pubs because we don't like fun. We don't like people getting out and enjoying themselves. We don't think your pub should be able to uh, donate or support a political party of your choice, unless it's the Greens, because let's face it, the Greens want to turn us into a one-party state, which is just a, a massive example of, of waking up in a, in a bed by yourself being a member of the Greens party. Um, you know, this is what the Greens want to do to Australia, that you can only have thoughts that the Greens agree with, you can only have beliefs that the Greens agree with, and you can only support causes that the Greens agree with. Now, if you want to support the Greens, because quite frankly you, you're one chromosome short of the village idiot, well, go ahead and do it. That is your choice. But I'm not going to stop you from doing that. And if you want to support my party or the Labor Party or any other minor parties, do it. I encourage people to get involved in the political process. I encourage people to join political parties or causes of their choice. I'm not going to stop you doing it. I don't want to stop you doing it. We need more people to get involved in Australia's democracy, not fewer people. We need to stop shaming people. We need to stop telling the— look, quite frankly, how many people work in the resource um, sector? I reckon it's almost 300,000 300, people whose jobs depend on the resource sector. So I'm saying to them, oh, well, too bad. You can't really work there. We're saying to people who work in the financial sector, it's probably 300,000 people or so. And then we're talking about people who work in the property sector, we're probably talking about another 200,000 Australians. Then we're talking about you know, the hundreds of thousands of people who work in, in chemists and pharmacists across Australia. We're saying to those people, you are not worthy. You are not worthy of participating in Australia's democracy because we don't like you. You know, because we're the Greens, we're the Puritans, we're pure, we wouldn't do anything wrong. Well, you know, the more that someone tells me that they're pure, the more that someone tells me that they're, they're righteous, the more that someone tells me that they're on the side of, that's all that, that, that's good, the more I check my back pocket to make sure I've not been pickpocketed by them, the more I make sure that I go to my house and make sure my TV hasn't been nicked by them. Because this, this is what the Greens are all about. They, they, sit in the green, they sit in the peanut gallery and they throw rocks and stones at the, at the parties of government and say how terrible we all are. They say how terrible Australia is. They, they run down Australia. They run down Australia from a democratic perspective. They run down Australia from a financial perspective because their party is the politics of grievance. Their politics, their politics is angry politics. Their politics is not about what's doing best for Australia. It's about what is doing best for the green political movement. Because they want to stop people who, who run chemists, who run pharmacists. They want to run people. They want to stop people who run country pubs. Who, who run country pubs from getting involved in the political process. This is what the Green movement has come to. Now, I don't know what Bob Brown's doing at the moment, but he could basically become a wind turbine at the moment in terms of oscillating around with, with his, probably his disappointment with the, the modern Green movement that they've shifted on from the, the great environmental battles of, of the 1980s and 1990s to become the party of just nah. Computer says no. We're a bunch of Puritans. We don't want you to have fun. We don't want people who own pubs, who run pubs, country pubs, to get involved in the political process. This is a waste of time. This is a waste of the Senate's time. Look, go back and do Thank better, you, Greens. Senator, Thank you, go Senator, and McGrath. Do a lot better. Thank you Senator McGrath. Thanks for the entertainment. Uh, Senator Pocock. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy President. I, I rise to commend Senator Waters on this bill. Clearly, if you want to trigger the major parties, just bring up meaningful political donation reform. This is the inconvenient uh, truth in Australian politics that we're in a situation where companies are gaming the political system a system that is about people, Australians, casting their vote, every vote having the same value, is now being co-opted by companies across this country to buy political influence. Four of the five uh, last federal elections have been won by the major party with the biggest war chest. I would suggest this is not a direction we want to head down. 
Australians want meaningful reform when it comes to political donations. Australians want to know that our politicians are making decisions based on what is good for their communities and not just what may be good for their donor. Senator McGrath talked about how this will limit people being able to participate in democracy and donate. On the contrary, this makes it more accessible to Australians, to actual people. Corporations are not people, and corporations are gaming the political system. If you, if you look across the country, you, I, reading this bill, I, I, I tend to think that $3,000 per person per year, per term, is, is probably a fairly level playing field. We don't want to be in a situation where, because you have more wealth, you can then uh, donate far, far more than the average Australian could ever afford to donate. And clearly, when we allow corporations uh, to donate, they can outspend uh, almost all but maybe the richest Australians. This is about returning democracy to the Australian people. People in the resources sector, workers who work in mining, making personal donations to the, a political party of their choice is not the same as resource companies making large political donations to the major parties. In the last three years, the Liberals have accepted two point, just over $2.3 million from fossil fuel companies. Labor have accepted just over $1.1 million. The Nationals have accepted $221,000. That's $3.7 million of money that is clearly influ influencing the debate on crucial issues like global warming, like this parliament's response to what we're seeing on the news now every day with worsening climate impacts with a uh, cl climate that is is breaking down and we're seeing weather that that we, you know we haven't seen before we're moving into a new climate clearly this isn't a good way to be able to make decisions that are going to benefit everyday Australians and future generations political donation reform is something that Australians want people in communities across the country are calling for it. And today we're seeing the vested interests in the major parties. Uh, Senator McC McAllister, um, that may be nonsense, but let's take gambling as an example. I'm sure senators here would uh, receive a fair bit of correspondence about gambling. There are Australians across the country very worried about the, in the impact that gambling is having, gambling advertising specifically, on children. And the statistics show that it is having a huge negative impact on young people. We know that. Government agencies have the data saying that <laughs> there, there are a large percentage of children now that think that gambling is just something that adults do. It is normal. We're seeing children who are 16 and 17 not just gambling but being at risk of problem gambling before they're even legal, al legally allowed to gamble. And yet neither of the major parties is willing to implement the kind of gambling advertising reform that most Australians want. Most Australians do not want to put on sport and, and see gambling advertising when they're watching with their children. And yet you try and get the new government 
to take that seriously, and we get a change in slogans. You cannot tell me that all of this money that is, is flowing into the, the major political parties from uh, the gaming uh, lobby and gambling industry is not having an effect. Because if we were listening to everyday Australians, we'd be saying, this is a huge problem. It, it, is, it is not good for, for the future of our country, and so we're going to have a response that deals with it. And experts have said one of, one of the things that should be done is to ban any gambling advertising in the hours that children watch television, as we've done with other, other products that are harmful. And yet we get this lukewarm response. So, uh, Senator McAllister, I simply do not accept your interjection that this has no effect. Clearly it does. And we can, we can say, say the same when it comes to climate politics in Australia. This has become a, a political football. We've seen the fossil fuel industry uh, use politicians, political parties, to kick this problem down the road to the point where we are now in a crisis. And we're going to have to do things that um, rise to the level of, of crisis that we're facing. Whereas if we had have had a parliament that was connected to uh, everyday Australians, connected to the science, willing to listen, we could have started dealing with this a long time ago. It would have been a, a, a much steadier and simpler transition. So I would urge urge the major parties to reconnect with Australians, to reconnect the, the people that we are all in here to represent. And my, certainly my, my sense talking to people in the ACT is political donation reform is right up there. People, people realise that our political system is being gamed. Companies have huge influence in this building. They walk the halls, they, they walk into uh, politicians' offices, they make donations, they run events. We have to deal with this. This. Order. 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 You have a colleague on his feet. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I welcome the, the government's openness to review this and to look into it, and I look forward to having the kind of reform that is being called for by both everyday Australians and experts who have looked at this issue for a long time. Uh, this is not a new issue or, or concern. And both sides of politics have been in government in recent history. So uh, clearly, like uh, now having a National Anti-Corruption Commission, which was on the back of the Greens and independents, pushing for that for a long time, it's politically inconvenient, but it's good for Australia. And as senators, we have a duty to do what is good for the people that we represent, not the party whose line we vote along. That's, that's a huge challenge for all, all of us. And I, I commend Senator Waters for continuing to push this issue. It resonates with everyday Australians. And the longer we leave this, the more we're going to see Australians start to find candidates who are willing to stand up and say, we can do better. We can return our democracy to people. We can have rules in place that ensure that it is a level playing field, that big companies cannot, can't donate hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, which clearly are having an effect. And it's inconvenient on both sides. We've, we've got, uh, for, the, for the Liberal Party in 2021, 
The biggest donor for the coalition was Pratt Holdings, with more than 1.2 million in donations to the Liberal Party. On, on the Labor side, uh, the biggest support came from its, its associated entities and several unions, including the SDA, uh, UWU, and the CF uh, MMEU, who donated $3.67 million collectively. And again, Senator Tricconi, I, I uh, appreciate your interjection, and uh, I've really welcomed the renewed focus on political donations now that we're seeing order, order. Now that we're seeing tens of thousands of Australians making donations to independents and minor parties. For the first time that I can remember, we had the former Prime Minister during the campaign talking about it, highlighting uh, the, uh, the need to, to tackle political donations, and indeed we now have a government that is committed to doing that. But let's remember that there, there, is a, there is a clear difference between Australians donating their, their own money in a personal capacity uh, versus companies or, or unions donating, and I sense there's a real appetite to go back to having rules that make it a level playing field that ensure that everyday Australians uh, have the ability to donate should they want to. Um, we don't want to stop that, but we do want to stop the undue influence that is, is clearly being seen and is playing out in the way that we are dealing with some of the, the really big and, and thorny issues we face, like action on climate, what, what our response to, to gambling is, being the biggest, biggest losers in the world when it comes to, to gambling, $25 billion or so a year. So I commend this bill. Uh, on behalf of people in the ACT I represent, I, I will keep pushing this. This is something that is important to people in the ACT. They want to see meaningful action. They're, they're, they're sick of seeing decisions being made that aren't in the best interests of Australians. They're sick of having uh, governments that argue that the government doesn't have a duty of care to future generations. If we don't have a duty of care to future generations, what are we here for? What are, what are we here for? And this is a meaningful way of putting checks and balances and added transparency in place so that Australians can look at this place and say, I can be more confident now that decisions are being made that are going to benefit me, that are going to benefit me and my family, that are going to benefit my children and their future and their children's children, rather than some big gambling or fossil fuel company that can, that can spray 100,000 bucks a month, uh, 100,000 bucks a year to, to uh, buy a bit of influence in this place. I commend this bill. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. <clears throat> and I rise to speak to this bill, which is basically laced with hypocrisy, because this bill does nothing. It's got one side of the, the picture in terms of private sector, but it doesn't mention anything about money coming from unions. It doesn't mention anything about money coming from super funds, and it doesn't mention anything about the inherent influence inside bureaucracies. Now, I know that the uh, promoter of this actual bill worked for the Environmental uh, Defenders Office for about a decade, uh, and of course she's just one of many left-wing Marxists in the bureaucracy who get paid by the taxpayer to be impartial, but I have no doubt that you know, this is a scheme that's employed by the left. Whenever you talk about any environmental stuff, they always run off to the Environmental Defenders Office and then use the law and use the you know, uh, legislative uh, uh, um, you know, uh, what do they call it? lawfare to be effectively shut down uh, any sort of new production. And we have this slur going around, you know, fossil fuel, we can't have money from fossil fuel do uh, donors, and somehow the, a, a diesel fuel rebate is somehow some sort of a rort. 
If you want to know what a rort is, it's the people who live in these inner city houses. The biggest tax expenditure discount in the budget is the CGT grant on wealthy houses in inner city electorates. And yet these same hypocrites come in here and call the actual diesel fuel rebate that is incurred by producers who don't go anywhere near a road a rort. That is not the case at all. You know, farmers have to actually, when they plant their crops, don't go any near, anywhere near a farm. You know, I myself am from a farm of 150,000 acres. It could take you two hours to get to the boundary uh, just to go and check your waters. I mean, we would drive thousands of kilometres a year just to check our waters, the bores, and somehow we're meant to pay for roads we don't use. How is this somehow a rort? And as for like, you know, I noticed there's a key word in there that you know we're going to exclude people that volunteer their time. Well, the thing is, in the private sector with small business, if you didn't actually know, small business works seven days a week, 24 hours a day. They don't always have the time to actually to, to donate to the parties. That's why they decide to actually give money because they go, look, we'd love to help you out. We don't actually have the time, but look, you know, use it for advertising or whatever. So there's this implication that all donations are bad. And look, I, I don't like gambling uh, any more than uh, a lot of people in this uh, um, uh, chamber do. But you know, the, the fact of the matter is that was brought in by a crony deal between the Goss Labor government and Kevin Rudd, who was the chief of staff at the time, uh, and the unions, who wanted to bring gambling into Queensland. And what have we got for it? Well, I'll tell you what regional Queensland got for it. Nothing. What we've got is a lot of heartache. I mean, my hometown of Chinchilla, I've said this hundreds of times, when I grew up there, we didn't have any poker machines in the pubs in Chinchilla, but we had a maternity ward, we had a council, uh, but we don't seem to have a maternity ward or a council anymore, but we've got poker machines. So you got no, no one's going to be influencing me, and can I say no one does influence me when it comes to donations. But the other thing that this bill completely overlooks as well is the influence of lobbyists who don't have to disclose how much people pay them. That's the real. You want to know what the real shadow government in this country is? It's the bureaucracies who are stacked with left-wing um, uh, uh, supporters, and they are left-wing supporters, and the lack of accountability in these so-called independent bodies. I mean, I have just did a post again this morning. It's about my tenth one on the RBA, uh, how they refuse to actually bring our gold home. They refuse to do a proper audit. There's no accountability there. Uh, there's no accountability. I mean, I'll give you another great example. The Bureau of Meteorology just used to have the weather division, and these guys would go out and they'd measure the temperature, or they'd record the temperature, and that was it. It's end of story. But now they have this whole new division called the Climate Division, and their job is to go and create new sets of data that's been manipulated from the original raw data. They wrap big words around it like homogenisation, etc., so that most people don't even understand what what they're talking about but it's actually manipulated data. You don't actually go back and create a new data set, fudge the data. You report the original data with a margin of error. That's what you should be doing. But that's not what these guys do. And then I've, I've spoken to the ABC, another so-called independent body, why when they report this data, they don't actually distinguish between homogenised data and raw data. Why don't they report the raw data with a margin of error? That's how you do it. In the private sector, if you went back and started coming up three, four, five sets of different accounts, a la Al Capone style, you'd be thrown in jail. But no, 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 not within the bureaucracy because it doesn't suit the narrative of the bureaucracy uh, that maybe the temperature hasn't as risen as high uh, as much as what you know, they claim it to be. And it hasn't. The raw data doesn't show anywhere near the increase in temperature as what the homogenised data is. So that's just another example of the influence that can be coming not, not from money but from the use of volunteer or paid power when people who are, uh, are paid by the taxpayer to deliver goods and services aren't actually delivering goods and services at all. What they're doing is using the bureau uh, bureaucracy to push their own ideology, and that is corruption. That is corruption. And then, we go, it's, and then we go to the hypocrisy here of this bill again with superannuation. The first thing the Labor government did when they got in was to actually uh, try and remove. Well, they did remove the, the disclosure laws around how much money superannuation funds donate to uh, political parties via the unions or whatever. Did the Greens vote for greater transparency there? No, I don't think they did. They didn't do that. What about the pharma industry, big pharma? I'm not talking about pharmacies, by the way, Senator McGrath. I'm talking about big pharma. Did we actually? Did the Greens back our bill to actually get that contract disclosed? No, they didn't. 
No, they didn't. And if we go and look at who the Greens' all-time biggest donor is, it's none other than Graham Wood, a guy that made his millions through the fact through travelling for basically an online uh, booking agent for people to travel the world. How much CO2 does travelling the world actually consume? And they've got the height to come in here and, and, and cast slurs on our, our primary producers, our miners and our farmers, uh, that um, somehow these guys are bad. But it's the gross hypocrisy. And if we look at the Victorian uh, Greens Party, their biggest uh, donor was, of course, the Electrical Trades Union. The Electrical Trades Union. Now, of course, they'd be making a lot of money out of all wiring all of these uh, solar panels and these wind turbines that we can't recycle and all the batteries that are going to be installed. Can you see the connection between the Electrical Trades Union that's going to get paid a lot of money, a lot of jobs uh, for the Sparkies by setting up all of this new uh, electrical wiring? And think of all the transmission lines that are going to be ripping the guts out of, scarring our, our beautiful landscape. Think of all the dead koalas from these transmission lines, the dead wombats from these EVs with greater braking speeds. Think of that. Think of that. That's terrible. All those inner city elites, as they're driving down from their North Shore suburbs or the inner city of Melbourne, as they drive up to the snow every year when there's extra you know, uh, EV cars with an 800 kilogram battery in the middle of it that increases the braking, sp braking the speed, the hypocrisy of these people is breathtaking. Is breathtaking. And that was another comment I heard. Oh, accelerated depreciation is somehow wrought. No, no, no. If you're going to drop a thousand million dollars on a tractor, and it costs a lot of money to buy a tractor uh, to go around and around, it actually you won't sell that tractor again anytime soon for anywhere near a million dollars. It costs a lot of money for big capital intensive uh, um, uh, equipment, and to somehow claim that getting a tax deduction for a genuine cost of doing business. Uh, is somehow a rort. It, it's just absurd. It is just absurd. But yet again, we have the Greens that don't that are completely divorced from reality. Completely divorced from reality. They don't. Want, they don't seem to understand that small business in this country aren't necessarily don't have the time to go out and, and campaign. And and we saw that. And, and the other great big hip hypocrisy in all of this is with the Teals, for example. I mean, their biggest funder, of course, is Simon Holmes Accord, and he's got his wealth from his father, Robert Holmes Accord, who made lots of money in the 80s uh, from uh, investing in mining companies. And yet again, we have this, this classic hypocrisy. Don't worry about where my wealth come from, came from. Once I've got my millions, I'm then going to do the backflip and suddenly start being holier than now to alleviate my guilt. My guilt. And you know, it's like I know Senator Pocock often talks about he grew up in a farm and he respects the farmers. Well, I suggest Senator Pocock, if you want to come out to our property one day and look at how far it takes to drive from our house out to our boundaries and how much petrol we spend a year. And by the way, my dad never claimed diesel fuel rebate. I used to tell him to get and do it because he wouldn't. He just won't take any sort of handout from the government. He doesn't. You know, he just doesn't want anything to do with government. He doesn't want the government in his life. That's why he works, lives on a property 150,000 acres miles from anywhere. Um, and obviously I've inherited some of his um, traits because that's how I feel when it comes to government as well. Um, hey? Yeah, no, that's yeah. I, I came to the Senate Order. to get government out of my life. Order. To get government out of my life. Order. Thanks very much, Senator Stubridge, and I enjoy your interjections. Uh, and you'll Order. quickly learn that you won't get away with it with me because I will eviscerate you. Uh, my intelligence is uh, will put you back in your spot very, very quickly. And um, um, Senator, Senator Reddick, through the chair, Senator Reddick, through the chair. for a moment. Uh, could, interjections are always disorderly. Um, so if everybody could just um, enjoy each other's company and enjoy Senator Rennick's speech um, in silence, please. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator McGrath. And uh, you know, uh, it's 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 always um, you know. I'm not just uh, I look at I look at these figures, and I ask myself. You know, where, where will we end up with? And of course, the other thing we haven't spoken about, and I must touch on this, of course, is the influence of the childcare industry. Because I've often said, and you've only got to look at the union movement in this country, they're down to about 10 per cent of the workers. And the reason why they grasp onto our children and childcare is their only growing union in this country is the actual United Voice because of the rapid increase in childcare. Now, these people say they want to you know, look after our children. I don't want the government looking after our children. I want that childcare uh, payment going directly to the parent and letting the parent choose, just like when it comes to the transgender stuff, letting the parent decide. Because when it comes to our space in this country, the government doesn't invade our personal space. And there's too much of that happening 
with big government, and, and I've seen that since I've come down here, whether it's childcare, whether it's what sort of, uh, um, you know, how we look after our health, you name it, how we save our money. The unions and big government and the bureaucracy, they are the true shadow government of this country, and they have no accountability. And if you want to, you know, and this is the hypocrisy of this bill. When we tried to move uh, bills or, or, or amendments to get greater transparency over costings on reaching the 43 per cent target by 2030, don't have a clue. Don't have a clue. Senator McAllister doesn't have a clue on how many kilometres of transmission lines we need to reach that target by 2030. They don't have a clue on how many batteries, how much uh, energy needs to be stored, and they certainly have no idea on costings. We've done the same for the pharmaceutical contracts. I'm about to bring up another OPD on the Auditor General. The Auditor General came out another ex Labor staffer, didn't declare he was an ex Labor staffer when he applied for the job. I uh, seem to think that was 30, 40 years ago, so it didn't matter, but yet again it matters because a leopard doesn't change their spots. So if you want to declare, if you want to, you want to get all this stuff and, and, and tamp down on donations, I think every bureaucrat in this country should be made to declare who they vote for at every election so we know whether or not they're impartial. They shouldn't be allowed to vote. That would be their way. Once you become a bureaucrat, you've got to be completely impartial. Don't let them vote. Or, or we can make them disclose which way they vote. So we know how they think, because for too long these guys have been running a protection racket for the left, uh, the left side of politics. Uh, and we actually had one public servant in estimates started you know, saying, we the government, we the government. He got you know, Senator Holly Hughes very quickly uh, picked, out, uh, picked up on the fact that he should have actually been impartial. Um, but you know, as I said, if you want to know uh, who really uh, controls this government, it's, it's the bureaucrats and the unions and the super funds and the big end of town, the inner city elites. It's not the battlers. It's not the battlers. Okay? They're out there. They're voiceless. They're voiceless. And most of them are too busy working. I mean, whether you like it or not in this country, politics is only followed by a very small slither of people in this country. And it's a genuine and most of the reason why is because they're too busy working. They're too busy working. Now some people when they get you know get later in life and they have a bit of money they might want to donate to the party. They may want to donate to the party. But no, 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 this bill will destroy the right to exercise their right to participate in democracy because they don't always have the time. They don't always have the time of, of, of young uni students um, who, you know, like that's how Josh got rolled. Basically, the Teal's got about uh, you know, a couple of thousand people to go door knocking, paid them $40. Paid them forty dollars. I wonder is it, is it going to apply to the Teals who pay their volunteers to go door knocking? Is this is this bill going to apply to that? Is this going to uh, because you know, this says non-volunteer labour? So how does it work out when the Teals and the Greens pay their volunteers to go door knocking? Is that is that yeah they're not volunteers? That's right. So they should be called out as well. We're we going to make every little Order. volunteer disclose how much they're getting paid. We're going to do that. No, of course not. Of course not. So, I, I, you know, if we want to have um, true democracy in this country, and I'm all for disclosure. I'm all, but this is one-sided. This is one-sided. So next time, I'll bring that pharmaceutical, that big pharmaceutical bill up, Senator Walters, and see whether or not you want to vote on what we spent the eight billion dollars for with these vaccines, Senator Walters, uh, and, and what we spent the vac uh, what what we got for that, and what was in that deal. But you didn't do that, so I don't want to hear any big end of town. Uh, you know how you're against the big end of town because every time Order. we try and wedge you guys on, on making the big end of town more transparent, you always vote with Labor because we know that Mr Albanese and I'll be putting the bureaucrats up to ICAC. I'm going to have a lot of fun doing this because Mr Albanese, the Prime Minister, thank will you, shut Senator that down. Rennick. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Turns out if you want to trigger Labor and the Coalition, mention political donations. And out comes the, the sort of wacko conspiracy theories, out comes the love of corporate Australia, and out comes, I think, one of the, one of the strangest arguments that I've heard in this debate. The argument from Labor is, what, what's eroding trust in democracy isn't taking hundreds of you know, thousands of dollars, millions of dollars of donations from the fossil fuel industry and the gambling industry, big pharma, defence, the finance industry. That's not what's eroding trust in politics, not taking the dirty money, but what's eroding trust in politics is telling the public about it and asking for change. Now, that would have to be one of the most perverse arguments that I've heard against calling for donations reform, but it came from Labor today in this chamber. And then, of course, we have this kind of wacko 
weird conspiracy theory coming from the coalition, uh, obviously triggering some deep emotional problem they have if you ever suggest we should take them off the teat of corporate Australia. Um, so I commend Senator Waters for bringing this bill, and I commend uh, Senator Rhiannon and so many others that have been campaigning now for, for decades to clean up Australian politics. And do we need to do it? Well, of course we do. Uh, right now, there's a live discussion about the future of coal and gas. And the Greens and millions of Australians are trying to keep it in the ground. And there's about 114 live proposals for new or expanded coal or gas projects. And of those, at least 56 of them have made donations to the major parties. And that's just what's on the public record. It's likely to be much more. So we're about to decide, we're about to decide key questions on climate policy. And we know that coal and gas has bought their way into this place. Just in 2020-2021 alone, uh, there was more than $1.1 million of donations made to Labor and the Coalition by fossil fuel companies. Woodside dropped more than $100,000 to the government of the day. And do you reckon they have a seat at the table while we're talking about climate change? Of course they do, because they bought it. Because corporations don't give money to politics because they love democracy. Corporations give money to politics because they want to buy outcomes. They want to buy approvals for their coal and gas projects. So if we want to save democracy, if we seriously want to clean up this parliament, this bill is essential. So I commend Senator Waters for bringing this bill. I'm disturbed at the unhinged response we get from the major parties whenever we mention donations reform. And, Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to continue my remarks. I thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. In a minute and a half, let me just say that First of all, this bill has very, very many positive aspects, but there will be industries that will get, ar get around this. There's one industry that the Greens not represented on their list. Without doubt, it's the worst industry for influence peddling. This is an industry that actually owns outright seven Teals members of parliament, six in the House of Representatives and one here in the Senate, all on a mission to drive as many sales for their sponsors as they can. The industry I'm talking about, of course, is the nature-dependent power industry, unreliable, expensive solar and wind. The members of parliament I'm talking about are the Teals. The very reason for the existence of the Teals party is to drive sales for companies associated with their financial sugar daddy at Climate 20. Simon Holmes Accord bought government in his first public foray into election funding. Thank he you, bought his Senator way into the Roberts. Senate's Labor Greens Senator Teals Roberts, governing— you will be in continuation. The time for this debate has expired. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022, in committee. Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022 and amendments 1 to 68 on sheet PV 24 moved by Senator Watt. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, just again, uh, before I start this line of questioning, because it is going to be quite a technical line of questioning um, in relation to the better off overall test, I do just want to again remind the Chamber that in terms of the questions as I asked last night, and I am again going to proceed to ask today. Um, they are very deliberate questions, uh, in particular to enable, to the extent possible, uh, due to the significant uncertainty about how this legislation could be interpreted, um, that we get to the extent that we can, if possible, clear and concise answers to provide guidance to those interpreting the government's legislative attend, um, intent. And again, for that reason, and just for the benefit of the Hansard record, um, I do remind the Chamber and the Minister that the official records of parliamentary debates, which includes questions in the Committee of the Whole Stage, and for the benefit of those in the gallery, that's exactly what we are doing now. We are in questions of the Committee of the Whole Stage in relation to Labor's um, 
industrial relations legislation, they are a vital source of information when it comes to statutory interpretation. Uh, so, Minister, I do now want to turn to a line of questioning in relation to the better off overall test. Uh, and in terms of that line of questioning, I just want to set the scene by referring to the minister's comments in the second reading speech in the House of Representatives on Thursday, the 27th of October, 2022. Uh, in relation to simplifying the better off overall test, the minister stated, we will make the better off overall test simple, flexible and fair. There's consensus that approval requirements for enterprise agreements are onerous, complex and unnecessarily prescriptive. We'll make key changes to fix this. First, the concept of prospective award covered employees is removed for enterprise agreements that are not greenfield. For the majority of proposed enterprise agreements, the test will be applied in relation to actual workers and patterns and types of work that are reasonably foreseeable. The bill will restore the original intent of the test as a global rather than line-by-line -line comparison against the modern award. And thirdly, if there is a common view that the employer and union have that the agreement passes the test the Commission may give primary consideration to that view. And again, in particular, I just want to go back to the comments. First, the concept of prospective award covered employees is removed for enterprise agreements that are not greenfield. For the majority of proposed enterprise agreements, the test will be applied in relation to actual workers and patterns and types of work that are reasonably foreseeable. So that was the Minister's statement in the House of Representatives on Thursday, the 27th of October 2022, uh, when he was referring to the bill that was tabled at the time. And again, if one was to go to that in terms of a matter of statutory interpretation, uh, it would appear at this stage that the concept of prospective award covered employees will be removed. If I then go to the regulatory impact statement, just in terms of the better off overall test, uh, it states, as well as the concern over the genuine agreement requirements, uh, employers have consistently raised issues about the application of the better over off overall test. Um, in the Coles decision, for example, it goes through what the Coles division, um, decision is. Uh, and then it basically says employer groups are strongly of the view that the broader decline in enterprise agreement coverage across the labour market is in part referable to uh, these changes in the application of the test and the uncertainty it has resulted in. And so there appeared to be consensus that the changes proposed by the government in relation to the better off overall test, and in particular, to quote the minister, the concept of the prospective award covered employees being removed, um, etc. So what I would like you to do is just in relation to the bill that was tabled before the amendments last night were tabled, could I just go through that with you now um, to understand in particular what happened here in relation to the prospective employees and the hypothetical employees. What was the change originally intended to do? Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Cash. Good to be with you again on the important piece of legislation. Um, just in general terms, can I say that uh, the government's motivation in reforming the better, over, better off overall test uh, is that I think pretty much anyone involved in the workplace relations system in Australia at the moment accepts that it's not working as it was intended. So what we're trying to do here is to remove uncertainty uh, that currently attaches to the better off overall test by allowing the Fair Work Commission to only consider patterns of work that are reasonably foreseeable, meaning the Commission will no longer be able to consider unrealistic scenarios. 
And of course, there are Senate amendments that we put forward that will clarify that the Fair Work Commission must consider whether reasonably foreseeable employees would be better off overall. Uh, these changes will ensure that the better off overall test is simplified while providing strong protections to ensure no worker is worse off. Um, you will remember, Senator Cash, that at the job summit both employers and unions agreed that the better off overall test is not operating in the way it was intended. So, as I say, that's why we are making these changes. Uh, the amendments clarify that when applying the better off overall test, the Fair Work Commission must undertake a global assessment. It must also consider the views of the parties and give primary consideration to any common view about whether the agreement passes the better off overall test as expressed by the employer and bargaining representatives that are employee organisations. Uh, in terms of our amendment that provides that the Fair Work Commission will consider reasonably foreseeable employees, um, uh, I've, I've already addressed that, but the Fair Work Commission would also only have regard to patterns or kinds of work or types of employment if they are reasonably foreseeable. A further government amendment would provide that in making this assessment, the Commission must have regard to the nature of the enterprise or enterprises to which the agreement relates. If a view is expressed by a reasonable employer, employee or bargaining representative as to whether a working arrangement is reasonably foreseeable, then the Fair Work Commission must determine the matter. If the Fair Work Commission makes an amendment to an enterprise agreement to address a concern about meeting the better off overall test, the amendment must be necessary to address the concern and the Fair Work Commission must seek the views of the relevant parties. Additionally, the bill includes a reconsideration process to allow employees, employers or their representatives to seek a reassessment of the better off overall test where particular working arrangements were not considered by the Fair Work Commission when the uh, boot was first applied, either before, because they were not being engaged in or by omission. If the Fair Work Commission has a concern that an agreement does not pass the better off overall test, as part of the reconsideration process, it must amend the agreement with retrospective effect if it considers it necessary to address the concern. However, penalty orders won't be available for any contraventions that only arise because of a retrospective variation. So hopefully that clarifies the intent behind these amendments. Senator Cash. Minister, could I just ask what document you were quoting from, just so I can go and get a copy of it? And then just there are a number of issues that have now been raised in relation to that response. Um, and, and if I, I would just be able to appreciate getting a copy of it uh, so that I can then question you in relation to those issues. Minister. Um, those, uh, the comments that I've just made uh, have been provided to me um, as explanatory points, but I suspect that you'll find that so at least some of it, if not all of it, is covered in the ex supplementary explanatory memorandum as well. Senator Cash. Um, so what I really do want to focus on then is Employers welcome the changes to the boot, uh, and in particular, the fact that going forward, under the original clause that was tabled, the better off overall test would not apply to the hypothetical or unlikely work. And I'll take you through shortly the Office Works uh, case study and the Proud's Retail Employees Enterprise Agreement, because, as you know, they are not hypotheticals. Uh, they are actual cases that were decided. What I want to do, though, because there just does appear to be now some inconsistency in what you have just advised the Chamber of and the press release that was issued on the 27th of November 2022, uh, by Adam Bant on behalf of the Australian Greens. Now, this has caused, as you could understand, absolute confusion now amongst employers and employees across Australia. So, on one hand, what we had was the government allegedly working with employers following the Jobs and Skills Summit. There was an agreement that there needed to be changes to the boot. Uh, within reason, those changes were reflected in the first draft of the legislation that the minister tabled and spoke to, as I stated, on the 27th of October. On the 27th of November 2022, uh, after the deal was done with Senator David Pocock and the amendments are now before the chair, uh, a press release was issued by the Australian Greens. And I just want to read this into that Hansard record because I then want to explore with you what the differences are in this press release and the statement that you've just given to the Australian Senate. 
Greens Leader and Workplace Relations Spokesman Adam Bandham P and Greens Employment Spokesperson Senator Barbara Pocock say that the Greens have agreed to back the government's IR bill after securing significant additional improvements, including giving parents an enforceable right to request unpaid parental leave and protecting the existing Better Off Overall test. The Greens have been locked in negotiations with the government on the bill for several months. Very interesting. And the government has already included a number of long-standing Greens initiatives, and I'll get you to go take me through them shortly. Um, in, this, is, this is the paragraph of concern that has been brought to my attention, as I said, by multiple employers and employees. The government's original bill, the one that we've just been talking about, attempted to remove prospective workers from being considered on the Better Off Overall test when agreements are approved, something the Greens were concerned could have led to prospective workers being worse off. The Greens have ensured that the test in the existing section 193 will remain. Further, the bill will be amended to clarify that when applying the boot, this is the important bit, and considering potential work patterns of current or future employees, the Fair Work Commission will still have to apply the existing tests and assess any work patterns the employer, union or employees consider foreseeable. This is where, obviously, the concern has been raised. We have a statement by the minister in relation to the original bill. We have the explanation that you've just given to the Australian Senate. We have the amendments in front of us, and we'll go through them in detail. But at the same time, we have a statement from the Australian Greens that basically says all bets are off in relation to considering potential work patterns of current or future employees, and the Fair Work Commission will still have to apply the existing tests and assess any work patterns the employer, union or employees consider foreseeable. Seeing that was probably the biggest win that the employers have. I just need to genuinely understand, again, this is statutory interpretation. There's a press release here. It appears to not be consistent with what you've just said. Is the press release correct? The bill will be amended to clarify that when applying the boot and considering potential work patterns of current or future employees, the Fair Work Commission will still have to apply the existing tests and assess any work patterns the employer, union or employees consider foreseeable. Minister. Um, thanks, uh, Acting Deputy President. Thanks, Senator Cash. Well, I think you'd be drawing a bit of a long bow um, to argue that a press release issued by a non-government party would somehow be used by a future court to interpret the meaning of this legislation. Um, well, I, I know, and, and I'm not, I'm not, and no one in the government. Uh, is responsible for the words that are issued by a non-government party, whether it be the Greens or anyone else. That's a matter for them, how they want to characterise um, things. Um, what I can tell you, and this is from the supplementary explanatory memorandum, uh, is that the um, new, from par paragraph 24 onwards on page five, new subsection 193 capital A subsection six provides that when applying the Better Off Overall test, the Fair Work Commission may only have regard to patterns or kinds of work or types of employment if they are reasonably foreseeable at the test time. Uh, this amendment amends subsection 193 capital A6 to provide that in considering what is reasonably foreseeable, the Fair Work Commission must have regard to the nature of the enterprise or enterprises to which the agreement relates. And then it importantly says at paragraph 27, the Fair Work Commission must have regard to the reasonably foreseeable patterns or kinds of work or types of employment for both existing award-covered employees and foreseeable employees. Uh, and it does uh, refer to uh, the Coles case, which I assume is the same Coles case that you're referring to. So the Fair Work Commission would no longer be required to consider hypothetical working arrangements that are not reasonably foreseeable. Senator Cash. And uh, just to ensure the record is correct, despite what you said, I in no way was suggesting a Greens press release would be utilised. I was, though, stating your statements in response 
would be. So what I've just heard from you is, and with all due respect to Senator Barbara Pocock, and I'm sure you'll have an opportunity to respond, uh, Senator Pocock, um, the statement in the press release issued by Adam Bant, the leader of the Australian Greens, is wrong, based on what you've just said. Minister. Well, well I'm not going to um, sit here and assess on a you know, one to ten point scale or any other means whether what the Greens say on any matter is correct. What I'm telling you is what the government's position is and what the law is. Um, the core change we are making here is to require the Fair Work Commission to only have regard to patterns of all kinds of work or types of employment that are reasonably foreseeable. Um, the Senate amendments um, will not change this. Uh, and in the Senate, what we're seeking to do is simply clarify that the Fair Work Commission must consider whether reasonably foreseeable employees would be better off overall after considering the views of the parties and the nature of the business. Um, this capacity is relevant where there are no employees actually employed under a particular classification in an agreement at the time of approval, but they are realistically likely to be in future. And any working arrangements considered by the Fair Work Commission, whether for current or future employees, must be reasonably foreseeable. But it's a matter for the Greens what they want to say about this debate, and I'm not here to say whether they're right or wrong. That's for, them to, that's for them to say. Um, Senator Pogo, I'm going to have the call of Senator Cash at the moment because Senator Cash has a line of questioning. And after Senator Cash, there is a, a break. I, I will come to you, unless you, um, sorry, Senator Pogo. I feel that certain statements have been made about the Greens, and I'd like the opportunity to respond while they're um, before us. Um, well, I, I think. If, if, okay. if, if it would probably assist the chamber if we could let Senator Cash finish this line of questioning in relation, possibly, to, to those, those statements, then I'll, I'll come to you so that you can respond in full. Uh, and I'll make sure the following chair knows that too. Senator Cash. Uh, well, in relation to your political comments, Senator Watt, I would say you have done a deal with the Australian Greens to get this le legislation through. That is actually in the public, and therefore it is appropriate I ask questions in relation to the deal that has been done so we do get an understanding as to the impact of the deal on the legislation. Um, given the press release and given your statements, and given obviously the concerns that have been raised by employers, because as I said, there is the original draft. There is the agreement with the employers in relation to the better off overall test changes. There is the statements, or there are the statements made by Minister Burke in his second reading speech. And then jump forward to about a few days ago, there is an announcement about a deal. Uh, employers have expressed uh, their disappointment. Uh, in particular, there didn't appear to any any statements made by Minister Burke in relation to uh, the deal that had been struck with the Australian Greens, but for the press release issued by um, Mr Band. Um, based on the Greens statement, the issue of prospective employees would remain. I'm still struggling to understand. So you're saying they're wrong and you're right. So if we could perhaps turn to two case studies, because I think the case studies are will actually take us through what actually will be in and what actually will be out. So the first case study uh, is in relation to it's the 2019 Officeworks case. I know the department um, and the ministerial advisers uh, will know the Officeworks case. So the 2019 Officeworks Enterprise Agreement provides a compelling example of where process prevails over substance. After objections were lodged by one union, the Fair Work Commission asked Officeworks to provide undertakings about a cold work allowance and a liquor licence, despite the fact that these have nothing to do with the Officeworks business. Uh, this is for an agreement which was voted on by more than 80 per cent of eligible employees, with 97 per cent voting in favour of the agreement. Um, this is one example of what had become too common when seeking to have enterprise agreements uh, approved, and I think that would have been raised with you by employers uh, because the Officeworks case is uh, one of the most famous cases uh, when it comes to looking at 
being asked to provide an undertaking about a cold work allowance and a liquor licence, despite the fact that it had nothing to do uh, with your business, the fact that it was voted on by more than 80 per cent uh, of eligible employees, not that 80 per cent, 97 per cent uh, voted in favour. Um, so in terms of would the changes proposed by the government to the boot mean that the Fair Work Commission would now find this decision differently? Minister. Um, Senator Cash, as we were discussing yesterday, I'm not going to uh, categorically say what, the, what an independent Fair Work Commission will or will not find when, uh, when a brought, case is brought to it. But it is certainly the intention of the government to, uh, if you like, fix the office works type situation. And again, I direct you to the supplementary explanatory memorandum. Paragraph 28 says that the Fair Work Commission would no longer be required to consider hypothetical working arrangements that are not reasonably foreseeable given the nature of the particular enterprise. And employers, this is the important part, employers would accordingly no longer need to provide undertakings in relation to such arrangements as occurred, for example, with an undertaking about the holding of a liquor licence and work in a cool room, despite the enterprise not serving liquor or having a cool room. And there's a direct reference in the uh, explanatory memorandum to the Office Works decision. Senator Cash. Thank you. And there is. Um, and that is why I asked the question. So, based on the new test that you are applying, if you look at the Office Works Enterprise Agreement in the 2019 case, you've just said you can't rule it in or out, and that's the issue that I have. The explanatory memorandum looks like it rules it out. You're saying you can't. It's at the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. This is actually one that you want. It is in your own regular, uh, explanatory memorandum. So on that basis, my understanding is that hypothetical you would no longer need to give an undertaking, in particular, for example, an undertaking about the holding of a liquor licence and work in a call room, despite the enterprise not serving liquor or having a call room. So on that basis, what we could all agree with, the office works case doesn't matter about that it would be decided differently. Minister. Uh, I, th I think that would be reasonable to expect that it would be decided differently because the explanatory memorandum uh, says that uh, the types of undertakings that were required in that decision would no longer be needed. I'm, what I'm not going to do is predict what the Fair Work Commission will decide on any matter, but I think it is reasonable to expect um, that, that uh, the Office Works decision would be um, decided differently because of the clear wording of the explanatory memorandum. Senator Gash. I'll just go through um, another case study, then I just have a few questions on prospective employees, um, and then I will obviously cede the call to Senator Pocock for what time she needs. Just in relation, and again, this is not a hypothetical, these are actual cases. Um, the Proud's Retail Employees Enterprise Agreement. Uh, in May 2019, 86 per cent of voting employees voted to support the agreement, but the Shop Distributive and Allied Employees Association, the SDA, argued that the agreement should deal with outlets that employ more than 15 employees per week, despite the fact that Prouds never employs more than 50 employees in any one of their stores on a regular basis. It took 16 long months from the date of lodgement with the Fair Work Commission to have that agreement finally approved. The issue the business had with that was it took them away from creating jobs and it left employees worse off while arguing about completely hypothetical situations, again, similar to the office works case. They had to provide undertakings to the Commission in relation to uh, a cold work allowance and a liquor licence, despite that having nothing to do to their business. And we've now confirmed office works will be very happy to know that has been ruled out. That is very good. But this is now another, another agreement, and it is in relation to very similar 
outlets that employ more than 15 employees per week, despite the fact that Prouds never employs more than 15 employees in any one of their stores on a regular basis, 16 months longer. At that time, the business literally says it stopped them from creating jobs and it left employees worked off. And the whole point there was they actually had to argue about completely hypothetical situations that did not exist. When we look at clause 28 on page 5 of the supple uh, supplementary explanatory memorandum, this is, again, does the Proud's retail case now fit within that? Minister. Well, again, I'm not going to say what the Fair Work Commission will decide on a particular matter. That is always a decision for them. Um, but the entire point of this amendment is to eliminate hypothetical working arrangements that are not reasonably foreseeable. Um, it, the entire point of this amendment is to speed up the process and avoid the sorts of uh, protracted uh, matters such as the one that you're recurring, uh, referring to. Um, so I don't really think I can be any clearer than to say that in any matter that the Fair Work Commission is going to be considering, uh, they won't be required to consider hypothetical working arrangements that are not reasonably foreseeable. Senator Cash. So can I just confirm then, there is nothing stopping the Fair Work Commission from considering a prospective employee, is that correct? Minister. That is correct if that prospective employee is a reasonably foreseeable one. It all hinges on that. Senator Cash. And could I just, and this will be uh, my final question if I can get the answer from you, in relation to the original bill that was tabled and the amendments I now have in front of me, I need you to take me to what are the key differences in terms of inserting back in reasonably foreseeable employee? Because my understanding is, under the bill that was tabled that the minister spoke to, the concept of prospective award and covered employees was removed and reasonably foreseeable. We're now adding that back in by way of section 524B12, for example, and all the subsequent um, sections that add back in reasonably foreseeable employee. I just want to make sure I've got absolutely certain what the key differences are. Minister. So, so what? Sorry, just to be clear, what you're asking is where are the new references to? reasonably foreseeable employees within the amendments? Is that, is that what you're asking? So, original bill, you took that out. You're now reinserting it back in. And I just need to understand, is that what's actually going to happen? Minister. Thanks, Senator Cash. Just for the sake of completeness, I, I might take on notice um, and come back to you with each of the instances uh, where there's been that change, but I can point you to uh, amendments um, 526 capital C, um, 526 capital D, uh, and then of course there's the ones that we've been talking about in relation to uh, the better off overall test as well. But, uh, I will come back to you on notice as to uh, the complete list. Yep. Thank you, Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, um, and thanks, Minister, for your explanations there. Um, Senator Cash has uh, implied that there's some kind of inappropriate or nefarious kind of discussion or negotiation underway, and that that's somehow illegitimate. But I just want to reassure people at home watching. Uh, that um, since coming here as a senator just six months ago, less, I've seen nothing but discussion, compromise, negotiation 
often improvement in things. There's nothing untoward about it. And anyone who wants to know what values or issues the Greens took into those discussions with, with the government uh, can look on our website. There's nothing secret about what we did. And, and our vote increased and increased in the last election because people want an end to things like pay secrecy. They want a group of senators in here who are making sure that those low-paid retail and hospitality workers don't fall through the bottom of the boot test. And I think it's very important that we have been in discussion to improve the test for uh, making sure those young employees, uh, very powerless, uh, are protected. And our sole focus has been on those protections in relation to the boot test. We've sought to uh, preserve the essential elements of the boot so that new workers or foreseeable working conditions don't put workers backwards. And, and I, I just wanted to uh, follow that statement with a question to the minister. Um, and ask him, you've, you've clarified the questions of reasonably foreseeable uh, circumstances and, and the way in which the boot will operate to protect those low income uh, and young, many of them young workers. I wonder if you could say a little about the reconsideration process and how that will work to also make sure that those workers don't fall, young workers, low paid workers don't fall through. Minister. Uh, thanks for that, Senator Pocock. Um, I, I don't remember whether I made this point earlier in responding to Senator Cash, but you're quite correct that the bill includes what's known as a reconsideration process to allow employees, employers or their representatives to seek a reassessment of the better off overall test, where particular working arrangements were not considered by the Fair Work Commission when the boot better off overall test was first applied either because they were not being engaged in or by omission. Um, I mean, the fundamental point, of course, here is that uh, the government does not want to see workers left worse off. Um, if the Fair Work Commission has a concern that an agreement does not pass the better off overall test as part of the reconsideration process, it must amend the agreement with retrospective effect if it considers it necessary to address the concern. Uh, however, penalty orders won't be available for any contraventions that only arise because of a retrospective variation. Really, the intention of the reconsideration process is to permit adjustments to the bargained outcome only to the extent necessary to address a concern about the better off overall test because of a working arrangement that was not initially considered. The intention is not to interfere with the working arrangements for employees who are not affected by the concerns or unnecessarily disrupt the operations of the enterprise. Uh, the Business Council of Australia and the ACTU both support a better off overall test re reconsideration process for enterprise agreements. Senator Pocock. Senator Cash. At this stage, I'll move on to another section of the Act. Um, I, I may have to come back to uh, you in relation to further questions. Uh, on the changes to the Better Off Overall Test. Um, one of the issues that came up at the committee hearing, but we didn't get very far with the department, and it's just getting a better understanding from you in relation to what is just the actual effect and the intention uh, of this particular section of the bill. So what I start then uh, with, Minister, is just the general question can you please advise what the changes are to section 186 of the bill? Minister. I'm, I'll just track that down for you, Senator Cash. Um, so section 186 that you refer to falls within um, the part of the bill that deals with enterprise agreement approvals. And 
Overall, what we're seeking to do is to simplify the process, remove unnecessary complexity for workers and employers by simplifying the agreement pre-approval requirements. Uh, it, as to why we're doing this, there's consensus that the pre-approval requirements for enterprise agreements are onerous, complex and unnecessarily prescriptive. This can be a disincentive to bargain and can sometimes have significant consequences for employers and workers where an agreement has been reached but cannot be approved because of a procedural error during the course of the bargaining process. As to what the amendment involves and the, the proposal involves, it would replace certain pre-approval requirements with a broad requirement that the agreement has been genuinely agreed to by relevant employees. A government amendment retains the existing requirement that employers must take all reasonable steps to ensure that the terms of the agreement and the effect of those terms are explained to employees in an appropriate manner, taking into account their particular circumstances and needs. The Fair Work Commission must also be satisfied that the employees requested to approve the agreement by voting for it uh, have a sufficient interest in the terms of the agreement and are sufficiently representative, having regard to the employees the agreement is expressed to cover. The Fair Work Commission will issue a statement of principles on genuine agreement to provide guidance to employers on how to ensure an enterprise agreement has been genuinely agreed to by employees. Um, I suspect, um, Senator Cash, that might be something of interest to you and the people who have been in touch with you, is what does genuine agreement amount to? Uh, and that's something that the Fair Work Commission will issue a statement of principles on. That document, when it's issued, will play a significant role in ensuring the changes do not erode employee safeguards. A government amendment also provides that before an employer requests employees to approve a multi-enterprise agreement by voting for it, the employer must obtain written agreement to the making of the request from each bargaining representative for the agreement that is an employee organisation. The government wants to ensure that employers are not unreasonably prevented from putting agreements to a vote, and that's why a further proposed government amendment would permit the Fair Work Commission to order, on application by a bargaining representative, that an employer is permitted to put a multi-enterprise agreement to a vote where employee organisations' failure to provide their agreement is unreasonable in the circumstances. Senator Cash. Because that was the global overview of section 186. Can I just now go to some of the specific amendments uh, that are being made? So section 647, after subsection 1862, you are inserting in brackets to capital AA close bracket. In applying paragraph 1862b, the Fair Work Commission must disregard anything done and the effect of anything done by a person other than one of the employers who bargained for the agreement that is authorised by or under this Act, including protected uh, industrial action. What is the effect of this new section? Minister. Could I, sorry, could I please just get that specific section again? Uh, it was section 647, after subsection 186 in brackets 2, insert in brackets 2, capital A, capital A, close bracket, and then it refers to, in applying paragraph 186 in brackets 2, in brackets B. So there's been the insertion of a section above above that says in applying the paragraph 1862b the fair work commission must now disregard anything done and the effect of anything done by a person other than one of the employers who bargained for the agreement and my question obviously is what is the effect of this new section minister um, sorry just I think, putting it simply, um, Senator Cash, what this is seeking to do is, that, is to make clear that what would represent genuine agreement 
needs to be based on the content of the agreement rather than necessarily the process of getting there. And so, for instance, um, if uh, a majority vote of employees at a workplace resulted in the employer being brought to a to a multi-employer agreement, that would not in, a, in itself demonstrate genuine agreement or, or opposition or opposition to that agreement from from the employer. Senator Cash, can I then ask, in terms of the definition of coercion? In section 186 of the Act, what does that actually then include? Minister. Um, Senator Cash, I'm sure you'd be familiar uh, that there's extensive case law on the meaning of coercion as it relates, for instance, to the general protections provisions of the existing legislation. Um, so our expectation would be it would attract the same meaning uh, in the context that you're putting it forward. Senator Cash. C can I then confirm coercion then does not include taking industrial action or threatening to take industrial action. And again, uh, with all due respect, and we went through it last night, uh, whether or not I have any knowledge is actually irrelevant. I'm deliberately asking these questions for the benefit of the Hansard record. No, thank you. Um, and obviously, as I said, the very genuine questions. This is a new section. There's a section in the Act that says currently Approval of enterprise agreements by the Fair Work Commission, section 186, when the Fair Work Commission must approve an enterprise agreement, general requirements, sets out the basic rule. It then says, 1862 currently, the Fair Work Commission must be satisfied that, b, if the agreement is a multi enterprise agreement, the agreement has been genuinely agreed to by each employer covered by the agreement, and two, no person coerced or threatened to coerce any of the employers to make the agreement. The point of the line of questioning is, I then look at the amendment. The amendment says we're now swooping in above that. And what we're now saying is, if the agreement is a multi-enterprise agreement, no person coerced or threatened to coerce any of the employers to make the agreement. And the bit I'm struggling with then is, you're now saying, insert new 2 capital A capital A. In applying paragraph 1862B, the Fair Work Commission must disregard anything done and the effect of anything done by a person other than one of the employers who bargained for the agreement. Uh, again, what in terms of the definition of coercion in section 186, does it not include taking industrial action or threatening to take industrial action? Minister. Um, thanks, uh, Acting Deputy President. And as I say, I wasn't having a go, Senator Cash, in, in suggesting that you might uh, know that there's extensive case law. Um, I was recognising your, ex your experience in this area. Um, but, but what I can also direct you to in the revised explanatory memorandum is, the, is I think, the next paragraph from the one that you were reading from. So, paragraph 1119. Um, about halfway down, it makes the point that protected industrial action taken by the employer's employees during bargaining for the agreement would not amount to coercion. Uh, the employer, having requested its employees to vote to approve the agreement, could be taken into consideration, as could any unprotected industrial action taken by the employees. Senator Cash. So proposing to take industrial action, which would financially cripple a smaller family business or a business over, say, 21, in order to get an employer to sign an enterprise agreement, is that permitted? Minister. Um, well, Senator Cash, uh, my limited recollection of the case law on coercion uh, is that 
simply proposing to take protected industrial action does not amount to coercion. I mean, whether we're talking about employers or employees, um, given that the current legislation um, that your government presided over allowed for protected industrial action to occur, albeit with significant constraints around it, um, that the mere fact that that is provided for in the legislation would suggest pretty strongly to me that that does not amount to coercion. Um, what the explanatory memorandum is, is trying to say is that coercion could, for example, uh, be unprotected industrial action, unlawful intimidation or threats. Um, and I've been reminded that the, the leading case on the meaning of coercion in this context is the ESO decision, uh, and that found essentially that uh, coercion needs to involve negation of choice and the use of unlawful, illegitimate or unconscionable, unconscionable means. Senator Cash. And so I'm disappointed, Senator Watt, that you had to refer back to the act you presided under. Um, just, just so you're completely aware, whenever you say that, you don't insult me. But you do insult former Prime Minister Gillard and Prime Minister Rudd because it is your regime. So please be aware no one here is insulted by the comments that you are making. We didn't have the numbers in the previous Senate. We relied on you. You opposed everything, including our changes to the boot. So every time you want to say that going forward, please note none of us are insulted. But I'm quite sure in insulting Prime Minister Rudd and Prime Minister Gillard, given it is Labor's Fair Work Act, there will be many on your side who are disappointed. Senator, uh, Minister. Senator Cash, uh, I think it's pretty well I mean, the, the fact that we are putting forward amendments to this legislation indicates that the Albanese Labor government does think that the Fair Work, Fair Work Act needs improvement. Yes, the Fair Work Act was introduced by the Rudd-Gillard uh, governments, uh, and as time goes on, it needs improvement, just like every piece of legislation. The point I'm making is that over the course of this debate, both last night and today, um, you have uh, suggested that um, there are things in the amendments that we're putting forward that are wrong or immoral or will do this or do that, when in many cases they are picking up concepts that were contained in the legislation that existed when you were the minister. Um, you, you, you did attempt to make amendments uh, to the Act while you were the minister, many of which would have actually uh, made workers' position worse off. Um, and I'm very proud of the fact that we resisted those. And now that we're in government, we're actually about trying to improve this act from where it began under the Rudd-Gillard governments, from where it was under your government, um, to where it needs to be to make sure that workers in this country get a decent pay rise and that we can lift productivity in businesses as well. Senator Cash. Can I just go back to, to clarify again for the Hansard record? So proposing to take industrial action which would financially cripple a smaller family business um, or a smaller business in order to get an employer to sign an enterprise agreement based in particular on the case law that you have referred to is permitted? Well, Minister. I repeat that proposing, in the example you're giving, proposing to take protected industrial action uh, which is a legal right that employers and employees have, um, does not amount to the negation of choice and the use of unlawful, illegitimate or unconscionable means. Um, similarly, um, just as you give an example of employees proposing to take protected action, um, if an employer was to propose to lock out its employees uh, in line with the law, that would not be coercion because it's not unlawful, illegitimate or unconscionable. What would be un unlawful, Ill illegitimate or unconscionable and therefore could amount to co coercion uh, is unprotected industrial action, unlawful intimidation or threats. Senator Cash. Can I then just go to the effect of the amendment itself? Is it then to actually make explicitly clear, given the wording of the amendment, the Fair Work Commission must disregard anything done and the effect of anything done by a person other than one of the employers who bargained for the agreement? 
Um, the effect is to make it explicitly clear that anything done by an employee or their union under the umbrella of industrial action is permitted when negotiating an agreement. Minister. Um, Senator Cash, that, that provision is really just for the avoidance of doubt, um, and all of the existing powers uh, of the Commission in relation to protected action, for example, by employees or employers, uh, would remain on foot uh, for the purposes of this, this section, as with every other section. Senator Cash. Well, again, then, and this is the whole point which employers have raised with, with me. What was then the rationale behind including the section, given what you've just said, other than the government is effectively telling Australians that to get what you want in the workplace, all you need to do is threaten industrial action? And that is the whole point. What is the rationale then behind adding or inserting section 2, capital A, capital A? Um, why the difference between what unions do and what employers do. I don't see any need for this particular section other than you do want to make it clear anything done by an employee or their union in undertaking the application of section 1862B, uh, the Fair Work Commission does not need to take into consideration unless it is one of the employers who bargained for the agreement and you have confirmed therefore that proposing or threatening to take industrial action that would financially cripple a small or family business or a smaller business to force them to sign the agreement is actually not coercion and therefore allowed. Minister. Um, well, Senator Cash, um, there's a very good reason that section 1862 capital A capital A uh, refers to employers, and that's because it relates to um, the existing par uh, section 1862 paragraph B. Um, that that pro existing provision provides that in order to approve a multi-enterprise agreement, the Fair Work Commission must be satisfied that the agreement has been genuinely agreed to by each employer covered by the agreement and that no person coerced or threatened to coerce any of the employers to make the agreement. So given that the focus of 1862B in the existing legislation is on the behaviour or mind of employers, that's why Section 8162 capital A capital A also deals with employers. There's no reference in the current Section 1862B to employees or to unions. It's focused on employers. And that's why 1862 capital A capital A also refers to employers. If, as I think you're suggesting, um, this new provision were to also refer to employees, it would be completely meaningless because it connects back to 1862B, which is all about employers. Senator Cash. Um, if I could go to 647 after subsection 186 in brackets 2, uh, insert 2A. If the agreement is a cooperative workplace agreement that is not a Greenfields agreement, the Fair Work Commission must be satisfied that at least some of the employees covered by the agreement were represented by an employee organisation in relation to bargaining um, for the agreement. Um, one of the issues that has been raised with me time and time and time again in relation to this particular amendment is when it says that the Fair Work Commission must be satisfied that at least some of the employees are represented by a union, how many does this mean?
Sorry, the, the, the question is how many. Um, sorry. Yeah. So you're inserting uh, after subsection 1862. You're also inserting 2A. If the agreement is, the Fair Work Commission must be satisfied that at least. And it is some of the employees covered by the agreement were represented by an employee organisation in relation to the bargaining of the agreement. So the question is an obvious question that has come far and wide. It literally becomes must be satisfied that at least some of the employees. What literally does that mean? As was the, as was yeah, the case, yeah. sorry, as was the case last night, where trying to get into um, uh, strictly defining terms that have ordinary um, meanings in the law and the, again, the word some, some employees would be considered under its usual meaning. Uh, I think it would be fair to assume um, that we're talking about more than one because if we were talking about one, we would, the word one would be used. So I think it would be fair to assume that we're talking about more than one, um, but of course the word some has a usual meaning that would be applied by the Commission. Senator Cash. Thank you. That's exactly where I wanted to get to. What is the minimum number? I mean, for very obvious reasons, an employer or an employer reads this. Um, there is no explanation anywhere in the bill. Uh, you say that the word some has its usual legal meaning. Well, that's great, but they don't have the time to go and then actually grab a book and look up what is the usual legal meaning in Australia of some. But I just do want to confirm, because again, statutory interpretation, this is very, very important, because this has been raised with me by numerous, well, actually across the board. More than some means more than one, because this is the exact point that employers have been raising with me. Whilst there is no minimum number, you are saying one employee alone will not suffice based on the usual legal meaning of the word some of the employees covered, because that's the exact issue that's been raised. Would it require more than one? Minister. Um, I'm not, thank you, Deputy President. I'm not sure that I talked about the, the usual legal meaning of some. I, I, what I'm talking about is the usual meaning of some that you know, people use that word every day in, the, in Australian life, and I think they, mean, they know that some is more than one. Um, but let's remember that what we're talking about here is cooperative workplace agreements. There are, there are obviously a range of different um, streams of agreements being provided for by this legislation. What we're talking about here is the cooperative workplace agreement where there is agreement between an employer um, and a union um, that a particular workplace um, should have its terms and conditions governed by a cooperative agreement. So the entire basis of this stream of bargaining is that there is agreement between an employer and a union, of which there, is, there are at least some of the employees. And really the point of it is saying that not every uh, employee at that business needs to be represented by a union, but at least some of them uh, are. Senator Cash. No, no, and I do appreciate that guidance because that was literally the issue that was being right. Some did equate to one, and that will give people satisfaction that, based on that answer, uh, some does not equate to one. So it will. Um, that actually does clear up. It could be two, but it is not one. Now, if there has to be a ministerial changeover, I'm, I'm, I'm going on to a new topic. If that. Yeah, that is not a problem. Yeah, yeah no, that's changes. fine. I'll, I'll let you gracefully. Now may be a good time to do yeah, that. No, gracefully Thank exit. That, that, that's not a problem at all. I'm not sure if I ever gracefully exit. No, no, and, you, and you'll be disappointed to know I'm about to get on onto your favourite topic, the ABCC. Oh. Seriously. I'm sure. Seriously, Sen when I got the news, Minister Watt was leaving, it almost disappointed me. I'm sure Senator Chisholm will do yeah, a, well. a more than <laughs> adequate job uh, of uh, dealing with the ABCC.
Senator Cash. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, one of the issues that has been raised both at Senate estimates and in relation to the inquiry, and, and as you are aware, we just have not had that opportunity uh, to properly go through any of this, is in relation to the powers of the Fair Work Ombudsman, or should I say the current powers of the Australian Building and Construction Commission under the relevant Act that transfer over to the Fair Work Ombudsman. And I want to now take you through, and it's going to take some time because we're going to go through each power, because we received something back from the department which had words to the effect of minimal difference, no substantive difference. Um, so we'll be going through all of that as well. But if in the first instance I could just turn to some just basic questions. Um, Senator Lambie, in a question on notice, said, I just have one follow-up question because we're on the ABCC. It has a tremendous amount of powers. What's the difference between their powers and what's being passed over to the Ombudsman and the Fair Work? What's the difference? Um, Ms Sheehan replied, it might assist. We took a question on notice and estimates to put it in a simple table form, and then we have the simple table form. I've now gone through the simple table form, and as I said, it will take us some time because we're actually going to, and I'm saying this to give the heads up to the department, that somebody probably um, in, with uh, knowledge of the transfer of powers may well be required. In the first instance, can I confirm that in relation to the transfer of some of the powers of the ABCC to the Fair Work Ombudsman, the Fair Work Ombudsman will not have the ability to make submissions in Fair Work Commission proceedings? Minister. Um, that's correct, but the minister does. Senator Cash. But the Fair Work Ombudsman does not, unlike the Australian Building and Construction Commission, which did. Minister. Uh, there's nothing stopping us, the Fair Work Commission asking for that. Senator Cash. Again, though, I really want to be specific in relation to the actual transfer of the powers. The Fair Work Ombudsman themselves, unlike the Australian Building and Construction Commission, does not have the ability on its own volition to make a submission in Fair Work Commission proceedings. They may well be asked, but they also may not be asked. So of their own volition, they won't have that ability. Minister. A limited uh, ability uh, for stand down and right of entry provisions. Now, when you say a limited ability, ability in relation to, you said, stand down and right of entry, because we're about to go through some right of entry cases, um, I need you now to explain what you say by limited ability and can you take me to where that transfer of power is? Minister. Um, my understanding is we're talking about existing powers that the Fair Work Ombudsman has. Thank you. Senator Thank Cash. You for that clarification, there is no transfer. Can I confirm that? You are merely referring to a power that currently exists in relation to what was under the BCIIP Act that does not transfer. Correct. Minister. Oh, sorry, correct. In relation to then, 
the stand down and right of entry that you stated under the current powers the Fair Work Ombudsman has a limited ability. What is defined as a limited ability? Minister. Um, we believe that the Fair, Fair Work Ombudsman um, is uh, well resourced and has the ability to uh, regulate laws. Uh, we've provided them with $70 million over the next four years. Uh, these resources will ensure there is no shortfall in workplace relations regulation within the industry after the ABCC Commission has been abolished. Uh, the ABCC's legal cases will be transferred to the Fair Work Ombudsman uh, for them to manage independent of government. Senator Cash. Uh, with all due respect, I don't know what question you answered. Maybe the shaman was talking to you because I genuinely did not ask that question. The question I asked was, you said limited ability. There is a current power for the Fair Work Ombudsman, according to your evidence. They have a limited ability to intervene in relation to stand down and right of entry. I've asked you, show me where the current power is and tell me what you define by limited ability. Minister. Uh, in any proceeding, the Fair Work Ombudsman can tell the Fair Work Commission it has relevant evidence uh, to put to, and to put that evidence or intervene in proceedings. The Fair Work Commission has broad power to grant such requests. Senator Cash. Can I just confirm that unlawful picketing in section 47 uh, is definitely not in the Fair Work Act. So would the Fair Work Ombudsman have the ability to intervene in relation to unlawful picketing proceedings? Minister. Uh, no, Minister. but they can be dealt with under a range of other regulations. Senator Cash. Excellent. So now take me through the other range of regulations. So uh, unlawful picketing provisions could also be a breach of uh, the industrial action provisions of the Fair Work Act, uh, secondary boycott provisions of the Competition uh, Consumer Act 2010, uh, and obviously state and territory criminal laws, uh, for example, the offence obstruction of people or traffic in a public space. Uh, the common law as well, for example, the torts and trespass and nuisance. Senator Cash. Can I just confirm then, is the Fair Work Com uh, Ombudsman required to intervene in Fair Work Commission matters or is it discretionary? Minister. Discretionary. Senator Cash. Uh, if I could then just go back to the ability of the Fair Work Commission to intervene, which we now understand. There is a difference. The powers of the ABCC do not transfer over to the Fair Work Ombudsman in this regard. You have stated that you believe the Fair Work Ombudsman does have a limited ability uh, to intervene in relation to stand down and right of entry matters. But what we have also determined is the Fair Work Ombudsman is not required to intervene in Fair Work Commission matters. 
it is merely a discretion the Fair Work Ombudsman has. So, depending on their workload, to be fair, uh, we've heard um, a lot about the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. To be fair to the Fair Work Ombudsman, they may say there's too much going on. We will not intervene. Can I just ask you, though, based on your last answer on unlawful picketing, can you take me to exactly where in the Fair Work Act is unlawful picketing itself? What section? Minister. We'll take the specific references on notice and come back to you. That is absolutely an unacceptable Senator answer. Cash. Kevin, you are abolishing the Australian Building and Construction Commission. You have key figures from the department here who have provided a table. It is a very, very simple question. And I would ask, don't take it on notice. We're going to be here until two o'clock, with all due respect. Find me the section in the Fair Work Act, please that directly refers to unlawful picketing. Can I then also ask, it is my understanding that the Fair Work Ombudsman will not have the actual ability, and we've actually determined they don't, to intervene in such cases, for example, stopping union officials such as Luke Collier from holding a right of entry permit. In September 2022, only after the ABCC commissioner intervened, Dean Riley was denied to renew was denied to renew his federal entry permit. Now, just for the benefit of those listening in, Dean Riley is a man who used homophobic slurs against a safety inspector. Again, can I confirm there is no obligation on the Fair Work Ombudsman, unlike on the Australian Building and Construction Commissioner, to intervene? Minister. Uh, under section 507, right of entry, um, the Fair Work and Ombudsman Inspector may bring proceedings against a permit holder, um, so it's discretionary. Senator Thank Cash. you. That's all, it is discretionary, so they do not have to. In September 2021, only again after intervention of the Australian Building and Construction uh, Commissioner, uh, CFMMEU Queensland State Secretary Michael Revbar abandoned his application to renew his right of entry. Under Mr Revbar's watch, the Queensland Division and its officials have contravened industrial law on 175 occasions in 28 separate proceedings. Can I again confirm there is no obligation on the Fair Work Ombudsman to intervene? Minister. Um, the Fair Work Ombudsman operates as an independent regulator, so it would be the same as the ABCC, so it would be up to them. Senator Cash. It, it, the discretion. It is completely up to them. In May 2021, Assistant Secretary of the New South Wales branch of the CFMMEU, Michael Greenfield, only discontinued his application for a right of entry permit because of the submission of the Australian Building and Construction Commission. For the record in the Botany Cranes case, Mr Greenfield was found to have said to the managing director, if I were you, I'd effing sign it, his threat. What do you think will happen to you? Followed up the next day by, if you sign the EBA, we will leave your sites alone. So, in a case like this, where there is clear coercion, as shown in a court of law, the Fair Work Ombudsman is not obliged to make a submission against the right of entry permit application. They merely have the discretion to, based on their workload. Minister. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think it's a hypothetical question that you've put to me there, Senator Cash, but um, what I have said, and I think it's been repeated here today by my colleague, Senator Watt, 
Um, the Fair Work Ombudsman um, will be well resourced over the next four years, so almost $70 million that we've uh, put there. This includes an additional 80 staff, uh, and these resources will ensure there is no shortfall in workplace relations regulation uh, within the industry after the ABCC has been abolished. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. Can I just ask the minister, how is it a hypothetical question to ask whether or not under the abolition of the ABCC and the supposed transfer of powers to the Fair Work Ombudsman, the Fair Work Ombudsman would have had an obligation to actually intervene. I'm asking directly about a transfer of powers. How is that a hypothetical situation? Minister. Um, because the Fair Work Commission has broad powers to invite submissions or evidence uh, in relation to proceedings. Senator Cash. Um, if there is no obligation, um, when would the Fair Work Ombudsman exercise their discretion? I know that it is independent, but what is the government's expectations? Minister. Um, we expect them to uh, operate as the independent regulator. Um, we've provided, we've ensured that they're well resourced, so that would be a decision for them. Senator Cash. So, with respect to employers within the building and construction industry, can you please detail what powers are available to the Fair Work Ombudsman to take action in relation to industrial action? or thefts thereof on a site and other related or unrelated sites if all subcontractors do not have a union endorsed enterprise bargaining agreement. Minister. Um, it's the Fair Work Commission that has those powers, and that hasn't changed. Senator Cash. My question was in relation to the Fair Work Ombudsman and what powers they have. I mean, genuine, are, you, are you saying they don't have any? It's been the Fair Work Commission um, that would have been responsible um, for that part of it, and that hasn't changed. Senator Cash. With respect to employers within the building and construction industry, can the minister detail what powers are available to the Fair Work Ombudsman to take action in relation to stoppage of work by a union because a subcontractor would not enter into a union-endorsed enterprise bargaining agreement? Minister. Um, there are various um, areas of the Fair Work Act that would apply, and they would enforce them. Senator Cash. In relation to my first question and now my second question, uh, so in, uh, in relation to the question with respect to employers within the building and construction industry, can the minister detail what powers are available to the Fair Work Ombudsman to take action in relation to industrial action or threats thereof on a site and other unrelated? Uh, related or unrelated sites of all subcontractors did not have a union-endorsed enterprise bargaining agreement. Uh, was this power available to the ABCC? Minister. Uh, for unlawful industrial action, the Fair Work Commission um, can act in that regard. Uh, that was the same uh, under your government, uh, and that hasn't changed. Senator Cash. So, so that wasn't my question. My question was, was this power available to the Australian Building and Construction Commission? Can I just preface, I started at the beginning by saying that we had asked a number of questions in relation to the transfer of powers 
from the ABCC to the Fair Work Ombudsman. So I'm not interested in what the Fair Work Commission can or can't do. That is the current law. I understand. I'm talking about today we will formally abolish, or tomorrow morning, the Australian Building and Construction Commission. They operate under a specific piece of legislation. The purpose of this, and again, I'm asking the questions very genuinely, and I said to Senator Watt last night, and I said to Senator Watt again this morning, these are important questions when it comes to statutory interpretation. So I'm only dealing with the powers the Australian Building and Construction Commission had and whether or not they transfer over to the Fair Work Ombudsman. What other bodies may or may not be able to do is the current situation. So my answers or the questions are in relation to the transfer of powers from the ABCC under the BCIIP Act to the Fair Work Ombudsman. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, we are confident that there will be no gaps uh, and uh, that those workplaces will be regulated appropriately. Senator Cash. Okay. That is going to come back to bite you. We are confident that there is no gaps because we're about to work through 74 gaps. So it's going to be a long afternoon. Again, I'm going to have to ask you, and again, I have no problems with someone from the, giving, you, give, give, giving you the advice. You have said we are confident there are no gaps. So again, I'm going to go back to the first one. With respect to employers within the building and construction industry, can the minister detail what powers are available, not the Fair Work Commission, not any other body, to the Fair Work Ombudsman? to take action in relation to industrial action or threats thereof on a site and other unrelated or related sites if all subcontractors did not have a union-endorsed enterprise bargaining agreement, and was this a power available to the ABCC? Minister. Um, the powers under the Fair Work Act are what will apply. It's going to be a very long if I have to keep asking the questions and we do not get the answers again there is an entire industry watching these proceedings they genuinely would like to know what exposure they have to the likes of John Setka the most militant union in Australia the construction division of the CFMMEU this is genuine questioning you're abolishing a body and that's your decision. I accept it's an election commitment. But there is also a transfer of powers or not. You have said on the Hansard record, and I quote, we are confident that there are no gaps. To date, we've discovered there are some gaps. So I really need, Minister, with all due respect, answers such as we are confident we've given the money. It's not the line of questioning I'm going down. I am very much going down. We're going to go through each one, each power they had, and whether or not it transferred over. I'm going to have to assume, if you cannot give me an answer, because you've got advisers there, it is going to be no. And then we're going to have to go through later on today what you mean when you say there are confident, uh, you are confident that there are no gaps. So we'll now turn to again. With respect to employers within the building and construction industry, can you detail the powers that are available, not to the Fair Work Commission, I want to know specifically to the Fair Work Ombudsman, and take me to where they are, in relation to stoppage of work by a union because a subcontractor would not enter into a union-endorsed EBA? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And uh, once again, it's the Fair Work Act that would apply. This is unacceptable, and if we need to take a break to actually get someone to come into this place, I don't care who it is, who is actually going to inform <coughs> the Senate. You knew you were coming in here today. I'm quite sure both the minister's office and the department and your office, yeah. you knew there would be a line of questioning in relation to the abolition of the Australian Building and Construction Commission. And do you honestly think it is acceptable? There are people in the gallery here today who are witnessing a minister within the government either refusing or being unable to provide the Australian Senate to answers to incredibly simple questions. You have said 
you are confident there are no gaps. I am now exploring the statement that you have made to the building and construction industry across Australia. They employ in excess of 1.1 million employees. Over 400,000 small businesses rely on them. They contribute about 9 per cent annually to Australia's GDP, and you have no answers in relation to some of the most basic questions which either the minister's office or the department should have anticipated. Again, it is going to be a very, very long three hours because I will go through each one of them. And as I said, what I'm reading out of powers that the ABCC had, I am asking you, it's a simple yes or no, it's a simple yes or no, has this power transferred over to the Fair Work Ombudsman? An answer, it's in the Fair Work Act, is not helping anybody. So we're going to go through this again. Paul, did you want to Seeking the call, Minister. Minister. Uh, thanks for the lecture there, Senator Cash. Um, we know uh, your position on the ABCC, uh, and as you pointed out today, you've acknowledged uh, our position on the ABCC, which we took to the election. Um, I did actually have a look up at the gallery um, when you mentioned and I do see some familiar faces up there, um, and I get a sense that um, they are here, a lot of them, because they want to see this bill passed. Um, we know that you've been uh, opposed to this uh, legislation from the beginning, um, as you are entitled to. Um, but stop the lectures. I'm answering your question. I'm happy to sit here for as long as you want, um, and I'm providing the answers that are required. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Actually, I do want to um, proceed with this about the ABCC. Um, Minister, you are actually from Queensland. You are a senator representing Queensland. Well, actually, in Queensland, there has been a 50 per cent spike in the number of new investigations launched in alleged wrongdoing in the building sector in Queensland, more than any other state or territory. Actually, it was the, <coughs> it was the Millicent Construction Union, the CF. WMEU was also hit with 88 per cent of the $3 million in fines for breaches of the Fair Work Act imposed by the soon-to-be defunct Australian Building and Construction Commission. Um, and there was of, uh, of the $5.1 million in fines the ABCC imposed in Queensland since it was restarted in December 2016, 4.4 million, or 87 per cent of these, were against the CFWMEU or its officials. How is this behaviour going to be dealt with in the bill? Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Hanson. And, um, I think um, we've covered this substantially. Um, we have well resourced the Fair Work Ombudsman. Um, we've uh, traversed this uh, through questions this morning, um, and they are the ones that, that will be responsible for it. Senator Pocock, and then I'll come back to Senator. <coughs> Thank you. We've heard a lot this morning and last night about uh, fines and business and um, industrial action and how the sky is going to fall if this uh, bill is passed. There are millions of workers out there who we haven't heard anything about. Uh, the millions of women, for example, who are hoping for a pay rise, a narrowing of gender equity, an improvement in their circumstances, some flexibility so they know what their rosters are tomorrow. Could you fill us in on how this bill will assist that group of workers who, uh, and people for whom this bill is a very important uh, uh, It holds great potential to improve their lives. So I'm particularly interested in gender and women. Minister. Um, thanks, uh, Senator B. Pocock, and for uh, your constructive work uh, on this issue over a long period of time, but particularly uh, since you've been elected to the Senate. Uh, and the government has made no secret of its desire to get wages moving, uh, and uh, where we see that the most acute need is in feminised industries. Uh, Australian women are amongst the most educated in the OECD, yet the gender pay gap is currently 14.1 uh, per cent, which means women earn $263.90 less than men per week on average. The total remuneration at gender pay gap based on workplace gender equality agency data is 22.8 per cent, uh, meaning men earn almost $26,000 a year more than women. So, as you can see, there is a real 
urgency in terms of how we address this and the need to address this. Um, to promote gender equality, to close the gender pay gap, we need to change the law as the reality. Uh, in the design of these reforms, we have deliberately focused on the needs of lower paid and feminised workforces uh, and believe that uh, the bill that we have put forward uh, best deals with those issues. As Senator David Pocock has pointed out in this chamber, there are some of the very workers who put their health and safety on the line to guide us through the pandemic um, who are really struggling, uh, particularly with the cost of living that people are confronting at the moment. Uh, so that's workers in health care, aged care, disability support, early childhood education care and other care in community sectors. And I think as part of the discussion we had last night is also about attracting workers to these industries as well because they are um, areas where we are suffering from a significant um, labour shortage at the moment and uh, keeping those workers, attracting new workers to those industries uh, are going to be much easier um, if they, they are better paid. Um, so work in these industries is undervalued because of unfair and discriminatory assumptions about the value of the work and the skill required to do the job. Uh, the undervaluation is one of the biggest causes of the gender pay gap and our reforms take a number of key steps to address it. Um, another key cause of the gender pay gap is that our laws are outdated uh, and don't support workers with caring responsibilities well enough. Uh, we will take a number of historic steps to address these issues. Uh, one is changing the objects of the Fair Work Act to include gender equality. Two is fixing, fixing gender pay equity and creating new expert panels. Three, fixing bargaining for low-paid feminised sectors through our new support stream, uh, banning pay secrecy. Five, stamping out sexual harassment and six, providing greater access to flexible work. Um, so that's what the focus of this bill is. Um, that's why uh, it is important. Uh, that's why it urgent, it's urgent um, that it be passed. Uh, and that's why the government has made it a priority um, since we were elected. Senator, I, I, I've already indicated I'm going back to Senator Hanson. Thank Senator you very Hansen. much. Um, I, I know you want the call, Senator Pocock. Look, um, to, to listen to the minister's response about they want to get wages working, ev you know, moving, everyone wants that. Um, the fact is you know, this could have been dealt with also under the state and federal awards to actually move the wages there if you really want to. There's, you know, and to refer to um, Senator Pocock and what he actually has uh, said, that really concerns me because in a small crossbench meeting that he had with my advisers, Malcolm Roberts and the other smaller of the crossbench, you know, he admitted that this bill was being rushed through. He has said that publicly, that it hadn't had enough time for consultation to actually address it and to pull out these things to do with the ABCC with um, multiple enterprise bargaining should be actually further con consultation was to happen with it. It's quite interesting what he says. You know, he said because the committee hearing date last week wasn't passed to extend the, the time for it, and it wasn't going to get passed in this chamber, it was blocked by the Labor and it was blocked by the Greens, that you didn't want to extend the consultation time or the committee to actually further listen to about the IR. So it's very interesting in, Pocock's, in Senator Pocock's comments, and he said, um, he said the after the motion was defeated and it was clear the bill would be voted on this week, he did the research. We're only talking about last week to this week that he did the research. This is his words, not mine. And then he said, I knuckled down and got to work and tried to get across this issue as best I could to be able to make a decision and vote on behalf of the people of the ACT. It's not just the ACT, but he admits that he, he wasn't really across it. When the ABC came into this chamber, we actually then spent three months plus. We spoke to unions, we spoke to the government, we spoke to advice, we spoke to everyone, businesses. It took us that long just to get our heads across the ABC and the impact it has on the construction industry. You can't tell me that a rookie senator in this place who's dealing with all the other legislation has got his head around, knows what's happening in this industry. 
This has been a push by the Labor. I don't know what deals you've done with him, but there's no way in the wide world that he can actually be across this and knows exactly what's going on. And knowing that, the fact is that the rest of the crossbench, you have, you have Labor and you have the Liberal and you have the National Coalition government. But the fact is that the crossbench, we are not beholden to any of the political parties that we actually do represent. Over 33 per cent of, the, of Australians voted for us in this last election, and to push this legislation through is disgusting that you have not really um, put, given big business the chance. Now, I went to the hearing last week and I asked some questions. And I asked the Fair Work Commission, I said, have you ever run a business? Have you ever employed anyone? They looked at me stupid. And then they had to say, well, no, I've only been a public servant. And you really have only listened to them. And I asked a question also. I said, about the public servants, I said, do you realise that right across your own board and public service, you actually also don't have enterprise bargaining because if you work under the E4 or E5, just as a case, in one government department, whether it be defence or another government department, they're actually paid different wages. So that's, that's something I'd, I'd like the minister to answer is also at what point are you is it is it in the bill to deal with the public service you're dealing with the outside the private sector you're telling the private sector what they should be doing what have you got in the bill to cover the public service minister um, thanks uh, senator hansen and I, I think you covered a wide range of subjects there that i understand that um, and i'll get an answer for that but um, in my experience uh, with Senator David Pocock, and I, I'm certainly not going to attack him like you did, um, I have found someone who is diligent, um, who is thorough, uh, and applies um, himself to the task that he has done. Um, he obviously um, was engaged in discussion with the government uh, and made the decision to support this legislation um, because he thinks that this is going to deliver for the Australian people. Uh, and it's also going to be the focus from our government of getting wages moving again. And it, the bemusing thing for me is um, I hear people say, oh, we all want to get wages moving. We all want to get wages moving. I'd be a bit sceptical about the opposition doing it, given their record in government. But when we actually put something forward to do something about it, that's not the right thing. Well, how do you think Australian workers are feeling about that now? Uh, that for 10 years um, it was a deliberate design feature of the previous government for low wages. Uh, but now we have a government that wants to do something about it, that we've put forward legislation to do something about it, uh, and people saying, oh, well, this isn't the right thing to do. No one has actually put forward any other alternative. Uh, this is what we put forward as the government. Um, I've ran through some of the reasons why we think it will be successful, and particularly targeting some of those lower paid uh, industries and feminised workforces, which uh, we think are so important, and those people who are doing it tough. Um, so that's the legislation that we put forward. Um, in terms of the uh, public service, um, the, the Fair Work Act um, covers the public service as it does other workers in the country. Um, Senator Pogue, is this on the same line of questioning? Because I'll, I'll I'm happy to give a couple of calls yes, to Yes, it relates Senator. to research and timing. Okay, then I'll give it to Pocock and then I'll come back to you, Senator I'm, I'm just a rookie, another rookie in this place, but I want to point out that this bill re relies on decades of research about problems for our industrial relations system that have been there for 30 and 40 years. The gender pay equity has sat flat for four decades. Job insecurity in this country is now at a level that makes us an absolute standout in the OECD area. So my question is once again about millions of people whose experience has not been talked about in this debate to date, and that's people who are casual, who are on limited term contracts, who have no security about their work for years over their working lives and suffer a pay penalty, insecurity in their jobs. And how will this bill uh, help deal with that problem of the 21st century, not the old wars, the, the wars that we're hearing about in other people's questions, the, war, the, the reality of Australian labour now. How do we get more security there for those millions of workers? 
Senator Hans, oh, sorry, Minister, do you want to respond to that? Yeah. Um, thanks, Senator uh, B. Pocock, uh, for that contribution. And uh, I think it is an important issue you raise, and I acknowledge your um, long history in this area before you got to the chamber, and uh, plenty of us come um, with experience before we got here, and I think Senator Pocock, D. Pocock um, would be uh, in that space as well. Uh, but it is an important issue, and the Albanese Labor government uh, wants to close the loopholes that are undermining job security and wages. Uh, and too many Australians are stuck in insecure work, and that's dragging down wages. And I see that uh, on my travels through regional Queensland, the prevalence of uh, casual work or labour hire and uh, the undermining of communities that that does. Um, people who are waiting for a phone call uh, to know whether they've got work that day, um, the debilitating impact that has on just surviving, so whether you can get a housing loan, whether you can get a home loan uh, as well, given that uh, people are treated uh, differently in those casualised workforce. So uh, once upon a time it was that those insecure jobs uh, were students or people looking for some extra pocket money, but uh, now too often it's people who are trying to support a family, uh, run a household or just try and get ahead in life. So I think when we think about that it's you know, the pressures of uh, being part of a family, the, the rent um, doesn't operate on a casual basis, the mortgage doesn't operate on a casual basis. Uh, they're things that you are responsible for every week uh, or month, uh, depending on uh, what your commitments are. Um, people in insecure work, they can't take sick leave, they can't get a loan, they can't get ahead, uh, and there are too many rorts and loopholes uh, that the previous government allowed to flourish. Uh, there are nearly 2.7 million casual employees, uh, or 23.5 per cent of all employees, um, who are casual, uh, and these are workers with no paid leave entitlements. Um, of the 1.3 million low-paid employees in 2021, uh, nearly 60 per cent of them were employed on a casual basis, and around 704,000 casual employees um, have had regular work with their employer, and nearly two-thirds of these have had regular work with their employer for more than 12 months. So it shows you that uh, the way that these people are being treated. Um, so it is something that is important, and uh, what this bill will focus on is uh, improving job security and gender equality by including both concepts in the objects of the Fair Work Act. Um, part four would amend section three of division two um, of the Fair Work Act to introduce the promotion of job security and gender equality into the object of the Fair Work Act. And in addition, part four would amend section 134 of the Fair Work Act to include the promotion of job security and gender equality uh, in the modern awards objective. Uh, it would also amend section 284 to include the promotion of gender equality uh, in the minimum wages objective. Uh, and we are also making bargaining more accessible to those who have traditionally been shut out of the benefits of enterprise bargaining, uh, including workers in low paid and feminised sectors of the workforce, uh, of which you are well aware. Um, job security is at the heart of the government's agenda, uh, and this bill puts job security at the heart of the Fair Work Act. Uh, by making job security an object of the Fair Work Act, uh, this is more than just a symbolic change. Uh, this will now be a legislative expectation that the Fair Work Commission has regard to job security uh, when, reforming, when performing relevant functions, uh, and we think that is a very important change for those impacted. Senator Hanson. Uh, I'm just amazed that you actually say about the casualisation of jobs and that type of thing. Um, let me remind you, it was actually One Nation that pushed for people who are casual, un casual, if they've been with the business for 12 months or more, they then have the right to go to the employer and say, we want to be classified as full-time employment. That was One Nation that did that. Aren't you aware of it, Minister? That, that was actually addressed. So people, if they wanted move from being casuals to full-time employment, they have every right to do it now. But a lot of people wish to stay as casuals because of the pay that they're getting, the higher rate of pay they have at the time. So that was something that One Nation So We do care about the workers out there. We do understand the stresses and strains that they are going through. Minister, can you tell me what consultations did you have with businesses to ask them if they can actually afford to pay this. So if you're a smaller business, you're competing with a bigger enterprise organisation, what consultation was taken and what consideration was taken into effect whether they can afford 
the enterprise bargaining agreements that larger organisations have actually agreed to, and it will flow onto them because like-minded. So, what consultations have been taken? Yes, sir. Uh, thanks, Senator Hanson. And uh, a very thorough consultation process uh, was undertaken before the introduction. Uh, so, meeting with key business peaks, the BCA. Uh, Aki, the AI group, and COSBOA on multiple occasions, as well as the ACTU. Uh, many business groups representing single interests, such as Clubs Australia, uh, Master Builders Association, National Farmers Federation, Australian Resources and Energy Employer Association, the Australasian Convenience and Petroleum Marketers Association, uh, Manufacturing and Installation Association, uh, individual employers, such as Qantas DP Weld, uh, Team Global Express, formerly TOL, uh, the National Women's Alliances, including represent representatives from uh, Migrant Women uh, in Business, Harmony Alliance, uh, National Rural Women's Coalition, uh, Women with Disabilities Australia, uh, YWCA Canberra, uh, academics with a focus on workplace practices and law, including Professor Anthony Forsyth from RMIT, uh, Professor Shami Crystal from University of Sydney. Um, written submissions ahead of the Jobs and Skills Summit, uh, including peak business groups, 34 were sought, 20 were received. Uh, the Committee on Industrial Legislation, including business representatives from the peak body, uh, Business Council Australia, Housing Industry Association, National Farmers Federation, Master Builders, Pharmacy Guild uh, of Australia, representing COSBOA, uh, Australian Industry Group, Australian Business Lawyers and Advisors, Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, the Australian Resources and Energy Employer Association was invited uh, but did not attend. Um, from the 10th to 14th of October 2022, the department had te held 10 dedicated consultations, including uh, business peaks, employers, for example, Woolworths, academics, uh, ACTU, state and territory officials, and national women's alliances. Uh, in terms of consultation on government amendments, um, since the introduction on, on uh, the 27th, uh, the minister's office and department had at least a dozen further meetings with employers and employer groups uh, to discuss concerns, including the Franchise Council, Business Peaks, BHP, Clubs Australia, West Farmers, Woolworths and Coles. Uh, and obviously, the Senate inquiry um, was uh, held as well, uh, which had five days of hearings. Uh, and my understanding is there uh, was only a one-day hearing uh, into the bill re-establishing the ABCC. Senator Hanson. Minister, I, I, wonderful uh, you've given me that list and uh, just listening to Woolworths and Qantas and all these ones. My question basically was that if something at the smaller end, if they could afford the enterprise bargain agreements of the larger businesses. You know, I, it's just ridiculous to say you've had all these meetings with these people, but the fact is, have you actually consulted with these businesses? Can they actually afford it? If a small business is actually going to have to get legal advice and consultation, everything they have to go through, you're going to put an extra over $14,000 at a cost to a small business to actually um, to be able to deal with all this. So. My question again, and I'll repeat it. Have you had any feedback from businesses that are saying they're going to have trouble actually affording this? And can they, will it affect their businesses? Has any businesses told you this will impact on them that possibly may force them to shut down their business or take it overseas? Minister. Um, not to my knowledge, Senator Hanson, but I think the the focus and I think the important thing for uh, smaller businesses to understand is the cooperative workplaces, which is where uh, we think uh, small businesses would more than likely end up. Uh, it's entirely voluntary and allows small businesses to opt into agreements uh, without having to incur the costs of negotiating it. Uh, it gives them access to the benefits of bargaining for productivity, simplicity and flexibility uh, that currently only bigger businesses can access. Um, so that is where what we feel will be appropriate, um, and we think that would be also cost-effective at the same time. Senator Hanson. Um, Minister, I, mean, I, I just want to ask you something else also. 
did you actually take into consideration because this is if you're going to increase wages and that's what you're wanting is to, to increase wages but also this is plus 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 on top of it so it's just not to do with wages enterprise bargaining means that they could bargain for four four days a week they could bargain for you know extra holidays this is all added cost to the employer but if they actually do increase their wages have you actually considered to have negotiations or talks with the states? Because what, what this is going to do is put added cost onto businesses with payroll tax in the states. Have you, ha have you taken this into consideration and have you actually tried to negotiate with the states to actually look at the payroll tax? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Hanson. Um, the states and territories, as I mentioned when I I went through the consultation uh, list before were consulted as part of the bill. Senator Sorry, Hanson. can you repeat that? Because actually, you either uh, I just didn't get a word of that. Can you please repeat that, Minister? Thanks, Senator Hanson. Uh, I just said that the, as the list I ran through previously um, of consultation, the states and territories were part of that. So I mentioned them as part of that process. Senator Hanson. So the payroll tax, you, you understand that it possibly could have an impact on businesses because they're going to pay more in wages, the costs involved with all this. It could actually drive it up and instead of putting more employees on, you're actually going to reduce the staffing level. So is this being taken into consideration? That's what I want to ask, not about consultation. It was this taken into consideration in the bill that if you're going to drive up wages, you're actually going to create unemployment because businesses will not be able to afford the economic they're going to pay in, in um, payroll tax, and each state varies in the amount of payroll tax that businesses pay. Minister. Thanks, Senator Hanson. As I said, the states and territories were consulted. Um, you, you would have to ask them their views uh, on that issue. Senator Hanson. You haven't. It was not part of this. You're not interested. You just passing the buck to the states. They deal with payroll tax. I'm sorry, if you put out a bill like this, you have to take in consideration of the impact it's going to have on businesses, whether they can afford it or not. And I'll tell you now that this is going to have an impact on businesses that will have to reduce their staff because they won't be able to afford the overheads and the costs. And this is something I've been on about for years and years and years, about the unfair payroll tax, which is destroying workers you know, we, they are not employing more staff because they can't afford it with that unfair tax. Just tell me also, um, and, uh, is when an agreement is not reached, can pro protected industrial action commence? Minister. Um, it, would, it would depend on what stream you're referring to, Senator Hanson. So we've sort of been talking about the cooperative stream because we were discussing small business and that's where we think they would most likely end up. So um, in the cooperative stream, the answer is no. Senator Hanson. Minister, this, this bill goes across and it says um, basically businesses who are similar similar in their, <clears throat> what they may do. Okay, so if you sell fish and chips, if you sell actually seafood, or if you sell, it's, you haven't really clearly defined <clears throat> what the similarities are going to be. So it doesn't mean that in producing, whether you're a retailer, whether you're a restaurant, whether you're a manufacturer, whether you um, box in the same um, way, um, are you in the same shopping centre? You haven't defined that what similar entities are. That is not in the bill. So you've left it open-ended. Can you explain that part to me? Please define so businesses out there know what enterprise bargaining agreement they're going to be tied up with another supposedly like-minded business. Minister. Thanks. Um, and uh, again, it, it depends on the stream. So we were talking about the cooperative stream. Uh, there, where there is um, no single interest test there um, in that space. Um, but in terms of uh, other streams, um, there would be uh, it's called the 
the common, common interest test, um, which would be determined by the Fair Work Commission. Senator Hanson. Unidentifiable common interest test, and you've left everyone out there wondering um, what the hell is going to happen here, and meaning that what I see written over this bill is union, union, union. <coughs> This is payback from the unions to the to, this is payback from the Labor Party to the unions for all funding, all the money that they've given you, and this is just basically about giving the unions the rights to walk into businesses and with enterprise bargaining sign up here. I can I can just see it now. They're going to walk in the business. They're going to say to the to the employee, um, "Do you want high wages? Of course we want high wages. Who's stupid enough to say no? We don't." And of course, when they get the agreement that they all want high wages, well, listen, mate, you sign up to the unions and we're going to go and fight for you for higher wages. That's written all over this bill. Union, union, union. And I'll tell you another thing. We've got a bill that you, you've, you, know, you want to actually get through to this, this parliament. And I'll tell, tell that where's Senator Pocock? Um, I'll tell him also. Pages and pages of amendments, even the government amendments, nine pages. You know what that tells me? If you were to go and buy a car and you had all these defects in the car, nine pages, all these defects, and that's just not the Labor. This is all the Liberal Party, the Greens, David Pocock, Jackie Lambie, all these amendments. And it's like you're going to buy a car. Well, listen, with this car, we've actually got to make changes here. These are the defects. You know what would tell me? You're buying a friggin' lemon. And that's what it would tell me. And that's exactly what this bill tells me. That you have not researched it properly. You're rushing it through this parliament. You've got a rookie senator that you've talked into supporting this bill. And you know, it's a real shame because you cannot guarantee the people out there that they're actually going to get a rise in wages. Because there is a lack of um, workers out there. Businesses, I'll inform you what's going on. A lot of businesses are actually paying their workers above the award just to get good staff, just to get them. So they want to hold on to them. So they have risen um, and are paying a lot of them above the award and all the um, other agreements plus, plus, plus that they want. But also what you're going to tie up here, and I'll tell you, because I've been a small business person most of my life. You're going to have enterprise bargaining right across the board with a lot of these workers as well, instead of a single enterprise bargaining with the worker. Is that a lot of these workers, the no-hopers, the ones that do not do a decent day's work, you've got one person working beside them who works their guts out and does a damn good job, and the other one beside them, they're on their phone all day, don't work, don't pro productivity is down the bloody drain. So you're going to tie them up into getting the same pay, the same rights, same everything. That is going to really upset the worker who does his job and, and takes pride in his work and productivity. And that's what's going to happen as well. This whole bill stinks. As I said to you, the public service hasn't even got their own act together. And I'll say to you, clean up your own backyard before you start telling the private enterprise how to run their businesses and whether they can afford it or not. Because you're going to drive a lot of these businesses into the ground who can't afford it. And you're pushing this on to them. You are actually going to create unemployment with this, with this bill. It is Ill, Ill thought out. It is not um, dealing with the real issues. There is not enough consultation. You're going to get rid of the ABCC because it suits the CFMEU to get rid of it because they won't have to be answerable to anyone. They are nothing but thugs on some, not all, not all, I'm talking about the officials, that are actually can be thugs on these building sites that have destroyed small businesses. It has driven up the cost on these building sites by 30 per cent, and that's going to be the same effect again. And yet you think it's a good thing? You know, your promises, and I'll tell you, you don't have a mandate. When only 32 or 33 per cent of Australians voted for Labor, you don't have a mandate at all. Not at all. The system got you the seats in here that gives you government. That's not a mandate to me. A mandate is 50.1 per cent of the vote. You didn't get that. 
So I don't believe you're listening to the Australian people. Um, Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And, uh, I don't know where to start with Senator Hanson's contribution there, but um, I could probably go for a while about a lecture of how democracy works. I don't think any uh, government in Australia has got 50.1 per cent of the vote for a fair while, Senator Hanson. Um, but uh, when I see this bill, um, I know you said you see unions, I see workers. Uh, and I see workers throughout it because that is who we want to support. And more importantly, I see uh, a bill that is designed to ensure people do get that wage rise. Uh, and that is what we are absolutely dedicated to do. Um, so that has been the focus of uh, what we've wanted to achieve through this. Um, again, uh, I, I mentioned it earlier, uh, everyone tries to claim their full wage rises, um, but then they keep coming up with a thousand excuses of why they don't support them. Um, we are unashamedly in favour of it. I think one of the clearest memories for the Australian people during the election campaign uh, was the Prime Minister, the now Prime Minister, um, holding up the dollar. Uh, and I think that resonated with the Australian people. Um, I have no doubt that um, there is support across the community. There is obviously the support in this chamber, uh, and that's the way our democracy works, Senator Hanson. Senator Cash. Uh, before I go back to questions on the ABCC, Senator Hanson has actually raised uh, questions in relation to the common interest test in the single interest stream. And uh, after the questions that were asked last night, Senator Sarah Henderson was actually approached by the uh, Geelong Manufacturing Council. She has the media release. So I could just refer you to the Geelong Manufacturing Council's media release of the 23rd of November 2022. Um, Minister, are you aware of a request by the Geelong Manufacturing Council to exclude the manufacturing sector from aspects of this bill, including the multi-employer bargaining provisions? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Senator Cash. Um, uh, I'm not aware of that uh, specific uh, one you talked about, but I am aware that uh, other um, industries um, have put forward similar cases. Senator Cash. When you say other industries, could you just, again for the Hansard record, just take us through what other industries uh, put forward the case that they should be excluded, given that there is a civil construction carve-out, and we'll go through the reasons later as to why you determined that. Uh, but what are then the other industries? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Senator Cash. Uh, I'm aware of mining. I'll um, see if I have any further advice. Senator Cash. So just in terms of the Geelong Manufacturing Council, um, in their media release they raise a number of serious concerns, including in relation to uh, provisions that they say undermine the system of enterprise bargaining and the comprehensive system of modern awards that have served manufacturing and employers well for decades, risk unfairly subjecting broad sectors to centralised settings, and Senator Hanson has just uh, referred exactly to what their concerns are uh, in that regard, a centralised setting um, of terms and conditions, a one-size-fits-all policy uh, that actually doesn't fit all employers, uh, reducing individual enterprise-level autonomy and competitiveness. Uh, again, did the government give any consideration to excluding the manufacturing sector from the multi-employer provisions in the bill? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Senator Cash. Uh, no. Senator Cash. Uh, with respect to the definition of common interest, they've given some very specific questions they would like uh, an answer to. So I'll just run through them. Does the shoe manufacturing business EMU Australia, headquartered in Geelong, have a common interest with Boundary Bend Olives, a manufacturer of olive oil based in North Geelong, in terms of obviously the key word there, a common interest? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. Um, we believe in giving the fair work. Uh, commission a reasonable level of discretion on this. Um, so we deliberately provided discretion to the Commission to determine in any given set of circumstances uh, where there is a clearly identifiable common interest between the employers 
uh, and whether or not the bargain is contrary to the public interest and whether or not the employers in question are reasonably comparable. Senator Cash. So again, you're not able to actually answer the specific question, and we did go through this yesterday with Senator Watt. Uh, the answer, though, again, is it is ultimately at the discretion of the Fair Work Commission, and Sarah Henderson obviously has just joined us in the table. Uh, that they are. Uh, the Senate chamber. So, Senator Henderson, the answer to the first question, just so for your constituents you understand what the answer is, does the shoe manufacturing business EMU Australia, headquartered in Geelong, have a common interest with Boundary Bend Olives, a manufacturer of olive oil based in North Geelong? Uh, that is a decision at the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. No yes, no certainty at all for them. Let's see if we can get some certainty for the next group of employers that have put forward this question. Does the manufacturer Blackwell IXL based in Backwell IXL based in South Geelong, which manufactures a range of products including homewares and steel fabrication, and which employs around 60 people, have a common interest with the oil refinery Viva Energy based in North Geelong? which employs about 700 people. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Mr. Um, same answer as before. Senator Cash. Senator Henderson, could I just confirm for the Hansard record, there is no further guidance that can be provided to these employers who have come to you. Uh, the government doesn't have any further guidance in relation to what the common interest is, whether it is a regulatory or, in this case, potentially geographic that you're putting forward because well, they're in your electorate cash, of Geelong. Put your comments through the chair. I'll put your comments uh, through the chair. Um, they unfortunately don't change. Uh, again, that is at the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. Can I therefore go to then this proposition that has been put forward uh, to Senator Henderson? Does AKD Softwoods, based in Colac, Australia's largest producer of softwood timber with more than 1,000 employees, have a common interest with Buller Dairy Foods, a large manufacturer of ice cream and other dairy products also based in Colac? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. Uh, and same answer as previously. Senator Cash. For the benefit of the Hansard record, because I don't want to verbal you, can I confirm that there is no further guidance that can be provided? It is ultimately at the discretion of the Fair Work Commission to determine whether or not they have a common interest. Minister. We've already answered that question, Senator Cash. Senator Cash. A again, I'll just ask you to say yes, I don't want to verbal you when we go back to these people. On that's the why. So, yeah, on the specific cases, I don't want to verbal you. If the answer is yes, I will accept it's yes, but I don't want to verbal you. Minister, we've already answered that question. Senator I'm Cash, going to, have to take it, the answer is yes, because that was the answer given yesterday. That there was no further guidance, and it was at the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. If I could just now turn to, with respect to the definition of geographical area again, is the shoe manufacturing business? Ah, that was actually the same questions. Yeah, but just in the same oh, sorry, this is a geographic area. Yeah. Is the shoe manufacturing business EMU Australia headquartered in central Geelong in the same geographical area as Boundary Bend Olives, a manufacturer of olive oil based in North Geelong? So now we're looking at the geographical area. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And same answer again, Senator Cash. Senator Cash. It is uh, left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission, so there's no further guidance that can be given in relation to that particular example. Uh, is the manufacturer Backwell IXL based in South Belong, uh, Geelong, which manufactures a range of products including homewares and steel fabrication and which employs around 60 people in the same geographical area as the oil refinery Viva Energy based in North Geelong, which employs around 700 people? Minister. Uh, same answer again, Senator Cash. Senator Cash. Again, there is no further guidance that can be given. It is left to the discretion of uh, the Fair Work Commission. Uh, again, in relation to the definition of, or further guidance even, in relation to geographical area, is AKD Softwoods based in Forest Street, Colac, uh, again Australia's largest producer of softwood timber, 
with more than 1,000 employees in the same geographical area as Bullard Dairy Foods, which is located in Connor Street, Colac, and that distance there is about three kilometres away. Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Cash, and, and uh, same answer again. And I think um, I was paying uh, attention last night. You traversed a lot of these issues with Senator Watt, and I think it was uh, a similar response at the time. Senator Cash. Th that is correct, and that's why I just wanted to ensure that overnight we couldn't suddenly provide further detail or clarification in relation to some specific examples, and that's fine. But th so we can now go back to these. We've been asked to put these questions and say there is no further detail, there is no further clarification. The answer is consistent. It remains at the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. Um, just in terms of my questions to you um, that Senator Henderson uh, had provided in relation to, um, I asked you had the government given any consideration to excluding the manufacturing sector from the multi-employer provisions? Uh, you said that consider, uh, and the answer to that question was no. Did the department provide any advice to the government about how this sector could be excluded or carved out? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. No. Senator Cash. Uh, did the department provide the government uh, any advice in relation to how the mining or the mining and resources sector could be carved out? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Senator Cash. My understanding is that uh, Senator Watt dealt with this issue last night, and I have nothing further to add to his explanation. Senator Cash. Uh, I, I didn't ask Senator Watt a question in relation to what departmental advice was provided to the government about how these sectors could or could not be carved out. Uh, this is the first time I'm asking this particular question, so Senator Watt did not give me a, an answer last night. Uh, you have now stated that you are aware that there were certain industries that did make representations to government uh, in relation to potential carve-outs. Uh, you said you've got one for me, mining resources. You said you're not aware of the manufacturing industry or manufacturers putting any request into government. You've said you'll go away on notice, and the good news is we're open-ended tonight, so we'll be able to get that information, um, if not shortly, then after question time, in relation to the other sectors that approach the government and ask for a carve-out. So this is information that you've given me that I'm now questioning you on. So I ask again, did the department provide any advice to the government about how the mining or the mining and resources sector could be carved out or excluded from uh, the single-interest multi-employer bargaining stream? Minister. There was general consultation, um, but no advice from the department, is my understanding. Senator Cash. Uh, but you are aware uh, of representations made by the mining and resources uh, industry um, in relation to, very similar to civil construction, how they could actually be excluded from multi-employer bargaining. Minister. Uh, thanks. I, I think in my answer to Senator Hanson's question, I talked through that that industry was consulted. Senator Cash. I asked. I said. So, so you are confirming, though, that they made representations that they should be similar to the civil construction industry that we we discussed last night, excluded from multi-employer bargaining. I just want to. I'm not verbaling you. I just want to make sure that that I understand you were aware of those representations. Minister. Thanks, Chair. Uh, correct, Senator Cash. Senator Cash. Uh, is there a carve out? There is a carve out for, for civil construction, etc. And we did go through that tonight and we'll explore that a bit more this afternoon. Um, can I confirm there is no carve out or exclusion then for the mining and resources industry in terms of uh, multi employer bargaining? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. That's correct, Senator Cash. Senator Cash. Um, given the front page of The Australian, and in particular the concerns raised by Mike Henry in relation to BHP, given the concerns also raised by Rio Tinto, 
um, and it's one's the west coast, one's the east coast, obviously. Uh, given the evidence in relation to why there is a carve out for civil construction that was provided by Senator Watt last night, and I quote, it was because, uh, without verbaling him, uh, the high use of agreements at an enterprise level that had been negotiated, I think Mike Henry might argue. Uh, that within the mining and uh, resources industry on the East Coast, and in particular for BHP, there is a very, very, very high use uh, of enterprise bargaining agreements. Uh, why did the government ignore the concerns of these industries? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I believe Senator Watt um, dealt with this last night, and I have nothing further to add to his answers. Uh, Senator Cash. Uh, well, unless Senator Watt is talking to the shaman, he definitely did not see in questioning yesterday the front page of the Australian newspaper. I accept that you do take advice from shamans and spiritual healers and magicians and dog walkers and dog trainers in terms of costings for your regulatory impact statement. Uh, but again, I didn't put the front page of the Australian to Minister Watt last night, unless we were sitting at 1am, which I don't believe we were. So again, in terms of the front page of the Australian, the issues raised by Mike Henry on behalf of BHP, uh, the issues that have also been raised on behalf of Rio Tinto, uh, the evidence that was given in relation to the rationale behind the government carving out the civil construction industry uh, from multi-employer bargaining, and the evidence was because there is a high use of enterprise bargaining agreements. Uh, Mike Henry, as I said, on behalf of BHP, would argue there is a very high use of enterprise agreements uh, in the mining and resources industry on the East Coast. Why did the government ignore the concerns of those industries when it was prepared to carve out the civil construction industry? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. Uh, I think Senator Watt traversed these subjects last night. Uh, in regards to the article in The Australian, uh, BHP, Rio Tinto are entitled to their view. Senator Cash, I have Senator Pocock who also wishes to ask a question, but you have priority, so. Sorry. Okay, in that case, you continue. I'm happy to jump again because I still do have a line of questioning on this. Sure. Senator Cash, you have the call. Senator Henderson, on the same line. Uh, yes, Chair, thank Senator you very Henderson. much. Just picking up on the issues with the manufacturing sector. If a Geelong manufacturer is compelled to bargain with Viva Energy, a large oil refinery in Geelong, I have been advised a short time ago by one employer that if it was required to match the same terms and conditions as those offered by Viva Energy, including up to two years severance pay, uh, that would force this business to close. How can Geelong manufacturers be given certainty that they won't be placed in this situation and forced to close if required or compelled to bargain with the likes of Viva Energy in Geelong? Minister. Thanks, uh, Chair. Thanks, Senator Henderson. Uh, what you put forward there was a hypothetical. No. Senator Henderson. Chair, with respect. Senator Henderson, you have the call. Chair, with respect, that's actually completely incorrect. I have just put to you a particular case. I have literally got off the phone from a Geelong manufacturer who has said to me, the chief executive officer and proprietor, minister, has said to me that if this business, based in Geelong, was required to bargain with Viva Energy and match the terms and conditions that are offered by Viva Energy to its employees, which include up to two years of severance pay, then that business will be forced to close because it cannot carry that level of contingent liability. So again, Minister, this is not a hypothetical. I ask you, how will you give manufacturers in the Geelong region the certainty that they will not be placed in that situation so that they can have certainty as to their future? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Henderson. I think the, the key word in your question was if. Um, so it obviously and clearly was a hypothetical situation um, that you're putting to me, um, and that is my response. Senator Henderson. That's a ridiculous answer, with respect. Uh, I have put to you that there is an employer in Geelong, if compelled, these laws are not in effect as yet. 
But if these laws are passed, as I assume they will be, and Geelong manufacturers are required, are compelled under your laws, they are manufacturers which employ more than 20 people. So if they are required and compelled to bargain with Viva Energy, please provide this chamber with the advice as to how Geelong manufacturers can be given certainty that they won't be placed in this situation and forced to close. And the response that you gave before is totally inadequate and does not address my question, and I would ask you to address my question. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Henderson. And it, it is a hypothetical proposition that you're putting to me. Um, in terms of uh, a single interest test, if an employer uh, does not want to bargain for a single interest multi-enterprise agreement, there are factors the Fair Work Commission must be satisfied of before granting an authorisation, such as a majority of the employees must want a bargain. Uh, if the business is in a franchise, uh, the business uh, is reasonably comparable with other businesses to be covered by the agreement, and the employers have clearly identifiable common interests, uh, and it is not contrary to the public interest. Um, so again, um, that's some uh, level of information for you, um, but uh, I won't answer a hypothetical situation that you're putting to me. Senator Henderson. Situation, Minister, and it seems to me that you are failing to address this question. These are real, live, real life fears in the Geelong community about Geelong manufacturing. And Minister, the former coalition government, after inheriting a situation where when we came into government in 2013, Ford had announced it was closing on Labor's watch. So we came into government in 2013 when Geelong was on its knees. Manufacturers had no confidence in the future. And we worked extremely hard as a coalition to turn the economy around locally. And now we have a vibrant manufacturing sector. A vibrant manufacturing sector, Minister, which is working well together also. And now, under these laws, you are proposing, your government is proposing, to pit manufacturer against manufacturer, to create a war an industrial war in Geelong. We are one of the most successful manufacturing regions in the country. And now, under these laws, Minister, you are proposing to pit manufacturer against manufacturer. And your answer, the fact that you, under your laws, cannot provide Geelong manufacturers with any guidance or, in fact, any manufacturer around this country is a disgrace. I am not posing hypothetical questions, and with respect, Minister, your answer is pathetic. And it shows, it shows how little this government cares about manufacturing. It is ridiculous, Minister, that you cannot tell AKD Softwoods, again, an incredible company based in Colac, supported heavily by the former coalition government, which has grown exponentially, now the largest producer of softwood, softwood timber in this country, with more than 1,000 employees. Your government and you as the responsible minister, the acting minister, cannot tell Australians if this business is in the same geographical area as Buller Dairy Foods, which is located three kilometres away in Connor Street, Colac? I mean, that is absurd. So again, Minister, I would invite you to provide manufacturers in Victoria, including in the Geelong region, with the certainty that they require so that they know that perhaps their futures are assured. Because right now, in the offices of the Geelong Manufacturing Council and in the offices of every manufacturer in Geelong and across Victoria and, frankly, across this na nation, there is deep fear. So again, I ask you to ad address the question. And if the answer is this is a matter for the Fair Work Commission, then that's fine. But please address the question. Thank you, Minister. Minister. 
Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Senator Henderson. And I've already answered the question that you've put, and uh, it doesn't take long for them to get back on the scare campaign, because um, that's all they've got. Because they've learnt uh, absolutely zero um, from the last election campaign. And if Geelong was going so good, how did you get voted out? What happened there? If Geelong was going so good, how did you get voted out? Um, so clearly they were not happy with you, and clearly the local workers weren't happy with you, and clearly the local manufacturing workers Order. weren't happy with you as well. Um, but the good list. news that I have uh, for manufacturing workers in Victoria, in Geelong and across the country uh, is they now have a federal government that is absolutely committed to working with them and rebuilding manufacturing in this, in this country. Uh, that is what uh, will be a focus on, and I've, I've got the Assistant Minister for Manufacturing uh, in the chamber as well, who was working very diligently with this. Uh, I saw that Minister Husick announced, uh, put forward the legislation yesterday uh, implementing our election policy. So I am absolutely confident that the manufacturing sector uh, in Australia uh, will be very, very well supported by this government. Uh, and we had big plans that we took to the election, uh, and we intend on uh, delivering on them. Uh, and I'm sure the manufacturers of Geelong will be very excited by that. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And just in terms of, we were previously talking about the carve out of civil construction from multi employer bargaining, uh, and you have indicated that you were aware that the mining and resources industry had provided representations to the government in relation to being carved out. You weren't aware if representations had been made uh, by the manufacturing industry, and you'd come back to me in relation to um, other industries. Um, again, as discussed with Senator Watt last night, um, the rationale for the carve out of the civil construction uh, or, or of civil construction from multi-employer bargaining. Uh, was the high proportion or percentage or number of single enterprise agreements uh, in the sector. Could I therefore ask that you bring back to the chamber um, the number of single enterprise agreements in the construction, mining and resources and manufacturing sectors so we can just do that comparison uh, compared to civil and construction? Minister. We'll see what we can provide, Senator Cash. Senator Cash. We probably won't get anything, I'm assuming, uh, which is a great shame, but we can do the analysis afterwards. Uh, just in terms of also, and uh, Senator Henderson was talking about uh, numbers of employees in businesses, and uh, one of the amendments that was, I understand, negotiated with Senator Pocock, I think it was also though a recommendation uh, of the committee of the Labor members on the committee uh, that looked into the bill, was increasing the employee headcount of businesses uh, who will be excluded from multi-employer bargaining to 20. Uh, can you confirm how the government came to this specific number? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. And, uh, obviously, we take uh, Senate inquiries very seriously, and it was changed on the uh, recommendation that they made. Senator Cash. So, can I confirm? Not this was not part of the deal done with Senator David Pocock. This was actually part of the recommendation of the Senate inquiry. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. That's correct. Senator Cash. Can I just ask? Um, was any assessment, consideration or modelling undertaken uh, for the legislation, given all the concerns when the legislation was initially tabled um, in relation to uh, the small definition of small business in, the, in this particular section, to increasing the headcount to, say, 25 employees, 50 employees or 100 employees? Did the government undertake any further work in that regard? Minister. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. So, uh, increasing it to 20 uh, excludes 97.5 per cent of small business. Of business. Of all business. Sorry, Senator Cash. Uh, with all due respect, that wasn't my question. Uh, my question was: Was any assessment, consideration, modelling undertaken? 
given in particular all of the concerns that were raised uh, in relation to the definition of small business in this particular section to increasing the headcount to 25 employees or 50 employees or 100 employees, 125, 150, 175 or 200. What further modelling? And if the answer is none, I can accept the answer as being none, but was there any assessment, consideration or modelling undertaken? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Senator Cash. And my understanding is that the, in the Fair Work Act it's uh, currently 15, um, and we based our decision to go to 20 on the recommendation uh, from the Senate inquiry. So that was the substance of, of our decision making. Senator Cash. Thank you. And so I can I just again I don't want to verbal you for the Hansard record. So there was no assessment, consideration or modelling undertaken by the government in relation to increasing the headcount, for example, 25, 50 employees, 100 employees, etc. You accepted the recommendation of the committee. Minister. Um, there was some consultation with the department, but that uh, was our decision making process uh, that I ran through before. Senator Cash. Uh, in relation to the consultation with the department, um, was any consideration given to, again, 25 employees, 50 employees, 75, 100, any number above 20 employees? Minister. Uh, I would just refer to my earlier answer um, about uh, the recommendation from the Senate uh, inquiry. Um, was the basis of our decision on the 20. Senator Cash. Uh, if I could just now turn back to, again, I said I had a very long line of questions uh, in relation to the transfer of powers. Uh, Senator Cash, just before you continue, I notice Senator Pocock has left the room, but we had sort of an agreement when you went to a new line, we passed the call. So when she does come back in, I'm conscious that she's had stopped the call a couple of times. Senator Cash. Uh, so if I could just go back to the line of questioning in relation to uh, the Australian Building and Construction Commission, and maybe it will assist the minister in answering the questions if I also then refer to the sections in the, B in the BCIIP Act that I am referring to so that we can actually determine whether or not there is that transfer of powers again uh, to the Fair Work Ombudsman. Uh, sections 54 and 55 of the BCIIP Act uh, the ABCC would take action to seek injunction and bring prosecution seeking penalties uh, on behalf of an affected subcontractor. Um, can I just confirm, in relation to sections 54 and 55, uh, does that actually transfer over to the Fair Work Ombudsman? Minister. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. So, um, there is no transfer of powers. The powers already exist uh, in the Fair Work Act, and the Fair Work Ombudsman is an independent and well-resourced regulator uh, that we expect to do that job. Um, the key relevant uh, general protect protections um, in the Fair Work Act are Part 3-1, Division 4, uh, Inclusive Activities, um, se sub uh, Section 346, a person must not take adverse action against another person uh, because the person does not engage uh, in uh, industrial activity. Um, section 347, uh, engage in industrial activity uh, if they, com if they e comply, uh, with an un sorry, comply with an unlawful request uh, made by or requirement uh, or uh, industrial association. Um, section 348, coercion, a person must not organise or take a uh, um, a, person, a person must not organise, take or threaten uh, to organise or take uh, any action against another person uh, to coerce the other person uh, or a Um, or a third person to engage uh, in industrial action. Um, the penalty is 60 penalty units, uh, and Section 539 of the Fair Work Act can make application to enforce. Senator Cash. Could I just ask then, who actually brings the adverse action claim? Minister. Uh, 
Uh, thanks, Chair. So it would be uh, employee, an employer, uh, a employer organisation, uh, or the Fair Work Ombudsman. Or an inspector. Senator Cash. Um, yes, yeah, so can I just yeah, want to confirm that you're saying the Fair Work Ombudsman can bring the adverse action claim? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Correct, Senator Cash. Senator Cash. Um, with respect to employers within the building and construction industry, can I get you to detail what powers are available to the Fair Work Ombudsman to take action in relation to union officials restricting or threatening to restrict a subcontractor's opportunity to obtain work uh, if it did not sign up to a union-endorsed uh, EBA, and in particular, um, the issue that I do want to hone in on is what's the difference between the powers of the ABCC and the Fair Work Ombudsman? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. So th those key relevant uh, general protections that I outlined earlier um, are appropriate. Senator Cash. It doesn't really answer the specific question, though. So, sections 54 and 55 of the BCIRP Act, the ABCC would take action to seek an injunction and bring prosecution seeking penalties on behalf of an affected contractor. The ABCC could also, um, also require um, to ensure competition laws are upheld and would refer any related issues to the ACCC for investigation. The code required that employers maintain compliance with competition laws at all times and non-observance uh, is sanctionable. So that was under the BCIRP Act. The Act is being abolished. Uh, what is now the difference between what was under the BCII Act in terms of what I've read out and what is now uh, the power of the Fair Work Ombudsman? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Kerr. So, the Fair Work Ombudsman can enforce any breach of the Fair Work Act. Senator Cash. Uh, again, though, we go back to: Is it mandatory for the Fair Work Ombudsman to do this, or is it at the discretion of the Fair Work Ombudsman? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. And. It is at the discretion, exactly the same as it was at what it was under the ABCC. Senator Cash. Um, again, I mean, all of the questions are prefaced with it is respect to employers within the building and construction industry. Uh, can you detail what powers are available to the Fair Work Ombudsman to take action in relation to union officials pressuring head contractors uh, to replace subcontractors in a site? because they did not have um, a union-endorsed EBA, and can the Fair Work Ombudsman represent employers? Minister. Um, previous answer, Senator Cash, but the Fair Work Ombudsman can uh, would enforce against any breach of the Act by any person. Senator Cash. Um, can the Fair Work Ombudsman represent employers? Minister. Um, he represents himself, so he, he institutes proceedings. Senator Cash. Um, with respect again to, as I said, employers within the building and construction industry, uh, what powers are available to the Fair Work Ombudsman to take action in relation to the threat by union officials to prevent subcontractors with particular types of employment categories, uh, such as casual employees, uh, from working on site? And in particular, um, can you take me through the difference between um, the powers that the ABCC had to gather evidence 
and the powers that the Fair Work Ombudsman will have to gather evidence. Minister. Um, uh, the Fair Work Ombudsman would treat them the same as any other industry. Senator Cash. And can you take me through, uh, in terms of the powers, um, is there a difference in the powers to gather evidence that the Fair Work Ombudsman has and that the ABCC had? Minister. Um, uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. As you'd be aware, uh, we've long been of the view that the powers uh, previously were excessive. Um, we believe there are now adequate powers. Uh, there will be adequate powers under the legislation that we've had, and uh, we believe that uh, all workers should be treated uh, fairly and evenly across the country. Senator Cash. Uh, again, that, that, that wasn't my question. My question was, and I just need to understand. What are the powers the ABCC currently has in relation to gathering evidence? And in terms of the translation over, I accept the powers are less, but I do just want to understand uh, what the difference in the evidence gathering powers is. Minister. So just, just to be uh, clear, Senator Cash, um, there was no transfer of powers. What we're saying is the Fair Work Act has the necessary powers that they need uh, to ensure that uh, all workers uh, are treated fairly, um, but also um, that workplaces are regulated accordingly as well. Senator Cash. C can I just confirm in terms of the statement that you had made? Um, you had previously said um, that you were confident that there was no gap in terms of the difference between the ABCC and the Fair Work Ombudsman and the powers that could be exercised. You've now gone to saying, if I understand you correctly, uh, there is a difference. Um, so they won't have the same powers and they'll only have the powers of the ABCC that the government believes are not excessive. So I'm just trying to explore. We were at the stage where you were confident there were no gaps, but now you're actually saying there are gaps. Um, can I just get you to take me through, and in particular in relation to the gathering of evidence, what powers do you believe are excessive, just so I can get a better understanding of that? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. So, um, uh, as you'd be well aware, um, the government has been, the now government has been of the view for a long time that the ABC is ineffective uh, and was a waste of taxpayers' money. Um, it's been a disaster for productivity in the sector and did little to address exploitation of workers uh, through wage theft and sham contracting, which has been uh, allowed to run rife with often devastating uh, consequences. Um, the government stands for safe, fair workplaces for all Australians. Um, under our government, the Fair Work Ombudsman uh, will enforce the Fair Work Act across all industries. Uh, offensive behaviour has absolutely no role in our society. Uh, criminal conduct on work sites is wrong, and the police should and will continue to take appropriate action uh, where it concerns. Um, the ABCC, I would point out, has never had a role uh, in enforcing criminal laws. Senator Cash. Um, I Again, with all due respect, thank you for reading the talking points uh, that were provided, and I have no issues with talking points uh, being provided by the advisers to you, but that wasn't actually the question I asked. Um, there is a difference in terms of the powers that were able to be exercised under the BCII P Act and the powers that the Fair Work Ombudsman is able to uh, exercise. Um, 
and I just need to understand what are the powers that you believe are excessive. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And, and as I've said, um, uh, we believe that the provisions of the Fair Work Act are, are, are what uh, will ensure that uh, all workers are treated uh, evenly uh, and across uh, all sectors of the economy. Um, and that is what um, uh, we are supporting as part of uh, this legislation today. Um, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And again, with all due respect, and I know Senator Barbara Pocock has returned to the chamber, um, and we had agreed that we would cede time to to, to Senator Barbara Pocock. Um, and so I will come back to the question. Again, the talking points don't answer the question. The question was quite specific. Uh, you've, said, you've admitted that there are gaps, even though your evidence earlier this morning was that you were confident there were no gaps. And I'm happy to accept the change in evidence. There are now gaps. Um, I'm assuming you're of the opinion it was merely the vibe of the ABCC that was uh, excessive, um, but the issue does become there is a difference. You've stated there is a difference. I am asking you what are the powers that you thought were excessive? Um, I'm happy for you to come back to that because we had an agreement that I would cede time to Senator Barbara Pocock. Senator Pocock. Thank you. Um, I'm willing to wager that most Australians won't know what the ABCC is, um, but an issue that's had no discussion in the seven, nine hours of questioning that we've had so far uh, are two sections in the bill, the section in, in relation to sexual harassment. Now, 53 per cent of Australian women will experience sexual harassment in their lives, and it's an issue that really does deserve some um, some discussion, and uh, I would like to ask the minister uh, how this bill will deal with this epidemic of sexual harassment. Um, we've, we've got more than half of us are going to have the experience, including many in this place, in this workplace, um, and a third of Australians, men and women, in the last five years have had harassment uh, experiences. So, can we please hear a little bit about something that actually matters to most Australians, Minister? Uh, Senator uh, B. Pocock, and uh, again, I thank you um, for your interest in this area and acknowledge your uh, long-standing history uh, of working in this space as well. Uh, so I think it is an important aspect of this legislation. Stamping out uh, workplace sexual harassment is central to achieving uh, safe, productive and gender equitable workplaces, um, and that is what the government is committed to. Um, under the previous government's laws, uh, there was no express prohibition on sexual harassment under the Fair Work Act, uh, and stop sexual harassment orders were only available to some workers. Um, we will fix these issues. Firstly, uh, we will broaden the scope of stop, stop sexual harassment orders to make clear that the Fair Work Commission has the power to make orders preventing sexual harassment for all workers, uh, including sole traders, employees of state governments, local government employees, workers in community organisations and workplaces such as amateur, amateur sporting clubs. Uh, examples of stop sexual harassment orders could include an order that individuals treat each other with respect or do not make contact with each other, uh, or orders for companies to provide all staff with anti-sexual harassment training or arrange a health and safety inspector to attend meetings and parties. This is a key measure of how we make workplace or how we can make workplaces safer. Uh, secondly, we will add the new prohibition on sexual harassment and a complaints process which allow all workers uh, including those sexually harassed in the past, uh, to apply to the Fair Work Commission for a remedy. Uh, workers will have access to concili conciliation and arbitration by consent. Uh, and thirdly, our new provisions are broader in scope than the previous government's laws, uh, applying to conduct that apply, sorry, applying to conduct that occurs uh, in connection with work, uh, consistent with protections in the Sex Discrimination Act. Uh, and this means that protections will clearly apply to workplace sexual harassment that occurs outside of working hours uh, in employee-provided accommodation and to prospective workers as well. Uh, these changes send a clear message that workplace sexual harassment will not be tolerated. Our changes will open a new pathway for people to get an outcome without having to go through the court system, uh, which can be slow, costly and traumatic. Uh, that's a huge barrier for many workers and particularly those in lower paid or insecure jobs. Our changes mean that every worker, whether you're a nurse in Tamworth, a plumber in Perth or an office worker in Canberra, can ask the Fair Work Commission to deal quickly and effectively with their complaint of sexual harassment 
uh, whether the harassment occurred in the past or is ongoing, uh, or both. Uh, the new provisions also allow for the National Workplace Regu uh, Relations Regulator, the Fair Work Ombudsman, uh, to investigate the, and assist with compliance. Uh, importantly, these reforms uh, fully implement the Recommendation 28 of the Respected Work Report, uh, complementing the Attorney General's reform, uh, reforms to the Sex Discrimination Act, which passed uh, the Parliament. Uh, the bill also strengthens uh, the Fair Work Act's anti-discrimination protections to include gender identity, intersex status and breastfeeding, uh, bringing it in line with other Commonwealth anti-discrimination laws. Uh, the government is serious about ensuring Australian workplaces are free from sexual harassment in all forms of discrimination, and I think uh, if we successfully pass this bill, I think it will send an important message to the Australian people as well. Senator Cash. Um, if I could just now turn to then um, another section of the Act, and we will come back to, to the ABCC, but I do want to get some questions um, before we hit the hard marker. Um, of 2 p.m. in relation to uh, supported bargaining or the supported bargaining stream. Um, can the minister confirm which industries the government intends will be eligible to participate uh, in the supported bargaining stream? And I note from the revised explanatory memorandum at page 168, reference is made to aged care, disability care and early childhood education. Uh, is this an exhaustive list? Uh, in particular, I am being asked by industries, uh, would we be um, an industry eligible to participate in the supported bargaining stream? Um, and are there any other industries that may fall under this stream? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Sorry, uh, did you mention a particular industry, Senator Cash? Sorry. Sorry. Confirming. So we're into the supported bargaining stream now. Um, confirm which industries the government intends will be eligible to participate in the supported bargaining stream. And again, I was noting in looking at the revised explanatory memorandum at page 168 that reference is made to aged care, disability care and early childhood education. Um, is this an exhaustive list and are there other industries uh, that may fall under this stream? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. So, um, the focus of that stream uh, is uh, low-paid feminised workers um, who are also government-supported, uh, and it would be a matter for the Fair Work Commission. Senator Cash. Yeah. And that's just what I, I want to work through, and I'm just going to get page 168 um, of, of the revised explanatory memorandum. So I do. So in the expli in the revised explanatory memorandum, so you do make the specific reference to aged care, disability care, and early childhood education. But what you're saying is it's not an exhaustive list. Just because I've got a number of industries coming to me and saying, is this an exhaustive list? It's not an exhaustive list. Can you give any further guidance than what you've just given to any other industries that may fall under this stream? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Senator Cash. Um, so that is the, the focus of that stream, um, but the um, ministerial, we've included a ministerial dec declaration uh, for supported bargaining. Uh, this arose out of consultations that have occurred in relation to the bill. Um, the purpose of the new power to make a declaration is to provide a final safeguard to ensure the supported bargaining stream is used in order to get wages in low-paid sectors moving. Uh, it is intended to provide some security uh, that do we not see, so that we do not see a repeat of what occurred under the existing low-paid stream, uh, where there were only four applications and no agreement uh, that were ever made in reliance on low-paid authorisation. Senator Cash. Thank you. And I do have a series of questions in relation to um, the ministerial power, so, and, and I, will, I will take you through them. Could, could I just go back to, though, in particular, uh, it is uh, eligible to participate in the supported bargaining stream. So again, I do have the, the paragraph in the explanatory memorandum. The supported bargaining stream is intended to assist those employees and employers who may have had difficulty bargaining at the single enterprise level, for example. 
those in low-paid industries than the examples are given, such as aged care, disability care and early childhood education and care, who may lack the necessary skills, resources and powers to bargain effectively. Um, the supportive bargaining stream will also assist employees and employers who may face barriers to bargaining, such as employees with a disability and First Nations um, employers. So I do just want to confirm, and I think you've actually given me the answer, it is not an exhaustive list. There are other industries that may fall under this stream, and there are ways, and we'll go through them, that those industries could be prescribed. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Senator Cash. Yeah, that's correct. Senator Cash. Could I ask, is it the intention of the government to cover all industries where employees are paid just above the modern award minimum rates? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Senator Cash. That would be at the Commission's discretion. Senator Cash. Thank you. When an application for a supported bargaining authorisation is made, the Fair Work Commission must consider whether it's appropriate for the parties to bargain together. And in doing so, they must consider a number of factors, and the factors are set out, including the prevailing pay and conditions in the relevant industry. And that's why I asked the question in relation to is it the intention of the government to cover all industries where employees are paid just above the modern award rates? So, including the prevailing pay and conditions in the relevant industry, whether employers have clearly identifiable common interests, and we'll go through that shortly, and whether the number of bargaining representatives would be consistent with a manageable collective bargaining process. So, just in terms of the prevailing pay and conditions in the relevant industry. Can, can I just ask you to confirm what is actually meant by prevailing pay and conditions in the relevant industry? How does the government intend the Fair Work Commission itself to interpret this? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. I'd refer to um, 891 in the explanatory memorandum. Um, the supported bargaining process would operate similarly to the existing low pay bargaining process. Uh, where an application for a supported bargaining authorisation is made, the Fair Work Commission must consider whether it is appropriate for the parties to bargain together. The Fair Work Commission will consider the prevailing pay and conditions in the relevant industry, whether employers have, ident have clearly identifiable common interests, and whether the number of bargaining representatives would be consistent with a manageable collective bargaining process. The supported bargaining stream is intended to be easier to access than the low paid bargaining stream. The revised criteria for making a supported bargaining authorisation is intended to address the limited take-up of the low-paid bargaining process that exists currently. Senator Cash. Again, I think we're going to be going round in circles like we were last night. Uh, just in relation to my question on uh, is it an exhaustive list, can I just confirm again so I'm not verbaling you for the Hansard record, um, are you saying that unless the minister makes a declaration for another industry, the only industries that are eligible to access the supported bargaining stream are those listed in the explanatory memorandum? Minister. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. That would be up to the Fair Work Commission. Senator Cash. I just want to explore that. Sorry. So, so, so. I thought my question was quite obvious. I just want to confirm with you. We have the explanatory memorandum. It makes reference to certain industries that we've referred to. We've then established, and we're going to pursue it shortly, the minister is able to make a declaration for another industry to be added to or to be eligible to participate in the supported bargaining stream. All I'm asking is, is that the only avenue under which you can be declared eligible to participate via a ministerial declaration, or is there another avenue? We've talked about aged care, disability care and early childhood education and care. 
is there another avenue that you actually can participate in the supported bargaining stream? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cush. So, um, the, the Fair Work Commission could make a determination considering the, the criteria. Yeah. Okay. Senator Cash. Thank you. So there are two ways. There is a ministerial declaration here, and as I said, we're going to go through the ministerial declaration shortly. Or alternatively, I'm assuming you would make application to the Commission, are we able to participate in supported bargaining? And the Commission will then determine whether or not uh, you are an industry that is eligible to participate based on the factors it needs to consider. Minister. Uh, thanks. Uh, yes, that is the case. Senator Cash. A and just in relation to. Um, I believe the answer to my question in terms of can I get you to confirm what is meant by prevailing paying conditions in the relevant industry, given my previous question, is it the intention of the government to cover all industries where employees are paid just above the modern award minimum rates? That was left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. Um, is the government giving any guidance to the Commission, uh, given that there are now two ways in which you can enter the supported bargaining stream? and the minister is able to make a declaration, so you'd think the minister might have in his own mind uh, what the guidance is, just in terms of, again, um, prevailing pay and conditions in the relevant industry, or is it literally going to be left to um, the Fair Work Commission themselves to make the interpretation? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. So, um, 984 of the explanatory memorandum sets out um, the conditions. So, uh, when considering whether it is appropriate for the employer and employees to bargain together, the Fair Work Commission would have regard to the prevailing paying conditions in the relevant industry. Uh, this is intended to include whether the low rates of pay prevail in the industry, uh, whether employees in the industry are paid at or close to relevant award rates. Uh, whether the employers have identi clearly identifiable common interests uh, and whether the likely uh, number of bargaining representatives for an agreement would be consistent with a manageable collective bargaining process. Uh, any other matters the Fair Work Commission considers appropriate. Uh, this may include considering the views of the bargaining representatives. Senator Cash. Thank you. Okay, so it's a non-exhaustive list with the catch-all of any other matters that the Fair Work Commission itself may consider appropriate. Uh, just in terms of what is meant by whether the likely number of bargaining reps would be consistent with a manageable collective uh, bargaining process, and would it be the case that the Fair Work Commission could not approve an authorisation if it is unlikely that the number of parties involved, whether they're employer reps or union reps, etc., would be able to reach agreement or otherwise act in an orderly way? Minister. Um, my understanding is that's already in the Act. Senator Cash. Okay. Unfortunately, I am going to have to get you to take me through what you mean by that's already in the Act. Um, what is meant by whether the likely number of bargaining reps would be consistent with a manageable collective bargaining process? Can you just take me to where that explanation is in the Fair Work Act? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, Senator Cash. So, um, so I'm at uh, uh, Division Nine, Low Paid Bargaining, um, two four three number three, and B is the extent to which the likely number of bargaining representatives uh, for the agreement would be consistent with a manageable collective bargaining process. Um, so that's what I was referring to. Senator Cash. And, and thank you for that confirmation. I, I'm just asking, though, what is meant by that? What, what's the guidance given in relation to that in terms of the, the, um, the change to the supported bargaining stream? Um, given my next question is, will it be the case that some employers could be compelled to bargain uh, for a supported bargaining agreement? 
Could you just confirm that an employer could be compelled to bargain for a supportive bargaining agreement? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, that would be for the Commission to decide uh, whether it was appropriate. Senator Cash. Thank you. And so if they decide that it is appropriate, the answer is yes, they can be compelled to bargain. Minister. Thanks, Chair. Uh, that's the same way it works now. Senator Cash. Can I just ask then, just in terms of would it be the case that some employers could be compelled to bargain for a supported bargaining stream agreement and a single interest employer agreement? Minister. Um, uh, my understanding is, uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. My understanding is you can't do both at the same time. Senator Cash. You can't do both at the same time. Okay, but when one finishes, you could be compelled into the alternative if that happened to be the case. But you, I just want to confirm that because this has been raised by a, a number of people. So we are saying that we have an employer. They are eligible for both the supported bargaining uh, stream and the single interest stream. We acknowledge they can be compelled into either. You are saying, though, that absolutely you cannot be compelled to bargain at the same time in the, in the supported bargaining stream and the single interest stream. This, as I said, this has been asked by so many employers, and it will give them comfort to know uh, that that is the case. So I just want to know: Are we formally ruling it out, Minister? Um, uh, that is correct, uh, Senator Cash. Senator Cash. Um, I note that in deciding whether employers in this stream have clearly identifiable common interests, the Fair Work Commission must consider whether the employers are substantially funded directly or indirectly uh, by the Commonwealth, a state or a territory. Um, is the Chamber to take this to mean that if the Fair Work Commission is unsure whether there is a clearly identifiable common interest between the employers, um, that if the employers are not substantially funded directly or indirectly by the government, the Fair Work Commission should err on the side of not granting the authorisation? Minister. Thanks, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Senator Cash. So, for the purpose of common interests, um, for the purpose of subparagraph uh, 1b2, examples of common interests that employers may have include the following. Um, so, uh, may I think is the uh, is the point I would make there. Senator Cash. So, I just want to go through that may being the operative word. And my question was, is the Chamber to take this to mean that if the Fair Work Commission is unsure, there is a clearly identifiable common interest? So we don't know. So on that, we're unable to determine whether or not there's a clearly identifiable uh, common interest between the employers. And then the employers are not substantially funded directly or indirectly by government. Are you saying the Fair Work Commission sorry, should err on the side of not granting the authorisation? So we're not sure if there is a common interest. We do know that they are potentially not substantially funded directly or indirectly by the government. Is the guidance then that you should err on the side of not granting the author, uh, authorisation? Um, and is it the intent of government that the supported bargaining stream focus on funded sectors? Minister. I, I, uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. So um, it is um, focused on funded sectors, yeah. but not exclusive to funded sectors. Thank you. 
Senator Cash. Uh, okay, and so that's where I was getting. So there's a focus on funded sectors, but it's not solely focused on funded sectors, which does mean that you can bring in other sectors that are not funded um, or substantially funded directly or indirectly by the government. Understood there. Um, so my question is the intent of the government that supported bargaining stream focus on funded sectors. Um, the answer is it's not, that's not the primary focus, so okay, I understand that. Um, a focus on funded sectors, though, is consistent with references in the revised explanatory memorandum so, and the sorry, government's— Sorry, Senator Cash, Minister. Sorry, sorry, just to clarify, we said funded sectors are the focus. Oh, sorry, funded sectors yeah. are Senator the focus. Cash. Funded sectors are the focus. Sorry, are the focus. Thank you for that correction. But not the sole focus. But not exclusive. Thank you, thank you. So other sectors could actually be brought in. The nexus to not substantially funded directly or indirectly by government is not the ultimate determinant factor. Um, it is merely a focus of the stream. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. Correct. Senator Cash. And I do just want to then explore that. So a focus on funded sectors is consistent with references in the revised explanatory memorandum um, and the government's own public statements about this stream being targeted at care sectors. Um, is that correct? Minister. Uh, it would be correct to uh, see that as, th as the focus. Senator Cash. But not exclusive. Um, which takes me to the next line of questioning, and this is what has been raised uh, by many in industry. Um, given the answers to all of the questions, and in particular, there are changes that are happening to this particular um, stream. We can't give any further guidance other than what's already in the Act in terms of the common interests. Ultimately, decisions are being left to. Uh, the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. There is a focus on funded sectors, and we agree that's consistent with references in the revised explanatory memorandum and the government's own public statements about this stream being targeted at care sectors. We have established, though, it's a focus and it's not exclusive. So, can you confirm that the supported bargaining stream is not directed at industries such as hospitality and retail? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. I, I think I've outlined what uh, the focus um, of the government is when it comes to um, uh, this part of the bill. Senator Cash. So again, I understand what the focus is, but in outlining what the focus is, you've also put on the Hansard record. And again, um, I commenced by saying that the answers given are utilised by way of statutory interpretation. There are possibly going to be a number of issues in relation to the interpretation of the changes to the supported bargaining stream. We have confirmed that, yes, there is a focus on funded sectors, and it's consistent with references in the revised explanatory memorandum and the government's own public statements about this stream. Uh, we have also, like we did last night, confirmed that we can't give any further guidance in relation to the common interest. Um, and what is involved in the common interest. That will basically be it's either there already in the, uh, the Fair Work Act or uh, it is being left to uh, a decision of, of, of the Fair Work Commission. It's unfortunately the words not exclusive that are going to pose a huge problem. So again, can the minister confirm that the supported bargaining stream is not directed at industries such as hospitality and retail? Minister. Um, uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Cash. So, uh, we don't think it's too far different from the current um, low-paid uh, part of the um, Fair Work Act that applies in this space. Senator Cash. It, it, with all due respect, that is not an answer to the question. There are changes being made. It's not just a name change. Uh, can you now take me through, given you don't think it's uh, any different or very different, can you now take me through the changes that are being made in this legislation to the supported bargaining stream. 
Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And um, the real focus of the changes are removing the red tape so that it can actually be used successfully. Um, that was um, the failure of the previous government, is that you had um, that part of the legislation in place, but no one was able to use it successfully. So um, the focus from our point of view is removing that red tape um, to allow it to be used. Uh, and it's got a particular focus from our point of view on those uh, feminised industries that a lot of us have talked about um, substantially last night today and is a real focus of the bill. Uh, and we think that is required and what will hopefully drive an improvement in wages. Senator Cash. Um, so again, when you say you've got to focus on removing the red tape, I, I need you to take me through what, what is the red tape you're referring to? Minister. Thanks, Chair. And uh, I think the key point of that would be um, removing the red tape that uh, allows the Commission um, to be more flexible um, and, and provide more discretion to the Fair Work Commission uh, to determine what is appropriate. Senator Cash. Thank you. And then, in terms of, can the minister confirm that the supported bargaining stream is not directed at industries such as hospitality and retail? Um, you can't give that guidance because what we are actually saying is it may well be if certain factors are met, the Fair Work Commission could make a determination uh, that the hospitality and retail industries um, are actually eligible to participate in the supported bargaining stream. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And, and that's currently the case under um, your existing legislation now that no one has been able to access. Um, and it will be the case on this, but uh, we've made clear our focus is on those uh, care and community uh, industries. Uh, that's what we think the ones who will be uh, able to use this, and that's who we think it will be of most benefit to. Senator Cash. And I, and I appreciate it's answering the questions. Um, could I now um, refer to Governor Amendment 40, um, which was moved last night? This amendment gives the minister power by legislative amendment to declare an Sorry, industry. Sorry, ministers on his feet, Senator Cash. Can I have a good change, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> Proceed, Senator Cash. I might ask oh, you to get started. Senator no, Ayres. Senator Cash. Um, we're in the supported bargaining stream. We've just gone through a number of questions in relation to um, how you could actually potentially um, be deemed eligible to participate in the supported bargaining stream. Uh, one of the changes I understand, or one of the amendments uh, that was tabled last night, was Government Amendment Number 40, uh, moved last night. The amendment gives the minister power, by legislative amendment, to declare an industry, occupation, or sector to be eligible for the supported bargaining stream, if the minister is satisfied that doing so is consistent with the objects of the division set out in section 241. Could I just get you to confirm what are the objects in section 241 of the Act? Minister. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the objects of the supported bargaining stream <clears throat> include assisting and encouraging employees and their employers who require support to bargain. Uh, to make enterprise agreements that meet their needs uh, and address constraints on their ability to bargain. Senator Cash. Okay, so that is section 241 of the Act. Can I just confirm that's what you're reading out? The objects as set out uh, of the division as set out in section 241. Minister. We've asked a very straightforward question for my uh, second question, but it, it, perhaps it's best to explain it this way. That where, where, where the objects say currently low paid, they will now say supported, and provision B is deleted. Senator Cash. So 
Would you then agree that a key theme from the objects relates to supporting low-paid employees who otherwise lack the experience, skills and resources to bargain at the enterprise level with their employer? Minister. Yes. Senator Cash. So in deciding whether to declare an industry occupational sector eligible for the supported bargaining stream or for supported bargaining, would the minister be required to consider whether the employees in question have previously had success in enterprise bargaining? So if there is already an enterprise agreement in place for the relevant employees or for employees within the same industry occupational sector, would this mean that then the minister is less likely to make the, direct, uh, the, the declaration? Minister. The minister would have to have regard to the objects of the Act uh, and the objects of that section. Senator Cash. Um, can I also then just confirm, uh, will the industrial instrument referred to uh, in Amendment 40, uh, will that be a disallowable instrument? Minister. Yes. Senator Cash. It's very straightforward with you and I. I'm starting to enjoy this. Could I now go back to Minister yes. Senator Cash? <laughs> um, I have a number of questions in relation to uh, enterprise. Uh, we were talking about um, the ABCC, and I'm just looking at the time in terms of actually moving through them, because I do also have a number of questions in relation to the RIS and the costs in the regulatory impact statement that I would like to ask you. Can I just go very briefly, though, to the agreement um, approval before I go to the, co uh, the cost in the regulatory impact statement? Um, on page 125 of the revised explanatory memorandum, it states that changes in the bill to enterprise agreement approval requirements are intended to simplify requirements that need to be met for an enterprise agreement to be approved by the Fair Work Commission, um, which are often regarded as overly prescriptive and complex. Uh, one such source of complexity relates to section 181 um, and the way it's traditionally being interpreted by the Fair Work Commission in relation to which uh, casuals can vote for an agreement. Um, I understand that the government has indicated to employer groups that the changes contained in the bill will mean that the Fair Work Commission will take a less prescriptive approach. Um, could I just get you to confirm just employer groups are asking that is the indication and that there will be a less prescriptive approach? Minister. Thank you. Yes, the approval process is designed to be simpler and less prescriptive. Senator Cash. Sorry, and, and, sorry. and in terms of then, though, the indication to employer groups that the changes contained in the bill will mean that the Fair Work Commission will take that less prescriptive approach, and in particular, the issue that was is in relation to which casuals can vote for an agreement. The indication to the employers is correct. Yes. Minister. S Senator Cash. Um, can I then also confirm that the changes will mean that the Fair Work Commission won't fail to approve an agreement because of confusion regarding whether a casual employee is entitled to vote on the agreement or not? Minister. The, the, the intention is to streamline the process. Uh, however, of course, each determination that the Commission makes is a matter for the Commission. Senator Cash. Okay. So, okay, a matter for that. So we're back to the discretion of the Commission. Okay, that's fine. Uh, despite the intention of, of the government, um, can the Minister confirm that if the Fair Work Commission continues to take a prescriptive approach, and again, we are talking about the issue of in relation to which casuals can vote for an agreement, and I do appreciate the evidence and the very clear evidence. I do, I do thank you for that. That the government has indicated to employers 
uh, employer groups that the changes contained in the bill will mean that the Fair Work Commission will take a less prescriptive approach. Um, I also understand your evidence in relation to can the minister confirm that the changes will mean that the Fair Work Commission won't fail to approve an agreement because of confusion regarding whether a casual employee is entitled to vote on the agreement or not. That is left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. Can I then, in relation to the agreement approval and the issue of the casuals and the confusion, um, can the minister confirm that if the Fair Work Commission continues to take a prescriptive approach to the issue of casual voting cohorts, despite confirming the government did indicate to employers that the changes in the bill will mean that the Fair Work Commission will take a less prescriptive approach, noting that obviously it is ultimately a matter uh, for the Fair Work Commission, um, that the government would then commit to amending the legislation to avoid agreements being rejected by the Fair Work Commission? Minister. Where, where the, the government is confident that the, uh, the changes that are proposed here will deliver the, a less prescriptive approach, um, including in relation to the matters that we have just been traversing. Uh, but there is, of course, uh, a review uh, 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 programmed in at the two-year level. Senator Cash. Okay, so just, just in terms of that, um, as part of the review, if the Fair Work Commission was to continue to taking a prescriptive approach to the issue of casual, co co casual voting cohorts, given what the, uh, the government has confirmed it indicated to employer groups that the changes contained in the bill would mean that the Fair Work Commission will take a less prescriptive approach, um, the government would then commit to amending the legislation to avoid agreements being rejected by the Fair Work Commission. Minister. Well, it, 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 along with other matters, will be a subject for the review and the government will consider uh, the outcome of the review when it, uh, when it arrives. Senator Cash. Um, last night, in fact, what I might turn to now just again um, is some questions that I put in relation to, in particular, the mining and resources industry in Australia. And uh, I think you'd be aware of the front page, obviously, uh, of The Australian today, and in particular the comments made by, by Mike Henry um, by BHP. Um, they've had the opportunity, and it's not BHP, but certain employers in, in the mining and um, resource of industry have had the opportunity to consider uh, the evidence and the answers that were given to the questions that I asked uh, last night. And I've got some questions in relation to, I understand, Government Amendment 44 uh, that was moved last night. And it's just in relation to more detail and definition. And we hadn't actually got to fully explore this last night, given we, we hit a hard marker. We went through the common interest test last night, and that was fine, left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission in relation to each limb. We didn't actually get on to, though, looking at what reasonably comparable means. So the government has last night at 6.26 p.m., I think, tabled their amendments uh, to the bill. The question is currently before the chair. Uh, in relation to government amendment 44, which was moved last night, that was introducing um, the comparability test. And I'll just get someone to pass me that uh, comparability test. So, for example, where two separate businesses in the mining industry operate different rostering schedules to create their own efficiencies, which are fundamental to their operating models, is this enough for them to be considered not reasonably comparable? Minister. Uh, I, I can confirm that this um, amendment uh, was developed following representations from uh, industry, uh, and it does go to 
um, the questions that you have raised, but ultimately, ultimately that determination will be a matter for the Commission. Senator Cash. Okay, so in terms of item amendment 44, schedule one item 629, page 216, after line 25, at the end of paragraph 21, uh, 216DC1B add V, if the requirements of subsection 3 are met, okay, tick, the operations and business activities of the employer are reasonably comparable with those of the other employers who are covered by the agreement. So that's the reasonable comparability test um, that you say has now been inserted into or will be inserted into the Act as a result of the representations from the mining industry. The question I put to you was where two separate businesses in the mining industry operate different rostering schedules to create their own efficiencies, which are fundamental to their operating models. Um, and you can see where this is going because this is, this is very, very, very serious <laughs> in terms of reasonably comparable. Um, is this enough for them to be not considered reasonably comparable? Um, the answer you gave that this amendment had been made as a result of representations from the mining and resources industry, but then you also said it is actually a matter for the Fair Work Commission. Given that this amendment has been put in as a result of uh, the conversations that you had for the mining and resources industry, um, they are the ones saying they are more confused than ever now as a result of this, and they desperately need the guidance. So, in relation to the conversations and the representations, um, again, I ask you what further guidance can we give in terms of reasonably comparable or not reasonably comparable. I was a part of the talks. The minister's office, the department were part of the talks. Um, we've got an amendment that's been inserted, but there's nothing around the amendment. Or could you take me to the explanatory memorandum and take me through the guidance in relation to reasonably comparable? Minister. Oh. Minister. <clears throat> um, I, I might uh, answer two ways, uh, possibly, uh, Senator. The first, the first is, of course, that the, the Commission is required to consider all of the matters that it's required to consider, including a public interest uh, requirement. Um, but the new the, the amendment would add a new subparagraph to paragraph 249.1b, which contains the factors of which the Fair Work Commission uh, has to satisfy itself before making a single interest employer authorisation in relation to a proposed agreement. So the new subparagraph sub would require the Commission to be satisfied that in respect of each employer, that it is a common interest employer, the operations and business activities of that employer are reasonably comparable with those of other employers that would be covered by the proposed agreement that relates to the single interest employer authorisation. So employers of different size and scale might, depending on all the circumstances, be found to have clearly identifiable common interests for the purpose of bargaining together. So the amendment would ensure that the Fair Work Commission must also be satisfied that the operations and business activities of an employer are reasonably comparable with the other employers. It may be open to the Commission to conclude that despite to employers of a similar size, scope and scale operating in the same industry, that they are, that they are not reasonably comparable. Um, that, that is open to the Commission once the full extent of their business activities and operations are considered. Senator Cash. And I think we've just done a full circle and come back to um, the amendment, as you, you've rightly stated, it sets out 
If the common interest test is satisfied, so we agree the common interest test has been satisfied. We don't know what that common interest test is. We've got some basic guidance. But let's just say you are right. The Fair Work Commission has made a determination that the common interest test is satisfied. You are now inserting the additional amendment which says if the requirements of subsection 3 are met, tick, they've been met. Um, the operations and business activities for the employer are reasonably comparable. Agree. I, I have no issues with you there. But we seem to be a hamster on a wheel again because the issue that we have is, yes, what is the meaning of reasonably comparable? So I'll, I'll, I'll give you another situation where specialist contractors are employed under a maintenance contract. These contractors have the same trades as employees in the host company but are specialised to fulfil specific roles, i.e., for example, not labour hire. Could those specialist contractors be deemed reasonably comparable to employees in the host company under the legislation? The, the issue I have with the answer you gave is I agree with you. It's all set out in the Act. But for what I'm asking for, where is the additional guidance in relation to reasonably comparable? Because when you are talking about, say, for example, two mining companies, they compete at this level. They're already paying way above, but we understand there is no carve out. The rostering system is different, but it's agreed and it suits those sites. Is that enough to actually have it? They are reasonably comparable, or is the difference meaning they're not reasonably comparable? Because ultimately, the words are there, but there doesn't appear to be any meaning behind the word or guidance given in relation to the words. Minister. Well, <laughs> Senator, the Fair Work Commission will assess those matters and the other matters that it's required to assess. Now, on this side, we place great confidence in the independence and the capacity of the Fair Work Commission. In over the last few decades, I think. The historical record demonstrates that we treat that independence seriously. Uh, you'll find that um, when, uh, when Labor was in government the last two times, we took industry and the industrial relations community seriously. We took expertise and independence seriously. And you'll find that people with great capacity uh, from the trade union movement, from employer associations, uh, from the community sector and the legal fraternity were appointed by previous Labor governments with an ethos of independence uh, and a commitment to the public interest. Now that wasn't demonstrated uh, by the last government. I think 11 out of 44. You know, overwhelmingly, uh, 11 out of 44 appointments uh, not from uh, friends of the previous government and from employer associations. The last government treated the Fair Work Commission the same way it treated the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Uh, and that has uh, undermined uh, industry's confidence in the independence of that institution. But on this side, uh, we, uh, we put uh, some faith in the capacity of the uh, Commission and its full bench to uh, work through these issues in a sensible, pragmatic uh, uh, kind of way. Senator Cash. Um, I don't know if you were here, obviously, last night or earlier today when I said the questions I ask are very specific, they're very genuine, um, and they're in relation to ensuring that for the benefit of statutory interpretation going forward, given the records of Senate proceedings, including where we are now, uh, in the committee stage can be utilised uh, by others when they are actually interpreting what the government's uh, amendment means. So, with all due respect, you, I think you actually do political diatribe better than Senator Watt. I really do. I prefer your approach to it, but it actually doesn't assist statutory interpretation. It'll actually just be no, 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 no. So now we go back to 
the actual answer to the question uh, to assist those going forward in terms of statutory interpretation. Um, I just need to take you through. This is a substantial amendment. You've had to bring forward this amendment because of representations made to you by particular industries. Um, the issue I'm having is the chamber doesn't have the benefit of a definition uh, in relation to what reasonably comparable actually means. So with all due respect, I'm not asking you about appointments to the Fair Work Commission. Um, I'm not going to question whether or not someone has expertise. I'm actually asking you what is the guidance the government is giving to the Fair Work Commission in relation to the operations and business activities of the employer are reasonably comparable? Minister. I um, <clears throat> uh, uh, appreciate the spirit in which the questions are asked in the cash and um, uh, occasionally uh, uh, you'll find that when, uh, when questions do go it's to some of the aspects of the previous government's record in relation to the independence of the Fair Work Commission, I'll find it hard to resist pointing out uh, the track record of, of uh, politicisation of that institution. H however, um, the, to, to your question, the amendment uh, would also insert a new subsection, I think it's 249.1AA, uh, that would provide that if an application for a single interest employer authorisation is made by a bargaining representative under section under paragraph 248.1B in respect of an employer, uh, an employer that has uh, 50 or more employees, it is presumed that the operations and business activities of the employer are reasonably comparable with those of the other employers that are covered by the agreement unless the contrary is established. So the matters that were that are specified in subparagraph 24991B Roman numeral 6 concern whether relevant employers are reasonably comparable in terms of their operations and business activities. Such evidence is likely to concern the nature and size of the employers and their operations and their business activities. While some of this information may be available at least in part to employees, particularly in smaller enterprises, much of it will only be known to the employer or, or to employees only as it pertains to their role. That, that, that is, it, it, it may only be apparent to them in a partial or fragmentary way. This is um, particularly acute in terms of the nature of the employer's enterprise, the employer's business activities and operations. In most cases, cases, such information will be most readily available to employers or their bargaining representatives. So these are considerations which must be balanced. Um, who should bear the burden of establishing that the relevant test is met or not met? Having regard to the burden that could be imposed on enterprises with 20 to 49 employees, it is appropriate in such cases to require employees and their bargaining representatives to establish that the relevant test is met when making the application for the authorisation. In respect of employers with 50 or more employees, Due to their increased size and the complexity of their operations, they are more likely to be in a position to provide the relevant evidence going to these matters. In such circumstances, it would also be much more difficult for employees and their representatives to provide sufficient evidence to establish that the test is met. It is appropriate, therefore, in the government's view, that the amendments provide for a rebuttable presumption and an opportunity for employers, that is, employers with 50 or more employees, to establish that the relevant test is not met in relation to their business. And for the kids upstairs listening to this, there'll be a test at the end of the session. <laughs> Senator Cash. Just in terms of, can I just, has the government tabled the final explanatory memorandum in relation to this bill? I just want to make sure we're working off the same documents. Minister. Yes, the supplementary has been tabled. Senator Cash. 
So, and I just want to go through what you've, you've, you've just put to the chamber. And so, in, in terms of the amendment that we're referring to, confirming, it, so it does also state that if the employer that will be covered by the agreement employed 50 or more employees, or so 50 employees or more at the time that the application was made, it is presumed that the operations and business activities of the employer are reasonably comparable with those of other employers that are covered by the agreement unless the contrary is proved. I believe that's what you were reading out. Um, uh, yes, yeah. Minister. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, and that's what, so to confirm, does this mean for that employers with less than 50 employees that it will be for the employee representatives to prove that the employers have reasonably comparable operations? Minister. Yes, again, it's a different onus. Senator Cash. So the, the, the question I just want to pursue then is, does this reverse onus for employers with less than 50 employees apply for other statutory tests? Does it apply for the common interest test? Does it apply to the public uh, interest test? Minister. Just, just, yeah, that's, I, think, I think that's right because the answer uh, is that the tests that we have just been traversing apply to that stream. Uh, but but there, there, there may be, and we will be in a position. I think perhaps later this afternoon to come back to this question. Um, uh, Minister, as it is uh, very close to 2 p.m., the committee will report to the Senate. The committee reports progress. Thank you, Senators. We'll move to question time. And the first question is, oh, sorry, Senator Wong. Yeah. Uh, I seek leave to make a statement concerning ministerial arrangements. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Yeah. Yeah. I advise changes to ministerial arrangements. Senator Watt will be absent from question time today for personal reasons. In Senator Watt's absence, ministers will represent portfolios in accordance with the letter circulated to the president and party leaders and independent senators. I'm happy to run through the list if any senator wishes. Thank you. Um, senator Birmingham. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't know if you were responding. No, no, not not to okay, so we'll now move to question time and the first question is to Senator Birmingham. Thank you, uh, thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I refer to the release of ministerial diaries by the Attorney General and the Treasurer detailing their first 100 days in office. The Attorney General, Mr Dreyfus, has said, and I quote, I'm going to continue to work with colleagues and across the public service on making sure that there is as much transparency as possible about our government information and ministerial diaries. Minister, given the commitment of the Attorney-General to create as much transparency as possible about ministerial diaries, why is the Prime Minister refusing to release his diary, putting him at odds with his own Attorney-General and Treasurer? Thank you, uh, Senator Birmingham. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, there is obviously a FOI. I assume these are FOI claims not, uh, or requests, um, not um, one of the many orders for production that uh, seems to be occurring on, uh, at the moment. Uh, obviously, uh, every uh, freedom of information request is distinct, has to be considered on its merits, and every minister will have to respond to requests in a manner that is appropriate to appropriate to those individual circumstances. So uh, I'm not the FOI decision maker, uh, but uh, I know that uh, FOI decision makers obviously will have to make a judgment on the basis of the merits of the application before them. 
Has Senator Birmingham first supplementary. Thanks, sir. Thanks, President. Minister, does the government have a policy, a government policy, regarding the release of ministerial diaries? If so, what is it? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister Wong. Well, the, the government observes the provisions of the uh, Freedom of Information legislation and applications are processed in accordance with that legislation. Uh, that's, that's the, the that's right. well, that's the appropriate well. That is the appropriate way in which uh, uh, these these matters should be dealt with. Uh, second, uh, second supplementary. Thanks, Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, is the minister representing the Prime Minister aware that FOI applications for ministerial diaries remain outstanding for some other ministers, including herself? Will the Minister for Foreign Affairs be releasing her diary and adopting the Attorney General's approach to transparency, or will she be joining the Prime Minister in thumbing her nose at the Attorney General? Uh, Minister Wong. Thank you. Uh, well, and uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, here we go again. Senator Birmingham's newfound interest in transparency. I bet you didn't release yours, did you, mate? Uh, you didn't release yours, and not, nor did anybody release. Nor did anyone release the ministerial list that showed the secret ministries that the Morrison government was engaged in. Nor did anyone release uh, the details of Senator McKenzie using spreadsheets. Uh, to allocate government monies, nor did anyone release how it is that you, you funded car parks, car parks uh, which people didn't want. So you know, the Australian people, uh, I think, will look at you and your questions as a former member of the leadership group who helped cover up all of this, uh, cover up all of this, and they will look with a, with 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 a very clear eye at the at the hypocrisy on the other side of the table. Thank you, uh, Senator Birmingham. Point of order. But on, on the question of direct relevance, uh, President, on the question of direct relevance, the minister has spent 51 seconds talking about the former government to a question about whether or not she would comply with an FOI request for her own diary and just meet the same standards as the Attorney General or uh, thumb her nose like the, like the PM you, has. You've made the point of order. I'll uh, direct uh, the minister to order. Order. Senator McGrath and Senator Birmingham, I, Senator Birmingham, I'm responding to the point of order. Minister, I'll direct you to that part of the question. Thank you. Decisions will be made in accordance with the Freedom of Information legislation. Yes, Thank you. Sir. Order. Uh, Senator McKenzie, when you've quite finished, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber and gallery of a parliamentary delegation from Vietnam, and I know they've met um, many senators and MPs across the parliament. Um, the delegation is led by His Excellency Mr Vuong Dinh Hue, President of the National Assembly. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and in particular to the Senate. <laughs> Senator Payman. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. How is the Albanese government delivering on its plans for a better future for all Australians? Minister. Uh, thank you, and I thank uh, Senator Payman for her question. And I say this after a decade of wage suppression, of spiralling childcare and healthcare costs, of ideological wars, which are still occurring, and an out of touch former government that thrived on secrecy and cover ups, Australia did need action, and this government is delivering. We're working to get made wages moving and putting downward pressure on costs. And from our first day in office, our support ensured an increase to the minimum wage and a pay rise for aged care workers. Albanese Labor are investing in cheaper childcare, in cheaper medicines, paid parental leaves and secure jobs with better pay. I take the interjections because when you talk about secure jobs with better pay, there's nothing that gets the Liberals moving more than that, is they there? Hate they hate it. They hate it. And we're acting to make workplaces safer from sexual harassment with the passage of the Respect at Work Bill based on recommendations which were left unfinished, and we're ensuring Australia has the skills of tomorrow. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, creating 180,000 new fee-free TAFE places. We've expanded the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card. We've ended the cashless debit card. We've established a Royal Commission into robo-debt. 
We have delivered the Regional First Home Buyers Guarantee. We've passed an historic climate change bill and updated our climate targets. You should listen. You might learn something, Senator Rustin. We've invested in renewable energy and rewiring the nation. We are establishing a disaster ready fund, a vital tool as we battle floods across, the, across Australia. Uh, we have entered the cover-up culture, and now uh, uh, the majority of whom refused. The, the majority of those who Order. refused Order. to, to censure their former leader. Order. Where were all of you lining up to defend him? <clears throat> and of course, the Nanti National uh, Anti-Corruption Commission. The, correct, the na National Anti-Corruption Commission that you spend years Senator trying Wong. to avoid. Years trying to avoid. Senator now Wong, passed your under seat. an Albanese Labor government. Before I call um, Senator Payman for her first supplementary, I am going to remind senators, particularly on my left, that you are being incredibly disorderly. You are shouting so loud that I cannot get the attention of Senator Wong. It is unacceptable, it is disrespectful and it's disorderly. Senator Payman. Thank you, President. Um, Minister, how is the Albanese government delivering on its plans to help Australians with the cost of living? Minister. Uh, Senator, McGrath, Senator McGrath, as one of the key offenders, I have not even called the minister and you've started interjecting again. Minister Wong. Thank you. The Albanese Labor government is addressing the cost of living crisis created under the Liberal and National government with our cost of living plan, Ke cheaper childcare, cheaper medicine, expanding pay parental leave to six months, more affordable housing and getting wages moving. You ha you know, these are all things you could have done, but nine years you didn't do them. We have already secured an increase in the minimum wage and an important pay rise for aged care workers, and our secure jobs, better pay policy will boost wages even further. We on this side understand the impact higher energy prices are having on households and businesses. But you know, we're actually going, we're actually trying to work on how we we support households to do that, how we have a response. You know what your response was? Let's hide it. Let's hide it. Let's hide it before the next election. Order. Let's make sure no Australian Order. knows about the hike, the hike in fees uh, while we're in government. Let's hide Senator it till after Kenderson. the election. What a disgrace. Uh, Senator Payman, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, Minister, how is the Albanese government delivering on its plans to make us more influential and stronger in the world? Uh, Minister Wong. Uh, thank you to the senator. And I, I know this is an area uh, that in which she has such a great interest and, per, and personal knowledge. And you know what we saw over the last nine years is slashing of Australia's development assistance. Uh, we saw uh, Mr. Dutton, you know, returning to the sort of rhetoric uh, around development assistance in the House at this 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 sitting period, and really that was a disgrace uh, because. This reduced our influence and it left a vacuum for others to fill. And we have a lot of catching up to do. So that is why we are committed to renewing our closest relationships and advancing our interests and values. That's why we're boosting Pacific security and defence, supporting critical infrastructure, expanding Pacific labour mobility, and why we have increased Australia's official development assistance to the Pacific and Southeast Asia, because it is in our national in interests. We are rebuilding relationships to ensure Australia is the partner of choice in the region for our security and for the security of our region. Thank you, Minister. Senator Cadell. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I refer you to the, uh, yesterday the answers you gave regarding the secret, secret government modelling in a document titled Estimated Impacts of CFPS and Associated Coal Mine Closures, dated October 2020, which details almost 800 job losses in the Hunter Valley alone associated with government policies and the closure of mines. In April this year, the now Prime Minister, when visiting the Hunter Valley mining communities, was quoted by the Newcastle Herald under the heading, Anthony Albanese guarantees no jobs will be lost on the road to net zero. Can the minister advise if the Prime Minister stands by his guarantees? Good Thank you, Senator Cadell. Minister. 
I thank the senator for his question, and, and uh, I, I did have the opportunity to follow up some of what he asked yesterday uh, overnight. And, and I'm advised that the closures he, in fact, talked about were announced under your government. Oh. Yeah. They were announced under your government. So I do find it, I do find it somewhat passing strange. Uh, that you try and make political mileage, as you are doing and you did yesterday, about a closure that was actually flagged under you. Uh, now, that's probably a fact I should have been aware of, and I'm grateful to my colleagues and to the departments for letting me know that. But uh, these are closures that were flagged under the uh, former Senator coalition McGrath. government. Um, obviously, uh, we are working with the New South Wales government. Which I note has also has a 50% well has a 50% emissions reduction target by 2030. So I look forward to your criticism of them, if that is in fact the way you want to approach this, uh, to ensure the Hunter and other regions benefit from new jobs and opportunities in clean energy. And one of the differences between those on that side uh, and those on this side of the chamber is that we want to look after workers. Yeah. We want to look after workers. You know, you know, we're a movement and a party that has. Workers Senator at, at McKenzie, our core. Senator Davey. Uh, and uh, yeah, I know it's hard Senator for those McKenzie. who spend so much, so much of their time arguing against pay increases and telling us the sky is going to fall in if there's a dollar pay increase, and saying we can't afford to give aged care workers or those on the minimum wage an increase. Uh, but those on this side understand there is a transition that is that that is occurring that is occurring and will occur as a consequence of what is happening in global markets, as well as what is being committed to, uh, I think, McKenzie by both sides of Senator government. Davey. So the difference between you and us is that we will ensure that there Thank is you, a Minister, transition that is expired. about employment. Uh, Senator Cadell, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you for that. In the same Newcastle Herald article, when referencing the Prime Minister's guarantee, the Prime Minister is quoted saying this wasn't about policies, but I quote, not only can we guarantee it, our modelling guarantees it. Does the Prime Minister stand by Labor Party's pre-election modelling, or does he accept the official government modelling that says Labor's policies in the Hunter will cause 800 job losses? Good question. Thank you, Senator Cadell. Minister. Well, I, 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 I again remind, um, I again remind those opposite uh, that the closures that uh, were, are referenced were announced under you. So I find it a little, uh, I find it a little interesting uh, that, and I think many will, that uh, those opposites who have all, you, you really McGrath. want to have your cake and eat it too, don't Senator you? Senator Birmingham, Senator McKenzie. There's a running commentary from the left-hand side of the chamber every time the minister speaks. Now, not only is that disorderly, it's also incredibly loud. And I would ask you to listen in respectful silence, Minister. <laughs> respectful, disrespectful silence, just a bit of less noise might be helpful. But anyway, um, uh, look, uh, th th there is a transition uh, that is occurring uh, in our economy and globally. And oh, would you like to speak, Senator McGrath? Senator McGrath? Well, I, I don't, I don't, you've got Canavan. plenty of opportunities to speak if Senator, Senator Cash ever sat, sat down, I suppose. Senator Cash might, might actually give you an opportunity to speak. Uh, <laughs> leave is granted. You use up. Order. Canavan. Senator Canavan, resume your seat. Senator Canavan, resume your seat. Order. Order. 
Order on my left and my right. Order. I have a senator on her feet. Senator Rice. President, we denied leave for Senator Canavan to rant on about coal mining jobs and destroying the planet uh, in Senator the meantime. Rice, Senator Rice, it's not order. Order, Senator Ayres and Senator McGrath. I'm sorry, uh, Senator Rice, there's so much noise in this chamber. I only heard the voices to give Senator Canavan leave. Uh, I did not hear um, anyone say he was denied leave. Um, Senator Cadell, I believe we're up to the second supplementary question. Thank, Thank you, you, President. Uh, the model that the Prime Minister relied on to make those false promises of job guarantees to the people of Hunter, is that the same modelling the Prime Minister and the government used to prom promise 97 times before the election that Australians will see a $270 reduction in their power bills? If that is the modelling, how can anyone trust what the government and the Prime Minister says? Thank you, Senator Cadell. Minister, I didn't actually call you before you started. Um, Minister Wong, thank you. Apologies, uh, President. Um, uh, well, I'd make this point uh, if you want to talk about um, you know, truthfulness. Uh, those on your side are signed up to the same target we are for 2015. Senator Rustin. No, this, is a, this is a policy and a political point. You are also signed up to net zero by 2050, remember? And I know you want to talk about that a lot in Kooyong and North Sydney. Didn't help. Well, this is, goes to policy. This goes to policy. Meanwhile, Mr. Canavan, Senator Canavan, gets up and gives that rant, which shows that it was all fake. It was all fake. You thought you thought you could say one thing in one place and one thing in another. Well, we are really clear. There is a transition that is occurring, a change in the global economy. Order. We either get ahead Order. of it and we help workers and communities thrive in that, or you keep going to them and lying to them, misleading them about what is happening, because you are signed up to the same policy. You just Thank don't have you, anything Senator to back Wong. Your time has expired. Senator Faruqi. For climate change. In 1991, Vanuatu, on behalf of small island states, first asked the question, who should pay for climate catastrophe? Over the next three decades, wealthy nations of the global north dodged and deflected that question while continuing to fuel the climate crisis. They relentlessly pursued profit and power, putting the world on track for climate catastrophe and fueling climate disasters. These disasters have affected 33 million people in Pakistan and 50 million people in the Horn of Africa face the threat of famine, amongst many others. After decades of pushing by the Global South, a loss and damage fund has finally been agreed to. New Zealand, Denmark, Germany and Scotland have already committed to contributing. Will the government today commit to paying our fair share of loss and damage? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you. We, we, are, we are committed to uh, an effective global response on climate, and uh, as Mr. Bowen made clear, we, we welcome the historical progress made in. Oh, I'm just. I just. Uh, if you want to waste your question time, I'm happy for you to do so. <laughs> Senator Wong, um, please continue. Um, we welcome the. I'll start again. We welcome the historical progress made, it made in agreeing to a new loss and damage fund, and uh, the parties have committed to exploring. Senator Rustin, oh, this is a question from Senator Faruqi. I think the least you could do is listen in silence so that the answer can be heard at that end of the chamber. Minister, what? Senator McGrath, interjections from you are particularly disorderly. Senator Wong, please continue. Uh, we are pleased that the parties have committed to exploring a broad range of ways to provide support to vulnerable countries, including those in the Pacific. We have heard our Pacific family uh, when they have said the region's loss and damage needs are distinct from the adaptation and resilience. 
Uh, and as you know, we are actively working with Pacific partners to consider new climate finance options, including on loss and damage, and to ensure global funding mechanisms work for the Pacific. So uh, there is a, a, a quite a, there's a, an engagement, a willingness to discuss. Uh, and I would I would make I would I would make this point um, uh, because I know the Greens come in here and they want us to do this, but they also want to reduce revenue uh, uh, from from other sources, uh, such as such as well, you know what what do you think happens if we end ex what do you think happens if we end coal, our coal exports? Exactly. What do you think happens if we? I mean, this is, but but what I would I would make this point that the the. Order, order, order. Senator Thorpe, I've called the chamber to order. Minister, please continue. Uh, I, I, I simply uh, uh, make this point. Uh, it would be much better uh, for the country if there was bipartisanship on development assistance. Uh, I regret that that was lost under the, those opposite and appears to be continue to be lost. Thank you, but Minister, I would invite them to expired. reconsider that. Senator Faruqi, first supplementary. Uh, Minister, as you well know, the climate crisis is an existential threat to the Pacific, where communities are facing rising sea levels and extreme storms. The government claims to be listening to the Pacific Islands. Well, the Pacific Islands have waited decades for loss and damage funding that is owed to those nations as a matter of global justice. What will your government do to ensure that a fund is established urgently with no room for backsliding? Thank you, Senator Faruqi, Minister. Well, you know, you know, I, I, I'm interested in the motivation, the implication about our motivation in that, uh, because we are motivated genuinely. Well, we are motivated. We had a long Senator discussion Faruqi. yesterday about motivations. Senator McKinn demanded something be withdrawn. I notice you did put it on social media afterwards, yeah. anyway, but that's okay. Uh, but I would say to Senator, Senator Faruqi, the implication that we're not genuine in our engagement with our Pacific neighbours is wrong. We are. Now, that, that does not mean there is not a lot that we have to work through, and I have been up front with them. I have said we are a, a highly emissions-intensive economy. We are, we are seeking to shift the trajectory, uh, the direction in which we are heading, and we are, we are doing so belatedly. It will cost us more and it will be harder because of nine years of inaction, exactly. but we are serious about doing it. Uh, so, please, if there, if there was an implication, and perhaps I misheard, that somehow we are not genuine in how we engage with the Pacific, and we, because we understand the nature of the threat, Thank you, uh, Minister. It is Your incorrect. time has expired. Senator Faruqi, second supplementary. The climate change minister tabled his climate change statement earlier today, but failed to even mention the elephant in the room, the impact of new coal and gas on Australia's climate targets. And yet the latest greenhouse inventory also released today shows emissions from gas are increasing. Does the government acknowledge that burning coal and gas is causing and fueling the climate crisis? And why won't it rule out opening new coal and gas projects? Uh, thank you, Minister. Well, uh, I, I've, been answer I've answered this question many times. Excuse me. Uh, I understand this is the, the political campaign that the Greens Party wishes to run between now and the next election. If I may say, that's a decision for you. But actually, the policy challenges are far greater. Are far greater. So you can have a mantra around that. But actually, what we need to do is transition an economy, uh, which is not only emissions intensive domestically, uh, but is reliant on emissions, high emissions intensity, intensity industries for much of our export revenue. Now we have to transition the economy, change the economy, so our, our, our people, our children, our country can thrive in a net zero world. That is an enormous undertaking. That is. Senator Thorpe. You see, I'll, I'll take that interjection. I'll take that interjection because, as I said to Senator Milne years ago, you know, it's possible that people might just disagree. It's not because Thank because you, we Senator corrupt. Wong, your we time just has expired. Senator Wong, your time has expired. Senator Sewell. Democracy. You're only one voice. Order. All voices. Order. One voice. Senator O'Neill. Oh, I'm sick of it. Senator Sewell. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. As we come to the end of 2022, the tourism sector is hoping for a Christmas that sees Australians able to travel in a way they haven't been able to in recent years. 
Can the minister outline the steps the Albanese Labor government has taken since being elected to support small and medium-sized tourism businesses recover from the impact of the global pandemic? Thank you, Senator Searle. Um, minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, I thank uh, Senator Stirl. Uh, very interested in the topic of tourism and uh, comes from that great state of Western Australia. Well, yes, the Albanese Labor government is supporting the tourism and travel sector's recovery in a way that the former Liberal National Government never, ever did. We know the vast majority of tourism businesses are small and medium-sized. They collectively make a significant contribution to employment and our economy. To support this sector, we are delivering on our commitments, including through a $48 million uh, investment over four years, and we are directly Colbert. engaging industry to address the challenges that they face. In August, we held a Tourism and Jobs uh, Skills Summit to hear from industry about the challenges they face. We have launched a visitor economy disability pilot. We are working on a project to better connect workers and employers in the industry. In October, I hosted a ministers, uh, meeting, tourism ministers' meeting in South Australia uh, with state and territory uh, counterparts to collaborate on support for the industry. And I look forward to the next meeting, which will include the tourism ministers from the re-elected Andrews Labor government. In October, we launched the Come and Say Good Day campaign to get international tourists back to Australia. Already, 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 Senator Stirl, it's attracted 122 million views, uh, which translated to a 74 per cent increase in traffic on Australia.com. And last month, no, I'm going to I'm going to come to the Bellarine and Mornington. Don't worry, don't worry, Senator Henderson. Not in this question, though. And last month, last month. We launched the Caravan Parks Grant Program to help park operators upgrade their facilities. The, La the uh, uh, Albanese Labor government stands the, uh, understands the challenges we have faced in tourism Thank and you, travel, Minister, your and time we are has committed. Expired. Senator Searle, first supplementary. Just done the whole... <laughs> wow. First supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, can the minister outline further details about how the Albanese Labor government is helping small and medium-sized tourism businesses address labour and skills shortages so they can recover and thrive? Uh, minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, and uh, Senator Still, yes, I can. Uh, in August, uh, we held a tourism jobs and skills summit to hear directly from industry about labour and skills challenges. You never held one. You never held one. In, in September, we announced a $3.3 million to establish a visitor economy disability pilot to help people living with disability secure sustainable jobs in the tourism industry. The pilot uh, will address barriers identified by small and medium tourism businesses in recruiting, retraining, retraining and, pro and uh, progressing staff with disabilities. Uh, we are working with the industry on a project to provide a one-stop shop for showcase, showcasing career pathways, connecting employers with prospective workers and providing workers with information on jobs and upskilling opportunities. We want to see tourism workers return to this sector after they were forced to look and find work elsewhere under the Thank previous you. Liberal Thank you, National Minister, Government. Your time has expired. Senator Searle, second supplementary. I do. Thank you, President. Now, Minister, in your earlier answer, you touched on the Caravan Parks Grant Program to support businesses to improve their caravan parks. Can the Ministry outline how park operators, whether on the Mornington or Ballerine Peninsula in, or in tropical North Queensland, or more importantly, Outback WA will benefit from this program. Minister, uh, thank you, President. And uh, yes, I can uh, outline that, uh, <coughs> Senator Steele. And thank you for your great interest in this uh, topic. The Albanese Labor government is committed to supporting tourism businesses, including caravan park operators, to recover, grow, and thrive. And President, I know that uh, Senator Steele and potentially even Senator Henderson would be pleased to hear that applications Senator, are currently not just open for caravan parks across Senator the Mornington Henderson. and Bellarine peninsulas. Applications will not just be open in uh, tropical far north Queensland or outback Western Australia. Grants are open for park operators all the way across Australia. And I can assure you that there will be no colour-coded spreadsheets from this government. 
The $10 million Caravan Park Grant Program will provide grants of between $10,000 and $100,000 to help eligible park operators upgrade their park yeah. facilities. As we move into the holiday period, I wish all those working in the tourism Thank industry you, Minister, a your happy time and has safe expired. Christmas. Order. Order. I wish to draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber of Mr Sean Turnell, who I'm sure we're all uh, so thrilled to see safely back in Australia. And of course, we also welcome his wife, Dr. Harvu, who we know um, fought long and hard for his release. And on behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to the parliament and in particular to the Senate. Yeah. Um, Minister. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, can I uh, say how pleased I am to see you in person um, and Dr Harvu as well? I know I speak for all Australians when I say we are so pleased to have you um, back here in Australia with us and so pleased that you have been reunited with, uh, with her after 21 months of unjust detention. And I would say to you, we know no one should have had to endure what you did and that you've emerged from such an awful experience with your humanity and humour intact uh, is truly remarkable. Um, I want to acknowledge um, the work of all those across the government who work so hard on your release. Uh, including the former government and Senator Payne uh, here in the chamber. Uh, and I thank, uh, again, publicly, um, all the members of ASEAN, who, all our partners in ASEAN um, and other regional partners who advocated for your, your release. We are, we're grateful to them. But most of all today, um, welcome to the Senate, um, to both you, Professor Turnell, and, and also to Havu. As I said, I've spoken to both of you, but it's lovely to see you in person. Thank you. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. I'd like to make a short statement. Leave is granted, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. I thank the Senate and, uh, and Professor Sean Turnell, Dr. Harvu. We also warmly welcome you, Professor Turnell, back to Australia, safe and sound. We thank you for the way in which you have always conducted yourselves, each, each of you, uh, particularly noting that your engagement in Myanmar was one to help uplift others, to deliver for others, and that the price you paid was an immense one. Uh, I, too, associate the opposition with the remarks of Senator Wong in thanking all of those who worked so hard to secure your release, and we know that you will continue to work hard wherever you can for the people of Myanmar. Thank you, Senator <laughs> Waters, uh, uh, Birmingham. Um, I'm now going to move to Senator Tyrrell. Uh, yes, Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Education, Minister Gallagher. Um, the ALP national platform commits a Labor government to ensuring that disadvantaged schools get the biggest funding increases in the shortest time. Does this government stand by that promise? Minister. Thank you. Um, President, I thank Senator Tyrrell for the question and for her advocacy on behalf of um, children, uh, and particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds who require um, for assistance and support through their schooling years. Uh, yes, the, Labor, the answer to the question is yes. The Labor Party um, has clearly, you know, through our platform, outlined our position on education. We are the party that introduced needs-based funding in recognition of uh, students um, coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, whether that be where they lived, whether they had uh, learning disabilities, whether they came from non-English speaking backgrounds, First Nations children, the recognition that um, in certain schools that the resourcing of those schools need to accommodate the student populations. Um, so we have a long and proud history of that. Um, and you know, I know that Minister Clare is working very hard in terms of the next round of negotiations with states and territories about how to best um, meet the commitments we've had outlined in our platform, but you know the position that the government has taken around ensuring that the education system, mindful of the fact that the states and territories have a significant role here, and the independent and Catholic sectors also uh, educate a, a large numbers of children, 
and, and young people uh, that we do recognise disadvantage and try to structure our funding accordingly. Um, but I also know from my previous role that education funding is a very contested issue uh, about um, how, how the resourcing is applied. It's not easy, it's not straightforward, but we remain deeply committed to ensuring that every child, regardless of where they live, where they come from, what their parents' incomes are, get access to the best education possible in this country. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. Thank you. Independent special assistance schools are a special stream of schooling that exists to provide education to the most socially and economically disadvantaged children in Australia. Your government's 2023 changes to funding calculations will see their budgets cut. They're not getting the biggest funding increase in the shortest time. They're getting funding cut right now. How is that not a broken promise? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister. Uh, thank you. And I, I have um, uh, seen the reports about the situation in Tasmania, uh, Senator Tyrrell. And um, I understand that the Jackie Lambie Network or you and Senator Lambie have raised concerns about what is happening under this funding model um, and how, it's, uh, how that, those decisions are flowing on to schools. I also know that you, you've met with the Minister for Education um, regarding the issue and that um, the advocacy on behalf of this, the Jackie Lambie Network on behalf of those schools in Tasmania or in, in particular school. Um, as I understand, the minister told the senator that this is a scheme created under the former government. However, when it was brought to his attention about the impacts of that scheme and how they were flowing through to schools, he did ask the Department of Education to work towards resolving the issue that this work is happening and he is working with some urgency. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. Thank you. These schools are really important. My nephew was actually on an 18-month waiting list and he had to leave Tassie to go to Victoria to get educated. But the schools are making decisions about which staff to let go right now. They're asking you to reverse this decision urgently. I understand that we're working towards it, but it really does need to happen to its sweet. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister. Thank you. Yes. Um, I as I said in my previous answer, acknowledging what Senator Tyrrell has said, I understand the minister is working um, on taking advice around what to do about this. I don't know that. Um, I don't know. The, well, I don't know the specifics about this, the funding um, scheme, uh, but I don't know that it's having the intended. The consequences of how it's rolling out aren't what was intended, as I understand from this scheme. Uh, the minister is taking advice. He's had a number of meetings with Independent Schools Australia to understand their concerns about the scheme that, that, as I said, we inherited from the former government. And when a resolution is reached, um, the Independent Schools Australia and any impacted schools will be informed direct, uh, directly. And I also understand from running a school system that schools will be taking decisions now in the lead up for the calendar year and the next school year, and uh, the minister understands this as well. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Bragg. Uh, thank you very much. President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Energy and Climate Change, Senator Wong. Uh, since the Labor government's first budget four weeks ago, in which the government had no response to the immediate energy price rises, various government ministers have publicly flagged export controls on gas, price caps on coal and gas, a new mining tax and direct energy subsidies to households. Other than publicly floating different policies, can the minister finally provide some certainty to Australians, to industry and to investors by ruling out— Order. Order. It's Senator. very hard. I'm just I'm struggling just to get the question out yep. here. It's very loud over there. So. Senator Bragg, I have called senators to order. Order. Thank order, senators, on my right. Don't you think? Yeah, I thought you'd agree. Uh, uh, so, other than publicly floating different policies, can the minister finally provide certainty to Australians, to industry, to investors, by ruling out intervention that would only make a difficult situation even worse? Thank you, Senator Bragg. Um, minister. Which one uh, of the well, uh, I'm asked a question about policy certainty. Yeah. 
I'm asked a question about policy certainty from the coalition. I'm asked a question about policy certainty from the coalition on energy. How many energy policies did they have? Was it one? Was it two? Was it ten? Was it twelve? Was it fifteen? Was it eighteen? Was it twenty? Was it twenty-two? Oh my goodness, twenty-two policies! And surprise, surprise, the market said, well, we don't want to invest when we don't even know what the policy framework is. So we saw dispatchable energy out, and we had less energy in. Prices started to increase. There was a default market offer with an increase. Guess what their great certain policy response was? Well Let's hide it. Let's hide it. I tell you what, I've got a great idea, says Scotty Morrison and Angus. They all sit there in a room, maybe with this one here, with Senator Birmingham. I'm sorry, Mr Morrison and Mr, uh, Mr. Taylor. Uh, and, and they said, yeah, let's do oh, We know what we'll do. We'll just hide it. That's what we'll do. That's our great policy response. Uh, and then we come to government and we see the mess. And yes, uh, and yes we, are, we, are, we are working our way through your mess, which has got worse. Our order on my left. Senator Birmingham. Senator Birmingham. Uh, se uh, Minister, please continue. Uh, uh, and then, and then uh, we, we, we come to government and what we discover is a hidden price increase. Uh, we discover an energy market which is on the, on the, on the edge. Uh, all on top of all on top of what is occurring in global energy markets, which Senator Rennick says are irrelevant, uh, but uh, Senator Birmingham stood on this side and told us all about. So we are, we will work through this, and we will work through this with the states. Uh, you, but nobody on that side can. Uh, let... Senator Bragg, first supplementary. Order, Senator, Senator Wong. I've worked in risk markets all my life. Senator Bragg. Senator Gallagher. Hi. Senator Hi. McAllister, yeah. order. That's right. Senator Bragg. Sun's Thank you for you just call me Sunzak. <laughs> order. <laughs> Senator Bragg. Thank you very much. Uh, the Queensland, New South Wales and South Australian governments have all expressed opposition to price caps on energy. Will the government rule out price caps? To just risk deterring energy investment and exacerbating the current shortages for many years to come. Thank you, Senator Bragg, Minister. Uh, well, uh, like, uh, like, unlike those opposite, we do understand the importance of policy certainty, uh, and we do understand the importance of working with the states. Uh, and as the Prime Minister uh, said, uh, I think last night on 7:30. Uh, we, are, uh, we will work through these issues, uh, including uh, with the states uh, and obviously the national cabinet. Order, order from everyone. Minister, please continue. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. I've just called the chamber to order, and you just continue calling out. I can't help it. Uh, Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, we will work through this issue with the states, and of course, it is it is a it is a difficult issue. Uh, you know, we don't uh, we don't shy away from that. Uh, we are we are we are dealing with a, a legacy problem, or we're dealing with a global markets problem. And you know, my, my or what I would say, Senator Bragg, if it is if more on your side understood some of those policy issues, I suspect the country would not be in the position it is. Um, Senator Bragg, second supplementary. Thank you very much. Uh, this week at Senate Estimates, both the Treasury Secretary and the Governor of the Reserve Bank said that Australia needs more gas. Why did the government cut supply-side policies in its budget? And can you name one government policy that aims to increase the production of Australian gas? Thank you, Senator Bragg. Minister. Well, uh, I, I'm not sure to what uh, I, I'm, not I'm not sure to what the minister is referring. Uh, sorry, the senator is referring. Uh, and uh, order, order. The minister has the right to be heard in silence. Please continue, minister. Uh, 
I gave, I gave you a promotion. You see, I must like you, Senator Bragg. Um, uh, I'm not sure what, to what you're referring, Senator Bragg, but I, I, would, I would make a point about um, gas supply. Between 2014 and 2021, East Coast gas production increased. Wow. Order. Oh, it's always someone else. Senator Van. Order. Order. Class, it's always someone else. Uh, no, Senator Van, uh, you lost the ele state election, mate. Just maybe, just give it a rest uh, for a little Minister, while. Please continue. Um, uh, between 2014 and 2021, East Coast East Coast gas production increased 300 per cent. Uh, because, in, in great part, because um, the minister, please resume your seat, Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Just on uh, on relevance, the question went to policies, uh, not statistics, historical statistics uh, that the you, minister Senator is Canavan. referring to now. The minister now. is being directly relevant. Minister, please continue. Well, I'm making I'm making the point about you might not like to know this. At the, despite the 300 per cent increase in gas coast gas production. Uh, domestic gas prices went up by 420 per cent in real terms over that time. So the point is the policies you had failed. That's the point. Thank so you, we Minister. are trying Your to work our way expired. through that. A Senator Babette. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Health Minister, Senator Gallagher. The recent release of Australian Bureau of Statistics provisional mortality data for our nation shows all-cause mortality to the end of August is currently a staggering 18,671, or 17 per cent higher than the historical average. Now, a report which appeared in the Lancet Medical Journal also shows that Europe is facing an increase in cancer diagnosis after an estimated one million cases of cancer went unfound due to the COVID lockdowns and other draconian measures. Can the minister advise what we are doing here in Australia to make up for the many thousands of likely missed cancer diagnoses over the last two years? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister. Thank you, uh, President. I thank Senator Babette for the question. And uh, we are working with we are working with the states and territories. There is no doubt, I mean I haven't. Um, I don't want to align myself with the uh, mortality data and this because I haven't seen what you were citing from. But the broad. Well, that's fine. I, I'm not questioning it. I'm saying I haven't seen it. So my question, my answer is in relation directly to the question, not the preamble. So the question uh, was, what are we doing? There is no doubt that our health services over the last two years were significantly affected by the, the pandemic. So services um, that would normally be provided through hospitals, people going to GPs, people actually even seeking health treatment uh, because they, they had a concern, uh, significantly changed during the pandemic. We are working with the states and territories, as you would expect through the National Health Reform Agreement. Um, about um, you know transitioning out of the pandemic and the COVID focus, um, there are you know they'll have significant um, pressure on the hospitals, but also in primary care. Um, and as people come forward, um, there were there is no doubt there was delayed seeking of health um, attention or seeking of health assistance and access to services through the pandemic. Uh, and we, it will take some time to work through that, but we are working with the states and territories through the uh, Prime Minister and the First Ministers um, through National Cabinet about um, pressures in the health system and transitioning away from, from COVID-19 and the COVID-19 focus. Thank you. Uh, Senator Babette, first supplementary. Deaths with COVID-19 generally, not solely from COVID-19, have been recorded by the ABS as 7,000 727 at the end of August. Even if we exclude all deaths with COVID-19, we are still seeing excess deaths of about 10,944. Can the minister explain or advise what research, if any, is being done to look into the cause of this alarming excess, excess mortality? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister. Well, again, I haven't. Uh, thank you, President, and for the Senator for the question. Again, I haven't seen the data to which um, the Senator is referring, so I think it is appropriate um, that um, I don't um, just immediately accept those statistics. Um, but I think there will be, over time, a lot of information, a lot of research, 
an assessment done about our response to COVID-19 and some of the other consequences of the fact our health system had to respond to a global pandemic and therefore other services were either wound down, didn't um, operate or people chose not to seek assistance during the pandemic. I have no doubt that there will be plenty of academics and researchers who are interested in that, assessing that and then um, making recommendations about what should happen when the next um, global pandemic um, hits hits um, you know the country or all countries so that Thank you, I'm Minister, sure there will be done. Has expired. Yes. Senator Babbitt second supplementary now we've seen some alarming data out of South Australia sourced by Senator Alex Antic, to my right which shows a material increase in cardiac presentation in 15 to 44 year olds commencing in July 2021 a time when there were very minimal COVID cases what is the minister doing to investigate the un underlying cause of the spike in heart-related issues? Does the government still assert that the um, mRNA injections are still safe and effective? Thank you, Senator Babette, Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I haven't seen Senator Antic's research either, and I'm not sure of your background in epidemiology and assessing um, you know, what's the health trends during a global pandemic, but I, I can be corrected if you have some background in that. Um, in relation to do we think the vaccines are safe, yes. Um, the TGA has gone through its process. It's, it, as you know, Senator Babbitt, they also report on adverse events, and myocarditis, pericarditis in younger people was one of the, the identified risks of those vaccines, and everybody was well, everybody was informed of that, um, and it was seen as a risk. Those um, people where it affected them, particularly younger men, as I understand it, those adverse events uh, were recorded. Uh, but I should also say the vaccines have saved thousands and thousands of lives, particularly most vulnerable Australians. And the pandemic and the vaccine program uh, Minister, was always about responding expired. to that. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Minister for Women and Minister for the Public Service, Senator Gallagher. <laughs> Could the minister update the Senate on the government's achievements across her three portfolios over the past six months? Uh, minister. Busy. Oh. I thought there was a longer question. Order. Order. I will. I will. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Urquhart. Um, can I thank you for your interest in my three portfolios um, and for the question? It has certainly been a very busy time since uh, the Albanese government was elected six months ago, and we've spent every single day focused on implementing our plan for a better economy, better budget and better future. We've begun the work of budget repair, restoring fiscal discipline, to reverse the decades of economic, decade of economic mismanagement. That's right. In October, we delivered a responsible Senator budget King. that is right for the times and readies us for the future. It puts to an end the record rorts and wastes that riddled Senator the budgets King. under those opposite. Investments in services Senator and programs Hume. that— uh, Minister, please resume. Uh, Senator Hume, I called you at least three times and you just chose to continue. That is incredibly disrespectful. I ask you to listen in silence. Minister, please continue. Sorry, I didn't hear the interjections. Um, well, I've got a coping mechanism where I block them out. Senator McGrath. Okay. Um, investments in services and programs that matter to the Australian people, like childcare, like aged care, like cheaper medicines, like housing, like climate, investments. Well, there were billions of dollars in our Powering Australia plan. I take that interjection from you, Senator McGrath. Senator McGrath. Our Powering Senator McGrath. Australia plan to fix the energy mess that we Senator inherited. Coney. The negligence of those opposite when they were in government to put their head in the sand and pretend that the most significant economic transformation and challenge facing the country just wasn't going to happen, that they didn't need to deal with it. Well, we're dealing with it in our first budget. We've also begun implementing the Buy Australian Plan, which is our plan to use the government's purchasing power to help grow Australian businesses 
create jobs, develop up sovereign capability and back Australian businesses. Our spending review identified $22 billion in savings over four years to uh, deal with the budget. Uh, thank First you, Minister. The budget Your time repair. has expired. When there's quiet, I'm going to call uh, Senator Urquhart for her first supplementary. Senator Urquhart. Can the minister provide further information about how the government has begun meaningful reform to shift the dial on gender equality and reduce the barriers faced by women in this country? Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and I thank Senator Urquhart for the question. As Minister for Women, I'm very proud to say that gender equality has been at the core of this government from day one, because gender equality is a core Labor value. I don't need to convince my colleagues, men or women, that we needed to get moving on gender equality. We just get on with it. The Albanese government is putting gender equality front and centre of our economic policy. We're giving more women more choices through modernising and expanding PPL and making childcare cheaper. We released the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children under the leadership well, it was a very different plan, Senator Rustin, by the time it got signed off, let me tell you that, by the time the states and territories signed up to it. We've got our housing agenda. We're implementing respect at work recommendations, uh, including a positive duty for workplaces to prevent sexual harassment. And we're beginning work on the national strategy for gender equality, guided by the Women's Economic Equality Task Force, and there Thank is much Minister, more to do. Your time has expired. Senator Urquhart, second supplementary. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Thank you, President. Can the minister provide further information about how the government has begun making the institution of the Australian Public Service stronger, more enduring and more aligned to the community that we are all here to serve? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, President. I thank Senator Urquhart for the question again. Our government is building a stronger public service to better serve all Australians. Yeah. We abolished the Liberal and National Party's arbitrary and damaging staffing cap that diminished the capability and capacity of the public service and led to an excessive and reflective reliance on wasteful external labour. We are reinvesting in the NDIA, in Services Australia and the Department of Veterans Affairs to improve service delivery for Australians. We have appointed a dedicated secretary for public sector reform to deliver on our agenda and have commenced an audit of employment to improve job security and save taxpayers' money. We have also restored the ability of workers and their representatives to bargain in good faith and be consulted. What about that? How radical is that? And I want to take this opportunity to thank the 160,000 pu public servants who have worked so hard to support the government deliver on our commitments to the Australian uh, thank people. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Prior to the election, uh, Prime Minister Albanese said to all Australians, I'll say this very clearly, they will be better off under a Labor government. He promised that a Labor government will see electricity prices fall from the current levels by $275 for households by 2025. But isn't it true that, according to your own budget, this December Aussies will have to pay 50 per cent more just to run the aircon, pump the pool and turn on the Christmas lights? I thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Wong. Take no responsibility. Well, uh, it, is, it, is, it is the case. Sorry, did, did you call me? Um, no, you I called you. Sorry. I did call you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Senators, interjections across the chamber are particularly disorderly. Minister, please continue. Uh, uh, it is the case that Australians are, are battling higher energy prices. Uh, and we know why that is. We know what we inherited and we know where global markets are. Uh, and uh, and well, I think you know you perfected the art of I don't hold a hose, mate. I'll take the interjection from Senator Rustin. She says uh, no. She says you don't take responsibility. I mean, we've got we've got your people in the House voting against the censure motion for the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, who who made an art form of never taking responsibility for everything. So let's be clear. Uh, about who has been prepared to be up front with the Australian people, who is, who is clear that we have, we have an Order. energy 
We have a, a significant a, 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 a problem in our energy markets that the government is working through, which is, which is as a consequence of deca a, a, nearly a decade of inaction and denial of 22 failed energy policies and what is occurring uh, globally. Uh, now, I know those opposite Senator don't Kuhn. like to be reminded of this, uh, but uh, the reality is renewables are the cheapest form uh, of, of power. Oh, see, you see, this is the this is if you ever wanted an example of why energy markets are where they are, it's because you are still locked into an ideological Order. battle, the vortex of inaction because of the fight between the Jared Rennicks uh, and the and the Andrew Brown. Uh, Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Order once again on my left. Please continue, Minister. The, 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 the ideological vortex uh, that oh, is the, Minister, that is please, please sit down Senator Rennick I have just called the chamber to order and the minute the minister is back on her feet you are interjection interjecting it is disorderly Minister please continue well, I'm actually happy to take Senator Rennick's interjections because I think what it demonstrates is and so does the result in Victoria and the result of all of those seats. Uh, which were traditional Liberal ha uh, heartland seats, uh, that, that your ideological fight internally has put you out of touch with the market and where most Australians are. That Thank is the you, hard Minister. reality. Your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan, first supplementary. Thank you, President. In the coming weeks, Australians will be heading back home to their families and then off to a well-deserved break. Uh, some will be at the beach and some will head to the regions. Uh, isn't it true that they will be paying more for their plane tickets? more for their bus tickets and then uh, more for their snacks at the survey, and your government has no plans to fix it. Uh, Minister. Uh, so uh, what, we are, what we are saying is this. Uh, we, will, we are investing $24 billion to fix transmission and speed up renewable energy. We have heads of agreement with East Coast LNG exporters to, to deliver more, more gas in 2023. The budget had a package um, to give Minister, the regulators— please the reg Minister, please resume. Um, Senator Sullivan. Point of order on relevance. My question went to cost of living. Yep, and I believe the minister is being relevant to that, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister, I'd have something to do with this. So the budget had a $67 million package to give regulators, including the ACCC, the AER, and AEMO, more powers to monitor gas supply and take action. We've overhauled the gas trigger to allow it to be activated quarterly. If there is a shortfall and force exporters to divert supply for domestic markets. These are all things you, you did not do. And we are working with the ACCC to strengthen the code of conduct between gas suppliers and customers to get reasonable prices in the market. Now, we know there is more to do. But unlike you, we are not engaged in an internal ideological fight between people like you, who might have a rational position, and Senator Rennick, who continues to argue uh, a position you, that Wong. reminds me of Senator the Flintstones. Wong, your time has expired. Order, Senator O'Sullivan. Order. Uh, order, Senators on both sides. <laughs> Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, thank you, President. Very soon, Australians will be gathered around the table for Christmas lunch. Uh, they will not be better off. They will have paid more for the turkey, more for the ham, more for the bonbons, more for the beers and or possibly the Prosecco, and more to get presents for the kids. Order. Is this what the Minister Order. for Employment meant when he said people will be seeing in their bank accounts what a change in government means? Uh, before I call the Minister, Senator Pulley, I've called the Chamber to order, and you have constantly been interjecting throughout the time Senator O'Sullivan was at uh, order. Minister. Well, unlike the good senator, I don't operate under the delusion that people around the Christmas lunch table are going to be thinking about politics. But anyway, <laughs> what I would say this: if they did, if they did, what they would know is that there is a party that has consistently supported lower wage, late wage rises, lower wages, for nearly a decade. That there is a party that has proudly supported low wages as a deliberate Minister, design feature of the Australian Minister, economy. Minister, as a party 
Minister, uh, there's a party please, who opposed the dollar and our increase to the minimum wage. A party who opposed wage increases Minister for aged Wong, care workers and seat. early childhood educators. Minister Wong. Senator O'Sullivan. Yes, uh, Acting Deputy President, I move to take note of the answers given to all coalition senators' questions. Uh, the first one went to uh, transparency, and then we had some questions about the cost of living. And I seek to uh, cover off on all of those in my taking note this morning, uh, this evening, uh, this afternoon. <laughs> rather, it has, it has been a long week, though. Uh, and. Uh, the, fir the first one on transparency, and what we've seen with this government is a pattern of a lack of transparency. Yet we heard time and time again throughout the election campaign and in the lead up to it that this government, the hallmark of this government, would be transparency, uh, would be uh, uh, open to scrutiny, would be in and have integrity. But we're seeing anything but that so far. I mean, I needed to take a look at the inquiry that went into, the, uh, into this fair work bill that the, that the government is currently debating. A lack of transparency, a lack of scrutiny. They only allowed 22 days for stakeholders to be able to uh, present their concerns and their issues about the bill that is before this parliament. 22 days to consider such a, a significant and uh, such a significant uh, uh, change to the Fair Work Bill, and this is just absolutely outrageous. Because this government is not prepared to open themselves up to scrutiny. Because if you did, then you'd find that there would be all sorts of holes, and that's what we're finding as, the, uh, as we're in the committee stage of, this, uh, of that particular bill. Uh, but here we have a situation where uh, we have a, a request for, uh, for details of diaries to be revealed to be tabled to, so that uh, the, the parliament can, can scrutinise, so that members of parliament can, uh, can scrutinise whereabouts uh, and, and who the uh, various ministers are, are engaging with. And the Prime Minister is not allowing, has not provided his diary so that the Australian people can have a look, so that this parliament can have a look at what is going on. That, now, this is, this is very disappointing and it's a very concerning uh, precedence that's been set here. Uh, and even the, the, the leader of the, the government in this place is not, uh, not pr uh, making her diary available. And I look forward to it being available. I've got no doubt that uh, Senator Wong is uh, engaging in some very important issues, engaging in her portfolio with some very uh, important issues. But, but why, why not open it up? Why not fulfil the obligation that they have to be transparent and to be honest with the open up and be, be transparent with the Australian people. Now, to the cost of living. Uh, the, the, we had some questions about this and we had some very well, would you call would you call them answers, uh, colleagues? I'm not sure that they were really answers because they were just ducking and weaving from the reality. Now we heard uh, time and time and time again, over 90 times throughout the election campaign alone, that this government was going to tackle energy prices, was going to, in fact, uh, reduce the cost of energy by $275. 
to the Australian people. It was promised to the Australian people, Mr. Acting Deputy, uh, Mr. Deputy President. It was promised to the Australian people that that would happen, but it's not. In fact, what we're seeing is that Australians are going to be worse off under this government. In fact, two thousand dollars worse off by the time we get to Christmas. And as I asked in my question to the to the minister representing the Prime Minister, what what the impact was going to be. We know that Australians, when they're buying their, their hams and their turkeys and their bonbons and getting themselves ready for hosting a Christmas lunch with their family, as they I'm sure been looking forward to for so long, and we know that last Christmas many families were apart and weren't able to get together. They're looking forward to getting together this Christmas. But uh, what they're seeing as they're going to the grocery stores is the cost of delivering Christmas this year has gone up. The cost of buying those presents for kids has gone up because what we're seeing is that this government's not doing anything to tackle the cost of living crisis that is before us right now. Inflation is going up, interest rates are going up, the cost of delivering Christmas is going up. And I look forward to the responses of those other opposite who might be able to rebut what I'm saying, because there's not. There's nothing that they can say. There's nothing that they can point to. There's nothing that they can point to that will demonstrate that they're actually doing something to address this cost of living crisis. Now, I want to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas. A very Merry Christmas. I hope that you do get to celebrate some great time with your family. I hope that you do get to enjoy a lovely Christmas lunch, because I know that many Australians last year didn't get to enjoy that, and I hope that they get that chance, even though it's costing them more. Senator Billick. Thank you, um, Deputy President. Seriously, give the man a bucket and a hanky. Seriously, the crocodile tears are just beyond, beyond humour. It is beyond humour, because this is the side that want to come in here and give us a lecture on transparency. Transparency? I'm still waiting to see Mr Joyce's um, report when he was the envoy for whatever he was the envoy for, that he was paid enormous amounts of money for, that still nobody's ever been able to see. I mean, I'm still waiting to see the reports that you know you don't give us, and what else have we got? Let's talk about transparency on the other side. First of all, we've got the former Attorney General. So that you know, that side, integrity, um, just you know, they. I beg your pardon. I do know where the government. I know you lost the election, and you know why you lost the election because people knew you were not up to the job. People knew that you didn't care about them. People knew that you didn't care about the cost of living. And the crocodile tears from over there, and we're spending hours in here because you won't support the Industrial Relations Bill. You won't give low-paid workers a pay rise. You will not give the aged care workers a pay rise. You will not give the early childhood educators a pay rise. Your whole policy on pay rise was to keep wages low. Was to keep wages low. And what do you have? It's like I don't know if anyone in the gallery threw you, uh, Deputy President, but I don't know if anyone in the gallery ever watched that show to the men are born. Because that's what, 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 we, what we have got over there. They through me, think Senator Billick, through me, not the gallery. I did say through you, Deputy President. I know, but you were talking to the gallery. Well, through you, Deputy President, I will say I will say to those over there, you've watched too much to the men are born. You think you are to the men are born. You want to keep wages low. You want to keep people down. Don't come in here and tell us that people won't be able to afford Christmas because we know that because we're cleaning up 10 years of your mess, 10 years of you guys deliberately keeping wages lower, 10 years of you de denying low-paid workers an increase. Do you think people are fooled by that? I can tell you, I have early childhood educators in my office or in, in my office in Hobart probably at least twice a month. And I'll tell you, they do not like you guys. And I'm quite happy for them not to like you guys. They know that you are blocking this wage rise for them. They know that it is you. They know that it is you that is trying to hold Australia back. You, I, 
Look, I've got, I've got, look, I've uh, got less than two minutes left, and I do want to say something nice at the end. Order to my but left. Order to my you, left. You are the guys that you know had colour-coded spreadsheets. I mean, where's the transparency in that? Where is the colour? Where is the where is the transparency in that? Don't come in here and talk complete rubbish. People outside this building know you're talking rubbish. They know that it's just a ploy to try and cover up because you're all in denial over there. I don't know how many times. I don't know why you don't put your hands up like this every time someone says, "What's well, our fault? What's well, our fault?" Because we don't have to take responsibility. Because now you're the government. Well, guess what? You spent ten years buggering up the community, buggering up. Australia. Senator, and, Senator Billy, please don't. Uh, use that I'm sorry, term. Deputy President. I find it offensive. Yeah, okay, Deputy President, I withdraw that. Um, I apologise wholeheartedly. You spent 10 years screwing the people of Australia. I'm not sure that's much better. Uh, no, Senator, okay, come on. Senator, I've heard, Senator, Hen I heard Senator Henderson, all sorts I'm well aware. I can look after myself. Thank you. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. I would ask the senator opposite to withdraw that really most offensive word. Thank you. Yes. Uh, descriptors than the one the senator used. Well, I think it was entirely not, in context. We all haven't lived as worldly lives as you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Billick, please, please continue. Chamber, I'm happy to withdraw everything that was offensive to the people on that side. I'm very, you know, I'd hate to offend you. You've offended the people of Australia for the last nine years. But as you know, I can't say that. Well, fine, I'm happy to take the ruling from the Deputy President. We have been working hard, working hard in the past six months that we've been in Parliament. And what have we been doing? We've, oh, do you want to hear what we've done? We've been, let me start. We've been building a modern economy. We're not living in the 1950s. We are not living in the 1950s like those on that side want to do. We've been protecting the vulnerable. We've been building, rebuilding, rebuilding uh, international relationships because we know what happened to international relationships from your side. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, to paraphrase uh, a great film from the early noughties, why are you so obsessed with us? All we have heard today from those in the government is uh, their own views on what happened when we were in government. There wasn't much constructive, uh, much, much con many constructive ideas at all coming from members of the government today, and I think that's really disappointing. We are seven months into this government now, into this new parliament, and the broken promises are starting to stack up. The problems are out there. Australians are under the pump. And we have a government that promised one thing in May, and if best, they do something entirely different, and at worst, they don't even address the problem to start with. Um, during the election campaign, uh, and while the now government was in opposition, Labor promised on multiple occasions that they would fix the rising cost of living. They said they had a plan. They promised that they would reduce inflation. They promised that they would help Australians get household budgets under control. They promised that the average Australian could expect to see a $275 reduction in their power bills, and they promised that they would be a transparent and accountable government. It all sounded so easy, and they promised an easy fix. But it turns out that governing the country isn't as easy as some of those opposite expected, and maybe that's why they come into this place and instead of talking about what they should be doing, they just talk about their perceived issues with this previous government. Right now, under Anthony Albanese and Labor, we have an economy with high inflation, rapidly rising interest rates and skyrocketing rising costs of living. But their dismal economic management and failure to deliver what they promised doesn't stop there. Like I said, Mr Deputy President, Labor have also abandoned their promise to reduce household electricity prices for Australians, a promise which they said would save the average Australian $275 on their power bill. Thank you, Senator Birmingham and Senator Scar, for the interjections there. I, 
Um, this uh, late on a sitting week, I didn't have the number uh, quite front of mind, but the number I did have front of mind is 275, because that's how many dollars they said your electricity bill was going to go down by. Instead of saving for households, the government's been forced to make an embarrassing admission that over the next two years, Australians can expect to see electricity prices go up by 56 per cent. People voted for Mr Albanese and Labor based off this promise. And the question is, what is Labor going to do about it? But the fact is, they do not have a plan. That is why we saw this uh, behaviour from the government today. They will talk as much as they like about the last nine years uh, and their various views on, um, on our government, but six months in, they can't actually on focus on the issues that are important to Australians. And not even Labor state governments believe that the Albanese government has a plan that's going to work, let alone a plan that's going to deliver that $275 promise. Um, I was paging through the Financial Review yesterday and we read that uh, the South Australian government was appealing to the Federal Energy Minister not to do anything stupid. Well, it's a bit late for that. Uh, most people would say that promising every Australian household that their power bills would go down by hundreds of dollars to win an election and then announcing in your first budget that bills will actually be going up by hundreds of dollars is a fairly stupid thing to do, Mr Deputy President. The Albanese government's plan to put a cap on gas prices faces a new roadblock, with the South Australian Labor government joining industry warnings that it could deter investment in new gas supply developments. That was the report in the Fin yesterday. And this came on the same day that the Queensland Labor government told the Albanese government to keep its hands off their generators. Not even Labor governments trust other Labor governments to bring down power prices. The dishonesty that was on display by the Labor Party earlier this year when they promised Australians they would lower the cost of living is extraordinary. When they promised Australians that get a $275 cut to their power bills, millions of people believed them. They believed them when they said that they were going to be a government that was about transparency and accountability, and yet this week in this place they tried to take uh, days out of our Senate estimates sitting schedule for next year. I mean, you can't be um, much less interested in transparency and accountability than that, than taking away the ability of this chamber to scrutinise the decisions of government. Uh, instead of a $275 cut, Labor have brought out a budget promising Australian households a 56 per cent hike to their power bills, and now we are seeing Labor state governments fighting with the federal government about these very same issues. It's not good enough. Six months in, it's a pretty disappointing result for the government. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, the opposition's lack of transparency has followed them right into opposition and into this question time. They have failed to nail, uh, nail the government at all when they raise these issues because we have been very fair and transparent in our commitments to the Australian people. But if you look even at how the opposition asked their questions today, when Senator Cadell asked Senator Wong, saying, I refer to your secret modelling that demonstrates that there will be coal mine enclosures as a result of your policies. Lo and behold, what do we find through you, Deputy President? Those very coal mines were forecast to close and that their closure was announced under the last government. So far from being attributable to the Labor Party's uh, policy commitments and, indeed, the commitments we have made to the Australian people, we saw those forecast job losses under the opposition's policy settings from when they were in government. The po opposition's complete lack, frankly, of policy settings. As we've heard many times in this place, we, we saw under the last government some 22 energy policies in the time that they were in government. So when we talk about our commitment to preventing job losses on the road to net zero. We're serious about it. That's why we do this modelling, so we can see the impact of our policies on local employment markets and we can work out where you stimulate in order to mitigate uh, any changes in those local job mar markets in order to prevent those job losses. 
We've also had from those opposite a debate today about cost of living. Well, the key contributor, one of the key contributors to cost of living in this nation, has of course been electricity prices, gas prices, things that you didn't do anything about in terms of your absolute lack of policy clarity on those questions. Again, a mess that we in government are now left to clean up. Those opposite like to lambast us for our um, target, our reduction target of emission for emissions. And we've talked about uh, the Hunter and other coal mining precincts. Well, we're proud to be a government that is working with the government of New South Wales. Currently, that's a Liberal government. They have a reduction target uh, to get to a 50 per cent reduction by 2030. Are you blaming them for, these, for, for this landscape? Are you making accusations of them that attributes job losses to them? Well, no, because we know that these reduction policies are both good for our environment and good for the economy. They're not easy transitions to make. They have complex adjustments for economies and communities that we need to be smart and organised about. But the economic modelling and indeed the historical record when you look at things like the short time we had the carbon pollution reduction scheme in place or you look, if you look at the success of existing renewable energy technologies uh, widely used in Australia uh, and their costings. It demonstrates that our modelling and our commitments absolutely stack up. We are a government who wants to look after workers because we care about the cost of living. We are here today in this chamber spending most of the day debating industrial relations laws. Industrial relations laws that will empower workers and workplaces to work with their employers to improve productivity and increase wages and conditions where they're deserved. Thank, thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr. Act, Deputy President. Uh, well, uh, it's only been four weeks uh, since the Labor government's first budget, and uh, that budget uh, wasn't so much about their own figures, but it was a, had a shocking impact on the budgets of average Australian families. Uh, in that budget, it was revealed that uh, energy prices for Australian families in the next two years are set to skyrocket by 56 per cent. And there has been a massive community outrage at this, especially given the government only six months before had promised to actually slash uh, people's power bills by $275. Now, since then, in the past four weeks, the government has, has flown uh, more kites than you'd see on a windy beach. Uh, every day there is a new kite being flown about what they're going to do uh, about energy prices, despite them saying they had a plan six months ago to actually deal with it. And now, and I'm only speaking to some of major uh, uh, energy companies this morning here in this place, they are shaking their head. They are shaking their head at this government because they have no idea what they are going to do. No idea what they are going to do. Every day, basically, they wake up, they read the paper and they read about the latest uh, battles that are going on with this divided government, with this government with no direction on how they are going to get people's uh, energy bills down. I think it's important to go through uh, this absolute rabble that this government is over the past month. On the 28th of October in 2022, in the New Daily, on the New Daily website, there was a, a, a story that said, Labor refuses to rule out gas export cap. Uh, it says former competition watchdog boss Rod Sims has suggested the government threaten gas providers with export limits. Energy Minister Chris Bowen didn't rule out such a drastic move. So that's on the table. They have no idea if there's going to be a gas export tap, uh, cap. We still don't know. Then, uh, on the 26th of October, uh, uh, the Australian reported in a headline, windfall levy and changes to GST ruled out 
and it said Jim Chalmers has ruled out changes to the GST or hitting gas exporters with a windfall profits tax. Now, only about two weeks later, after the Treasurer, nonetheless, the Treasurer had ruled out a windfall profits tax, just two weeks later, the Australian reported front page on the 11th of November that headlined Labor risks new row with miners over coal gas tax. And the article said Anthony Albanese has not ruled out a new tax on gas and coal to help ease energy prices for households and businesses and said the government is, and I quote, working through the issue. Now, I wonder if Mr Albanese had spoken to his treasurer just two weeks before who had ruled out such a tax. I mean, what the hell is going on with this government? Why can't they get things in order? We are talking about extremely serious matters that they are messing around with because they have no idea what they're doing. Now, a few weeks on, by the 29th of November, a story in the, AB, uh, sorry, a story in the Australian came up with a new idea. New idea: Anthony Albanese's fix for electricity bills, direct subsidies for homes and businesses. This was the third energy plan in just a few weeks. Uh, that was floated this week, and also on the same day, on the very same day, the ABC uh, reported that government to cap wholesale gas prices as part of a market invention to lower power prices. So we actually had that was a record. They had two energy policies on the same day that were briefed out to different newspapers, and no one has any idea what they are doing. Nonetheless, themselves, they have no idea what they are doing here. They made promises, uh, in the words of uh, Maverick. They, they, they tried to cash checks that their body can't keep uh, six months ago at the election. They said they could cut our power bills by $275, and they got to government. They, go, they have got no idea how to do this. Uh, and instead, we're facing skyrocketing power bills ahead of Christmas this year. Well, this government has to. Once we leave this place, they've got to get their act together because the Australian people rely on it. They need to get some consistency in their energy policies, not this rabble that's going on uh, playing out in our nation's newspapers. They need to talk to these energy producers. They need to talk to the industrial customers, and most of all, they need to talk to the Australian people. And none of this, none of this, none of this weasel words, this corporatees that they've been using, as was revealed, was said again by their leader today, saying that they're going to transition, they're going to transition workers to new jobs. Uh, that means you're going to lose your job. People know that when they hear the word transition. That means I'm going to lose my job. And if that's what you mean, just say it. Just say it. It's a lot more trustworthy when you say that because when you use words like transition, you sound, you sound like a second-rate HR manager at a, at a large business. Uh, you, sound like, you sound like that character from the Dilbert cartoon, the catbird. You're all a bunch of catbirds over there when you use words like transition instead of speaking plainly to the Australian people. Because if I know anything about coal mines in this country, they don't take kindly. Uh, to, be, to, to, the, to the rubbish, to the BS that goes on sometimes uh, from this other mob. Just speak the truth to us and be honest. Thank you, Senator Canavan. I put the question. Those of the question say aye against. No, the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, De uh, Acting Deputy um, President. I move to take note of the government's response to my question regarding climate change and loss and damage. Um, and I also note that Senator Wish Wilson will also take part of my time. Um, in 1991, Vanuatu, on behalf of small island states, first asked this question, <coughs> who will pay for climate catastrophe? And over the next three decades, wealthy nations of the global north dodged and deflected that question, while they continued to fuel the climate crisis. They relentlessly pursued profit and power and put the world on track for climate catastrophe and disasters. And these disasters have affected 33 million people in Pakistan, 50 million people in the Horn of Africa face the threat of famine. The climate crisis is, exist, is an existential threat to the Pacific nations. After decades of pushing by the Global South, a loss and damage fund has finally been agreed to. And New Zealand, Denmark, Germany and Scotland have all committed to contributing. But Australia still refuses to commit its fair share to loss and damage funding. Today, the climate change minister tabled his first annual climate change statement and mentioned the devastating floods in Pakistan, as well as the climate risks faced by Indonesia and the Pacific Islands. But it's simply not enough for the government to acknowledge these climate catastrophes and grave climate risks faced by countries of the global south. It needs to stop pouring fuel on fire. It beggars belief that the climate change minister did not once mention the words coal or gas, not a single time. Honestly, what does the government think is causing the crisis in the first place? Strong and urgent action means no new coal and gas. 
It is untenable to keep sacrificing the lives and livelihoods of those in poorer nations to maintain the profit margins of fossil fuel conglomerates, many of whom fill political, political donation buckets for both the big parties. Now, climate change is a matter of global justice. Those who did nothing to create it are facing the first and the worst consequences. Loss and damage funding is about compensation and a debt owed for the terrible legacy of extractivism and colonialism by the global north. It is not charity. It is about righting historic wrongs. Given Australia's dirty hands in producing carbon emissions, we have a special responsibility to do everything we can for climate justice. Australia needs to use its diplomatic weight to push for the loss and damage fund to be set up urgently and take the lead by unequivocally committing to loss and damage funding and pay its fair share. That's what real climate leadership on the global stage looks like. That's what listening to our Pacific neighbors looks like. And that's what global justice demands of us. Senator Wish Wilson. Deputy, Deputy President, not only has the government not answered Senator Fruki's question today on climate change, but they've also not complied with an order of this Senate to provide details, critical details, uh, on their formal response to the IUCN UNESCO reactive monitoring mission report, which they were happy to release earlier this week. They seem to be very big on rhetoric and very light on detail. Um, Minister Plibersek has sat on this report for at least three months. She very, you know, very craftily put the response out this week, nicely massaged, given to uh, her favourite uh, media outlets. We know how it all works. Uh, no doubt also uh, spoke to stakeholders and gave them a, a sneak preview of it. Uh, and we hear the response from the government. It wasn't, of course, the report wasn't what they wanted to hear. Uh, the IUCN UNESCO uh, committee recommended that the Great Barrier Reef should be put on the in danger list because its outstanding universal values are going to be severely impacted from climate change. And of course, it recommended that the government meet its Paris protocols. Well, why doesn't the government comply with the order of this Senate and provide its official? its official explanation to UNESCO. Did, for example, the government say that they are going to meet their Paris targets? Because we know they have legislated a climate target in this place, with no detail or plan on how they're going to meet it, by the way, that it well exceeds our Paris commitments. We know they don't have a plan for that. Where is that detail? What else did they say to UNESCO? Did they say it's unfair? that the barrier reef has been singled out amongst all the world's coral reefs that are suffering because of warming oceans caused by the burning of fossil fuels? Well, what kind of excuse is that to actually say the barrier reef shouldn't be singled out? What we should be doing is showing leadership and saying that's why the reef should be put on the endangered list so that we can all take action right around the world and understand the gravity of the situation that we and future generations are facing. I put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator White. Uh, Deputy President, pursuant to the notice given on 30 November 2022 on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I withdraw business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 5 for four sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the Finance Sector Reform Hain Royal Commission response, Hawking of Financial Products Regulation 2021. Is there a, a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Deputy President. <clears throat> Excuse me. I present the eighth report of 2022 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hansard. Pardon? Is leave granted? Leave is granted. My microphone. Oh, it is now. I move that the report be adopted. Cheers. Minister. Um, I move the following amendment. At the end of the motion, add 
and in respect of the Public Interest Disclosure Amendment Bill 2022, the provisions of the bill be referred immediately to the Legal, Constitutional, Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by 24 February 2022. Senator McKim, I note that you have circulated an amendment. Uh, yes, thank you, Deputy President. I move to amend the government's amendment by deleting 24 February and inserting 14 March. Are there any other Minister? Uh, thank you. Sorry, just on um, Senator McKim's amendment, um, which I know is it's only a very short uh, difference, but uh, we we would prefer the 24th of February and in preference to Senator McKim's amendment because the time frame of this inquiry um, wouldn't allow for the bill to be considered by the Senate in time for it to be operational in line with the National Anti-Corruption Commission because it would miss that March sitting week. It would miss the March sitting week, which means we wouldn't be able to, to implement the laws in line with the NAC, and that's the reason why we're trying to push it back so it can be considered in March. We're, we're entitled to debate to debate the amendment, so I'll give the call to uh, Senator, Senator th Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. Um, we've heard the government's um, ask. Uh, we want to make sure this is done properly. We're only asking for an extra week, and um, we're prepared to do that. I think after six years of um, argy-bargy on this, making sure it's right uh, for an extra week is not too hard of an ask. Is there any other contribution? I intend to put the question uh, the amendment to the amended to the motion as moved by Senator McKim. I put, I put the question. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Um, can we just record that the no that um, the government voted no to this amendment? It's so recorded. I now put the amendment to the motion as amended by Senator McKim. So the date is the 14th of March 2023, but in the terms of the motion moved by the minister. I put the question, those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. I now put the, the motion that the report be adopted as amended. Those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Clark. A postponement notification has been lodged as follows. Business of the Senate number one for today to the 6th of February, and the committee has lodged an extension notification as shown at item 10 on the order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? Yeah, okay. I call on business of the Senate number two. Senator, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number two be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call the senator. I move the motion. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. We now come to uh, item 113 in the name of standing in the name of Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 113 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call the senator. I move the motion. I put, uh, Minister. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, the government will be opposing this motion and just remind Senator Faruqi that there is the Parliamentary Budget Office, which was established to inform the parliament by providing independent non-partisan analysis of budget cycle fiscal policy and financial implications of proposals, um, and that that could be used to provide the information she seeks. I intend to put the question. I put the question that the a motion be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. 
against no. no. I think the no's have it. No. Uh, sorry, I'll actually change that call. That was my error. I think the I think the uh, I think the eyes have it. No, have it. Mm. You know, divide anyway. Okay. Um, a division is required. Ring the bells. New take. Jack. Oh, lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 113, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi, be agreed to. The ayes should move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Scar as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
Hirishi. Senator Pocock, once the vote has started, once I've appointed tellers, no senator is to move. Thank you. Order. There being 44 ayes and 22 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I advise senators there may be further divisions. We now move to um, business, general business number 114, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 114 relating to the Meander Valley Council Bracknell Community Hall grant ward be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Wish Wilson. I move the motion. So the question is that uh, general business notice of motion number 114, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against? Uh, I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 115 to 118. There's obviously a few cobbled together. Uh, standing in the name of Senator Cox. Actually, uh, Senator I, Cox. I ask that general business notices of motion number 115 to 118 be taken together as formal motions. Is there any objection to these motions being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Cox. I move the motions. So the question is that general business notice of motions number 115 to 118 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion numbers 115 to 118, standing in the name of Senator Cox, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes. Uh, Senator Rustin, I'm just about to call the second teller, and Senator Scar as teller for the noes. I can call you if you want. Order. There being 15 ayes and 41 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now move to general business notice of motion number 119, standing in the name of Senator McKenzie. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 119, um, seeking for the government to release their secret report uh, into coal-fired power station closures. Uh, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator McKenzie. <laughs> uh, I move the motion standing in my name and hope the government does the right thing. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McKenzie, 119, uh, of general business be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. A against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required? Do you want? Four. Four, uh, ring the bells for four minutes.
Order. I lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 119, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie, be agreed to. Those of that opinion shall move to the right of the chair. Uh, those against shall move to the left. I appoint Senator Scar as teller for the eyes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the nose. Order. There being 30 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Um, I believe Senator Gallagher is seeking the call. Um, President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the routine of business for today. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. I move that, after consideration of the Animal Health Australia and Plant Health Australia funding legislation, Amendment Bill 2022 has concluded the questions on all remaining stages of the financial sector reform bill 2022 only be put without debate and paragraph A operate as a limitation of debate under Standing Order 142. Thank you, Minister. So the question is that the motion as moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Ring the bells. Do you, um, bells for one minute. Yeah, we'll, yeah, just make it four, Jackie.
one. Yes, that's right. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Scar as teller for the noes. Order, there being 36 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I believe we have some committee memberships. I call the clerk. Call me first. <clears throat> the president has received letters nominating senators to be members of committees. I call the minister. Uh, thank you. I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to committees. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that senators be appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Thank you.
The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 4 Bill 2020-2022 and Treasury Laws Amendment uh, Measures Bill 2022. I call the Minister. Uh, thank you. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, minister. Oh, I, call, I call the where am I? Oh, I call the clerk. Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 4 Bill 2022. Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 5 Bill 2022. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned until 6 February 2023. Minister. Bills be listed as separate orders of the day. So the question is: the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The president has received a message from His Excellency the Governor General, notifying assent to six laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. Uh, I believe we're back to business. Uh, I'll call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Fair Work Legislation Amendment, Secure Jobs, Better Pay Bill 2022, in committee. The committee is considering the Fair Work Legislation Amendment, Secure Jobs, Better Pay Bill 2022, and amendments 1 to 68 on sheet PV124, moved by Senator Watt. The question is that amendments 1 to 34, 36 to 62 and 64 to 68 be agreed to. Senator Hanson-Young. Uh, Madam Chair, I ask that the question be put. The question is that the question be put. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that amendments 1 to 34, 36 to 62 and 64 to 68 be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. No, have Division it. required. Yes. Ring the bells for four minutes.
out. Where, where are we? So. Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the amendments 1 to 34, 36 to 62 and 64 to 68 be agreed to. These are government amendments moved by Senator Watt. Uh, those for the question pass to the right of the chair, to the nose, to the left of the chair. I point out to teller for the eyes, Senator Urquhart, and teller for the nose, Senator O'Sullivan. Honourable Senators, there being 35 ayes and 31 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. Okay. I have, there is an, as a consequence, there is another question that I put to the Committee of the Whole. That items 5, 8, 4 and 6, 6, 7 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. 
Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Is the division required? Yep. Ring the bells. Are the whips happy that I ring the bells ring for one minute? Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that items 584 and 667 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair. Nose to the left of the chair. I point as teller for the eyes, Senator O'Sullivan, and teller for the nose, Senator Urquhart. Knows it's passed in a negative. Honourable Senators, I have uh, a statement in relation to opposition amendments on sheets 1704 to 1711. The government amendments on sheet PV124 included amendments to the definition of small business for certain purposes. Amendments 45, 50 and 56 changed the size of small business to 20 employees. As those amendments have been agreed to, the series of amendments circulated by Senator Cash that also seek to change the size of small businesses are contrary to Standing Order 1182. That standing order provides that no amendments can be proposed which are substantially the same as, as one already negative 
by the committee or which are inconsistent with one that has been agreed to by the committee unless a recommittal of the bill has intervened. As such, it is not in order for those amendments to be moved. So we now come to Chair, yes. Make a statement in relation well, we're to in this. committee. Thank so you very much, Senator Cash. So call. In relation to the statement that you have just made, mm -hmm. let me be very clear to this place. I disagree with it, and the reason I disagree with it is this: we are moving amendments to protect small and medium businesses in Australia from being compelled to bargain against their will in circumstances that they have never asked for. Right. And, Chair, with all due respect, if you are telling me there is not a difference between a small business that has 20 employees and a business that has 200, I'm going to call you out and say you are wrong. If you are telling me that there is no difference between a small business in Australia that has 20 employees and one that has 175, I'll tell you you are wrong. If you are telling me there is no difference between a small business in Australia that has 20 employees and one that has 150 employees, again, Chair, you are wrong. If you are telling me that there is no difference between a small business in Australia and a business that has 125 employees, I am telling you you are wrong. If you are telling me there is no difference between a small business in Australia and a business that has 100 employees, I am telling you, you are wrong. Senator McKim. On a point of order, Chair, I just seek your guidance in terms of uh, Senator Cash's direct criticism of a ruling that you have just made. If I might add a complete mischaracterisation of what you've just said, uh, it is my understanding that is well out of order, and I ask you for a ruling on that, please. I was allowing uh, Senator Cash to um, make a contribution, but uh, I've made the ruling. The ruling was taken on the advice of the clerk, and uh, my, my characterisation of Senator Cash's contribution is consistent with yours in that it's a criticism of, of, of my, ruling. my ruling. My ruling stands, Senator Cash. The ruling is in relation to the application of the standing orders. It doesn't apply to the actual amendment, it, the definition itself, which is what your contribution in, entails. The standing order says that you cannot make further amendments when an amendment has already been agreed to, in that the will of the committee of the whole has already been, been um, declared or articulated by the committee. And therefore, to do so, to criticise the ruling, is to criticise the decision of the Committee of the Whole. So I'm prepared to give you the call again, but, not in the, but if you wish to continue down the line you're taking, I will not, um, I will not give you the call. Uh, thank you, Chair. All I will say is this. This is, without a doubt, one of the greatest travesties businesses in Australia will ever face. The difference, quite frankly, between a business with 20 employees and a business with 21 is material to this debate. Why? Because a business with 20 or less is now excluded from the single stream of multi-employer bargaining. They can, yes, be compelled into the supported stream and they will face costs set out in the government's regulatory impact statement of around $14,500. But you see, Chair, with this ruling, which I respectfully disagree with, a business with but one more employee, but one more, will now face, will now face costs of in excess of $80,000 per business. And colleagues, I remind you that in the regulatory impact statement, it was dollars until during a committee stage, amazingly, colleagues, a committee stage, a committee, a committee into the, we were able to pick up that there was, and I quote the Minister for Small Business, such is her contempt for small business, that the $5,000 was merely a typo. A $5,000 that means 
businesses in Australia, according to the ruling that has been made, with 21 or more employees, will now be still roped into, be able to be compelled into, the changes to the single interest multi employer bargaining stream against their will against potentially they'll be bargaining with their competitors. The costs are clearly set out, clearly set out in the regulatory impact statement, $75,500 plus the small typo of $5,000. So to every business in Australia, this bill is going to pass and it's going to pass very soon. But let me be very, very clear on behalf of the Leader of the Opposition, Peter Dutton, on behalf of the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Susan Lee, on behalf of every member of the Liberal and National Party in this place and in the other. We will never stop defending you. We will stand by you every single step of the way. And the fact that this ruling says that, quite frankly, there is no difference, I say shame on the ruling, quite frankly. Shame on Labor and your contempt for small business Cash, and business in Australia. Are totally out of order. I'm I, I ask you to withdraw them. I withdraw, Chair. I am merely criticising the fact that, with this ruling, we are unable to now stand up for businesses in Australia with 200, 175, 150, 175, 50, 25 employees. And on behalf of all Liberals and Nationals across Australia, the fight doesn't stop. We've got your back and we'll stand up for you every day of the week. Senator Pocock, you have the call. Now, which one? I was first. Oh, on. sorry. I, I, I apologise. It's uh, the Pocock. I will allow you to arbitrate between the two of you. Senator Pocock, B. Are or? you happy for me to go first and then you? We're allowed to choose. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, Senator, Senator and thank you, thank you to David Pocock for gracefully allowing me to go first. Um, the Greens are supporting the government's amendments. Um, there are many elements in this bill that make our labour law take our labour law into the 21st century, that address the real work circumstances of Australians, that promise to end the fall in real wages, which means so many Australians right now struggle to be to be other than working poor, to work, they are in working poverty despite getting a wage. Their wages have not lifted for 10 years, and it's time to fix our labour law. It's time to improve justice for the millions of women who don't, can't predict their hours tomorrow or next week, the millions of workers who have become insecure and live insecurely with consequences for their children and their families. It's time to, to fix our labour law and make it address the real circumstances that affect millions of Australians, the flexibilities that they need to put together a job with the care of their kids, the care of a parent. We need to increase the wages of the low paid, the people who are looking after our kids, people in our aged care, in our disability care. We need to narrow the gender pay gap, which for 30 years, and certainly for the last 10, has not seen a narrowing. We need to more fairly support the one in two workers in our labour market now that are women. Some of the warriors in this place are fighting the industrial relations battles of last century. I've heard in this day and last night lines that would have, would have heard over successive struggles over industrial relations. It's time to move forward so that our labour law addresses the real issues affecting real Australians in their millions outside this place. Now, I want to specifically say something about the amendments which protect the better off overall test and put in place protections to prevent low-paid workers from going backwards. The government's original bill attempted to remove prospective employees from being considered under the Better Off Overall test when agreements were approved. The Greens were concerned that this would have left some workers worse off, and after negotiations with the government, we're pleased to see these amendments. These amendments will further ensure that future employees will be covered by the agreement that's considered by the Fair Work Commission when they're assessing an agreement against that better off overall test. The amendments also clarify that when applying the better off overall test and considering potential work patterns of current or future employees, the Fair Work Commission 
will have to assess any work patterns that the employer, union or employee considers reasonably foreseeable, with the Fair Work Commission having regard to the kind of business the employer is running. The bill establish an, establishes a new reconsideration process which allows employers, employees or unions to have agreements reconsidered against the better off overall test. These amendments will mean that if the Fair Work Commission changes an agreement because workers are worse off, those changes can be applied retrospectively, allowing workers to have their pay bat-tated to the time of the agreement. These amendments are an important win for workers, especially low-paid workers in retail and hospitality, so many of them young people, so many, pe so many of them without very much power in the labour market. The Better Off Overall Test in its essential important features has been preserved. Hence, for this and many other reasons, which we'll get to talk about this afternoon, we will, and we'll get to them, the Greens will be supporting this set of amendments. Thank you. And we have supported them. I'd now like to um, move the Greens' amendments on sheet, sheet 1776. In relation to unpaid social leave? That's moving out of the order. I, I know. We're trying to. Yep. OK. So I'd like to move the uh, amendments in relation to sheet 1776. That's amendments one to three on 1776. Yes. I seek leave Please. to move amendments yep. numbers one to three on sheet 1776. That's all right. I'm just, uh, just bear with me. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The amendments. This amendment will allow the Fair Work Commission to deal with employers who unfairly deny workers a request for an extension to unpaid parental leave. This will support parents to take the time they need to care for their child. Prior to this bill being introduced, only two of the 11 national employment standards—that's the right to request flexibility and the right to ask for an extension to, of unpaid parental leave—did not have an enforcement mechanism. What do you call a labour law without enforcement? It's a failed gesture, and it especially affects women. So it's telling that those two mechanisms, with the most important impacts for women, haven't had enforcement and now must, and we are going to correct that with this amendment. I'm pleased to see that Labor have listened to the Greens and included in this bill an enforcement ne mechanism for the right to request flexibility. That is a really significant step forward for the millions of people who want to work a different day or they want to change their start or finish time, simple things that make such a difference to them as they put together the care for someone else and a job. We also need an enforcement mechanism for employers who unfairly deny requests for an extension to unpaid parental leave. This is a really important thing for those who really need it. Their child is sick. Their plans haven't worked down on parental leave. They can't get childcare. This will allow them to get some backup when they seek an extension to their unpaid parental leave. We know we need to increase paid parental leave. We're so far from the international standard of 52 weeks of paid leave, and we need to move towards that as soon as we can. But this measure will back up those who need a, an increase in their unpaid leave now. It makes no sense to leave only one of the 11 national employment standards without an enforcement mechanism. So I'm delighted to move this, this uh, amendment, which will make a real difference to the lives of many, many Australians. Minister. Um, thanks, Chair, and thanks, uh, Senator B. Pocock, for that contribution. Um, uh, and the government will be supporting these amendments. Um, there are only two entitlements in the national employment standards that are unenforceable, the right to request a flexible working arrangement and the right to request an extension of unpaid parental leave. Uh, these entitlements are predominantly used by women. Um, I also thank Senator B. Pocock for pointing out that the bill was already providing dispute resolution uh, for one of these entitlements, flexible work. Um, we support this amendment and also provide dispute resolution for the right to request unpaid parental leave as well. Senator Hanson Young. I move that the question be put. I put the question that the question be put. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, I think the ayes have it. I put the question that the amendments on sheet 1776, 1 to 3, as moved by Senator B. Pocock, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Senator D. Pocock. 
You have the call. Thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move amendments one and two on sheet one seven eight zero and amendment and the amendment on sheet one seven eight one circulated in my name. Uh, can you please seek leave to move one and two together? Uh, did I not? Yes. I did, oh, you, you may have. I didn't hear you. Oh, you did. Is leave granted? Would you, would you? Leave is granted. But, but it's fine. Thank you. It's my the apology. amendments. Just Senator Pocock, you have the call. Uh, the amendments on sheet 1780 ensure that there will be a statutory review no later than two years after the commencement of the legislation. The review will look at, among other things, whether the operation of the amendments made by this Act is appropriate and effective, and identify any unintended consequences of the amendment made by this Act, and whether amendments to the Fair Work Act 2009 or any other legislation are necessary to improve the operation of the amendments made by this Act or rectify any unintended consequences identified. The persons who conduct the review must give the minister a written report of the review within six months of the commencement of the re review, and then the minister must then table a copy of the report within 15 sitting days. Amendment 1781 um, effectively extends the grace period from six to nine months uh, by altering the minimum bargaining period. This was something that came up repeatedly in the committee process. Senator Cash, did you have uh, the thank call? Thank you. Um, the coalition will not be supporting Senator Pocock's amendment requiring a review to commence after two years of the legislation coming into force. Uh, this amendment then gives six months before the review needs to be completed and a further 15 sitting days before it needs to be tabled. Given where we'll be in the electoral cycle, this amendment will essentially mean that it will be at least 2.5 years and possibly three years or longer before any review is actually completed and tabled in the parliament. Uh, the extreme changes being proposed and that will pass this chamber shortly by the government uh, need to be reviewed independently, we would say, and much sooner, uh, given the significant ramifications that this bill could have on Australian workplaces and the Australian economy. Uh, most concerningly, this amendment doesn't even say that the review be independent. There's nothing stopping the minister from getting his own department or one of his um, friends to conduct a review of the legislation uh, and literally saying glowing things which are not true. So we would argue, Senator Pocock, that it should be um, uh, a, an independent uh, review. Um, and in terms of, I understand you've also moved your amendment on sheet 1781. Correct. You at my leave together? Yep. Uh, in relation to sheet 1781, the coalition will not be supporting again Senator Pocock's amendment requiring that the minimum bargaining period increase from six to nine months. Uh, the amendment does nothing, quite frankly, to make what is an incredibly bad bill um, any better. Businesses will still be forced to bargain against their own will, potentially with their competitors. Uh, this amendment will undoubtedly only ring through the words of businesses across Australia, uh, more strikes and less jobs. Senator Pocock, B. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Greens will be supporting this amendment because it will make it less likely that arbitration could be misused by employers who want to remove hard-won conditions and wages. If employers disagree with the term of an expired enterprise agreement, the Greens are worried they could act in bad faith by simply refusing to negotiate and then roll the dice and hope the Commission arbitrates in their favour. The government's gone a long way to uh, removing employers terminating agreements as a bargaining tactic to undermine existing conditions, something we fully support. While the Greens have been able to secure some changes to help prevent employers undermining existing conditions, we flag this concern and will be paying close attention to ensure the arbitration provisions do not get abused by employers. This is something the statutory review, which we also support, needs to pay close attention to. I intend to put the question. I put the question that the amendments moved by Mr. Pocock, Senator Mr. Pocock, on sheets 1780 and 1781 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Aye. Against no. No. I think the ayes have it. Is a division required? Division is required. Ring the bells. <coughs>
trailer is watching. <laughs> Lock the doors. The question before the Committee of the Whole is that the amendments on sheets 1780 and 1781 as moved by D po Senator D. Pocock be agreed to. Those for the question move to the right of the chair, those against to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the ayes Senator Pratt and teller for the noes Senator O'Sullivan.
Representative, there being 35 ayes and 30 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. Senator Pocock. I the... seek... Thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move amendment, amendment numbers one to seven on sheet 1761 together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move the amendment. This amendment does two things. It widens the eligibility for the right to request flexibility and it establishes a positive duty in favour of creating flexible workplaces in Australia. It's 2022. Flexibility should be available to all employees, not just those with narrowly defined family responsibilities. It's only when seeking flexibility is something available to all that the stigma will be removed from asking for it and we'll see more men seeking flexibility and hopefully sharing domestic and care duties as a consequence. Wider eligibility for flexibility has been adopted in the UK based on clear evidence about its value and guess what? The sky has not fallen. The second part of this amendment establishes a positive duty to create flexible workplaces. A modern workplace should create an environment that actively anticipates and responds to the needs of its workers and doesn't require individuals to have to push for it, one, one by one individually, too often at risk of job security. So many employers already do this, talking to their employees. This am amendment will encourage others to create that positive, flexible environment. Senator Hanson Young. The amendment be put. The question be put. Uh, I'm going to put the question that the question be put. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Sorry, sorry. The question be put. The ayes have it. Any dissent? No. Good. I'm now going to put the question that the amendments on sheet 1761, as moved by. Senator B. Pocock, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. The ayes have it. Have it. Uh, is division required? Division is required. Ring the bells. I've asked the bills to be run for four minutes. Do we wish to change that? I'm seeking guidance from the whips. One, one. one. The bells will ring for one minute. Lock the doors. The question before the committee is that the amendments on sheet 1761 as moved by Senator B. Pocock be agreed to. Those for the question move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the ayes Senator McKim and teller for the noes Senator O'Sullivan.
there being 13 ayes and 39 noes, it's passed in the negative. Senator Pocock. Uh, just Senator Pocock, just wait until the microphone goes on. Thank you. I seek leave to move amendment numbers one to three on sheet one seven five eight together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Just bear with me, Senator Pocock. I just one seven. Just bear with me, Senator Pocock. I'm just finding it. Senator Pocock, you have the call. This amendment would enshrine in law a new minimum wage, a living wage. The rising cost of housing, energy, food and every, everyday essentials combined with low wage growth means that many working people are living in poverty. In a rich country like Australia, people earning the minimum wage shouldn't be struggling to make ends meet. This amendment lifts the national minimum wage to a living wage which we define, with, like many other countries, as 60 per cent of the median full-time weekly wage as determined by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. The amendments will allow the Fair Work Commission to determine the phase-in period and the amounts for this in increase, which should be no longer than six years. The Fair Work Commission must have regard in this amendment to matters including reducing inequality, the state of the economy and the circumstances of particular industries and classes of employers. The Greens recognise the government's intention to lift wages through this bill, and that's to be applauded and it's long overdue. But we believe we need to lift the floor of the minimum wage so workers aren't in poverty and inequality narrows. Senator Hanson Young. Ask that the question be put. I put the question to the question that the motion be put. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. I now put the question that the amendments on sheet 1758, 1 to 3, as moved by Senator B. Pocock, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair. I seek to move uh, my amendments 1 to 8 on sheet 1768 by leave together and wish to speak to that. Thank you. Proposing this bill, the government says the bill aims to secure jobs. My amendment on sheet 1768 goes to the heart of ensuring job security and protecting workers' rights. To ensure job security, my amendment on sheet 1768 ensures that unjustified vaccine discrimination is stamped out in employment. The original bill inserts breastfeeding, intersex status and gender identity as attributes that the Fair Work Act protects from discrimination. This amendment copies that approach and simply adds COVID-19 vaccination as an attribute protected from discrimination. The protection is still subject to the limits imposed on the other discrimination grounds in the Fair Work Act. An employer, for example, will not be in breach of the anti-discrimination grounds where the employer can prove, as they should have to, that it is a genuine and reasonable requirement of the position. The, this amendment is reasonable. In its approach, it is not radical because it uses and simply extends the existing mechanisms in the Fair Work Act. We've long known that COVID vaccines do not stop transmission. Before this became apparent, getting vaccinated, quote, to protect others, was the justification many businesses used to roll out vaccine mandates that squashed people's jobs and livelihoods and careers. As a condition of keeping their job, many employees were coerced and still are being coerced into receiving COVID vaccinations and boosters they do not want. These vaccine mandates cannot be justified given the fact that vaccines do not guarantee protection from transmission. Recently, the New South Wales Personal Injury Commission agrees with this view 
with workers' compensation being awarded for psychological distress stemming from the mandates in the determination of Dorking and the Secretary of the Department of Education handed down on the 3rd of November. Sometimes the wheels of justice turn slowly, yet we are happy that judicial bodies are taking up this self-evident position that broad vaccination mandates cannot be justified. Despite this, mandates are still in effect across the private sector. It's clear that further legislative action needs to be taken. Businesses are simply ignoring the evidence against unjustified vaccine mandates. A clear message needs to be sent that unreasonable directions that infringe on workers' rights have no place in Australian workplaces. Often, mandates do not even account for Australians that have accepted medical contraindications to vaccination. The Australian newspaper reports that Qantas sacked a pilot for failing to comply with the vaccination mandate while he was off work in a serious condition being treated for bowel cancer. Separately, I've met with a Qantas employee who, after being injected with the first COVID injection, was rushed to hospital with severe disability, possibly life-threatening, due to the COVID injection. After hospital care and partial recovery, he returned to work, where Qantas insisted he get the second injection. He contested it and is now on vastly reduced pay on workers' compensation. He fears his career with Qantas is finished. Discrimination. This amendment seeks to reinforce workers' rights. I'll say it again. This amendment seeks to reinforce workers' rights to refuse a workplace direction where it is not reasonable and justified requirement of the job. It leaves no doubt for employees and employers that vaccine mandates must not be in place unless there is a reasonable and justifiable need for them. Minister, given that businesses continue to ignore workers' rights in this area, will the government support this amendment to reinforce the decisions of the Fair Work Commission and codify protections for workers against unreasonable workplace directions? Minister. Are there any other contributions? Senator Canavan. I indicate to the Chamber that I will be supporting these amendments because I support workers' rights. And uh, a fundamental right, a fundamental right of every Australian should be the right to earn a livelihood to support their family. That should be a basic right. In fact, it's a right we have signed up to in the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. That is one of the enshrined rights, uh, enshrined human rights, uh, that we as a country have signed up to is the right to work, the right to work uh, to provide for your family. And with the introduction of vaccine mandates last year, we denied that right to, to, to thousands of Australians who were thrown out into the streets. Uh, and had no way uh, to provide for their families in the short term, at least. Now, now, they were never justifiable. Even I thought at the time there was not evidence that the vaccine stopped transmission, and really the only justification you could have to overturn and override that fundamental human right would be if, if somehow the vaccine or getting the vaccine protected another party, protected a third party. And I, and I said at the time, and I'll say again now, if we had such a vaccine that could stop COVID in its tracks, uh, and prevent that death, well, may, I would consider some limitations on other rights. That's the way rights work. If, if there is a right to life as well. And so sometimes we have to weigh these different human rights up. But if it wasn't apparent a year ago, it is clearly and starkly uh, uh, evident today that for whatever the merits of the coronavirus vaccines, they do not stop transmission. Someone else not having the vaccine is of no risk to you or anybody else uh, in our society. And we know that now because we've largely got rid of mandates in any case. Largely they're gone, but they are not completely removed. They still exist in the resources sector, uh, where, where, where I come from in central Queensland, where people have been locked out from their jobs uh, because uh, some companies have dug their heels in, if you like, and are may be embarrassed to back down on the very strong stances they took a year ago that have proven to be wrong. So we have an opportunity when we're debating this type of legislation to protect the rights of workers, uh, to protect the rights of individual Australians to provide for their families, and there just can be no justification now to continue these mandates. Keep in mind, too, that even if you supported the mandates, 
the, the mandates, I've never seen a mandate for a booster. I actually don't know. I think some health authorities might, but these companies, private companies, all of the mandates I've seen in private companies are for, are for the original two shots. And anyone who's took the original two shots on the, on the, on the timeline for most of us, that is by basically late last year, uh, they've already worn out. We know from the science. The science says after 12 months, well, after six months really, but after 12 months definitely, there is no more impact of those, of those first two shots. So if you thought this was an issue, or if these private companies thought there was a risk, why aren't they then mandating the third shot, the booster, or a fourth shot? They're not doing that because they, they'd lose all their workers or a lot of their workers if they did. So these have no basis in science. All they are doing is hurting Australian families, admittedly fewer than they were last year. Thankfully, most of these mandates, as, as I say, have gone. The state governments have largely got rid of them as in, in their laws. But there are still people being hurt by this. There are still people being harmed by it. They have no justification. And I will once again to stand up uh, for the rights of all Australian workers to make decisions about their health care uh, when it doesn't affect the health of others. Senator, Senator, Senator Antic. Thank you, um, thank you uh, Chair. Look, I, I just want to make some brief comments in support of this, and I thank uh, Senator Roberts for bringing this important amendment. Uh, and to add to uh, Senator Canavan's comments on, on the subject, look, I think this is a topic which um, has, has uh, indeed picked up some acceleration over the last period. We're not in uh, November or December 2021 anymore. We now know, in fact, a lot of the stuff we actually did know, many of us, at uh, this time last year. But that is now plainly evident. And as Senator Canavan said, the science is now settled on this issue. Uh, transmission uh, of the COVID uh, virus is not affected by uh, the use of these therapies. Uh, they are experimental therapies, Chair, and at the end of the day, people have to accept that. I know there's a degree of cynicism in this room, and there's a, a been a 12 months, 12 to 18 months of name-calling, anti-vax, and this, that, and the other. But the reality is that people have been forced into a very difficult decision uh, over the past 12 to 18 months to, in order to keep their livelihood or take a risk on this, on this therapy, uh, and that has been wrong. Uh, what we have seen the last two years, in my view, is one of the greatest scandals in Australian history, certainly in Australian medical history. Um, this parliament, this Senate, needs to take the opportunity now to support this amendment. I support this amendment to support it and allow people uh, the opportunity to return to work without the fear of losing their job because of a medical choice. Uh, there is no risk to the public. We have got um, private companies that are still engaging in this, uh, and we need to set the tone here now. We hear a lot about uh, the party of the workers, the Australian Labor Party. Well, let me tell you, the trade union movement bailed out on Australian workers on this issue. And, well, that's true. The, uh, with correction, the CMFEU. It would be a, bit a very interesting time where I'm, where I'm standing in, in defence of the CMFEU. But in any event, that is a very fair point, and I'll take that from Senator Canavan. Um, but largely speaking, um, there are workers out there, and if you'd seen the emails that come through my office and no doubt Senator Rennick's office on a daily basis, uh, there surely is some humanity left in this place. It's time for us to support this. I support it, and, um, and I ask that others do. Senator Rennick. Oh, well, well, here we are, the end of 2022, and we've had over 10 million cases of COVID. Uh, the Australian Health Department, of course, stopped counting around September sometime because I think it was getting too embarrassing to admit that despite with over 20 million people being vaccinated, over half the country had caught COVID. Whatever happened to protecting you? Whatever happened to protecting you? But we don't want to talk about that anymore. We'll just pull it off the website and not discuss it. We'll not discuss it. And then we've got the excess deaths that uh, Senator Babbitt talked about before. Uh, we had 8,706 extra deaths last year, despite the fact that New South Wales locked down for three months. So, in theory, the deaths should have been lower, like they were in 2020. But let's not count 2021 in the ABS, ABS figures. Or sorry, 2020, they're not counting. Let's pretend nothing happened there. Almost 140,000 jab injuries more than all the injuries reported from vaccines since 1971, more than all the injuries put together. You've got an injury rate that's three times higher, and yet the TGA don't want to look at the signal. The whole point of having a database where doctors report these injuries, where they tick the box suspected, and as the doctors say, they don't fill these forms out because they don't have the spare time. They don't have a lazy 20 or 30 minutes sitting around filling these forms out. If someone uh, fell off a bike, 
No, no, they're ticking uh, these boxes because they believe that the vaccine caused the injury that they are reporting. And yet the uh, TGA want to pretend that there's nothing to see here. And why wouldn't they? Because Professor Skerritt is head of an organisation uh, that is funded by Big Pharma. That is funded by Big Pharma. Now, if you want to talk about a conflict of interest, that's it. That's it. And these guys have no idea what they are talking about. I asked Professor Brendan Murphy, who was the chief health officer at the time, whether or not he'd actually read the non-clinical report into the Pfizer vaccine. Guess what? He hadn't read it. Despite that, he'd been saying for the last uh, a couple of days earlier that the spike protein wasn't in the blood. Well, had he read the report, he would have known that they never even tested the spike protein. And they would have also known that when they did the animal trials, that the report said there was no difference in lung inflammation between the placebo group and the vaccinated group after nine days. There was not one skerrick of evidence that showed that that vaccine was effective. But did anyone in this chamber right here, right now, actually read that report? I bet you not. But you all went out there and said it was safe and effective where you didn't have a clue what you were talking about. And shame on you. Because the law in this country, the law in this country, in the Australian Immunisation Register, says you cannot be coerced into taking a vaccine, number one, and number two is that you need to be properly informed about what is in the vaccine. Now you've got to dig very far to get to the bottom of this stuff, but that spike protein in the vaccine isn't even the same as the spike protein in the virus. No, 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 no. They've actually changed one of the nucleotides and they've actually got a synthetic gene in the vaccine. They've added 70 adene uh, uh, nucleotides to the poly A tail, which is designed to make it last longer. It's designed to last longer. The mRNA in the trials was shown to last for up to nine days. The lipids were shown to last at least two days, uh, and they stopped the trials, despite the fact that it doubled. It doubled. Yeah, listen to this, Senator Hanson Young. Despite the fact that the concentration of the lipids that are cationic, that are cationic, were doubled in the ovaries from day one to day two. You know what they did? They stopped the trial. They stopped the trial and they went and told everyone that it just stays at the site of injection. Well, that was a blatant lie. If you want to talk about misinformation, go and check out page 44 of the non Pfizer non-clinical trial report. It's, it was released on the TGA FIO disclosure log, 239-6. I've read it numerous times. And guess what? You should also read the top paragraph of page 8 that says that the study suggests that the spike protein can be either inserted into the membrane or secreted from the cell. Now, what does that tell you? I'll tell you what that tells you. It tells you that rather than actually killing the actual pathogen, which is what a normal vaccine would have done, this particular vaccine goes inside your cell, takes over the reproduction, the ribosomes, which is what produces the uh, protein, and then starts producing more of the toxic substance. That is not the name of the game. You would want to actually kill the virus. You do not want to reproduce it. And of course, Senator, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Brendan Murphy, the chief health officer, claims that there's nothing to worry about. He never read the document. And then we've got Professor Kelly. Of course, he came out and made the bold statement that it stops transmission. Well, he was lying because the FDA came out in December 20 and said that there was no evidence that the vaccine stopped transmission. And when I pressed him on it, there's no trials to show that there's any IgA in the mucosal system. Okay, you don't have to take my word for it. Go and speak to Robert Clancy, Australia's foremost immunologist and vaccinologist. Okay, he's retired. You can trust this guy. He's not on the take from Big Pharma or the big universities that aren't actually interested in research. They're just interested in lining their own pockets. And then, of course, we've got the vaccine injury scheme, which is just a joke. And today and last night and day after day for the last 15 months, I get contacted by people who have had their lives destroyed by this vaccine, a vaccine that the government said was safe and effective. And if that isn't bad enough that they, these people, and I'm looking at you people in this chamber here today, didn't read the documents, that took over someone else's body because it suited your narrative, 
your command and control narrative, you showed no humanity. No humanity. There are people out there that have not only injured, they have lost their jobs and they cannot get medical support to help them. There are husbands and wives of injured couples who have had to quit their jobs to stay home and look after those people who are, are being injured are an incredible amount of pain. And the fact that you're interjecting Senator Hanson Young just goes to show the type of person you are. How Senator dare Lennox. you come into Senator this Lennox. chamber? How dare Senator you Lennox. come into this chamber Senator and Lennox. start Senator mocking Lennox. the vaccine injured? Senator Waters, now, your point of order. Green... Senator Rennick, please sit down. Order. Se Senator Waters. Point of order reflecting on another senator as well as being odious and tedious. <laughs> Not the second part. Senator Rennick, just withdraw to the extent that you, you made an adverse inference. Well, the fact that the Greens Party can sit in that corner over there and mock and laugh the vaccine injured. These people aren't anti-vaxxers. They believed what the government told them, as I, as I did when I first came to this place. But I can tell you what, it's nothing but a, a cesspit of lies in this place. But the fact that the Greens Party think that they can just sit there and mock the injured. These people believed in the government. You want to talk about trust and transparency? Oh, yep, there's Senator Walters again mocking, going, come on. Maybe you should pick up the phone. Maybe you people should pick up the phone and talk to some of these people who have been injured. And then we go to the basis, the substance of this act, the Fair Work Act. This is a public health issue. The idea that businesses in this country can be responsible for the transmission of an airborne virus is just as absurd as the billions of dollars that are getting wasted on the idea of some, some tiny trace gas in the atmosphere you can control that. I mean, we are living in the land of, of, of the unicorn farmers and the intellectual pygmies who have just chasing the impossible dream like Sancho Panja chasing the windmills. It is absurd. And yet we stand here today, almost three years after the virus uh, uh, you know, broke out in China or whatever, and we have still got these ridiculous uh, mandates in so many places, in particular in the private industry, which is, which is what this amendment will address, and they are still being coerced into getting a vaccine. I've literally just had three messages in the last hour about people who are losing their jobs, not in the health sector, but in sectors that are outdoors, nothing to do. It is absurd. It is absurd. And it needs to stop. Because the state of emergency, even at the state government level, has been retracted. And yet these people here today do not want to grant people their autonomous right to control what goes in their body. And I might remind members of the LNP that one of our values is the dignity and worth of every individual. You know, we don't believe in multi-patent but pattern bargaining because we recognise that every business is unique, and we think that you know the employer and employee should have the first right in deciding what's best for them. That is what we believe in: in empowering the individuals to make the decisions that uh, you know suit their needs the best, and only the individual or the parent of the child can make that decision. But what we've got here today is typical command and control. We've got the Labor Party and the Greens protecting their own narrative, their own narrative that the government can save us. Govern me harder, Daddy. That is what these people believe in. Senator Canavan. I don't want to. I don't want, oh, sorry. 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 Senator Hanson Young. I move that the question be put and stop this rubbish. <laughs> I'm going to put the question that the question be put. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Is division required? Division is required. Bring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the committee is that the amendments on sheet one. Sorry, quick. My apologies. The, the question before the committee is that the question be put. Those for the question, question passed to the right of the chair. The noes to the left of the chair. I point as teller for the eyes, Senator Pratt. Do I have a, a, a volunteer teller, teller, Mr. Robert? Senator Roberts One teller. for the nose. She's a McAllister. I'm giving you my vote. I'm giving you my vote. McCarthy, I'm giving you my vote. Okay. That's it. Thanks, Senator Cox. David Pocock. David Pocock. Henderson. Felix.
Honourable Senators, there being 39 ayes and six noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. I will now put the original question that the amendments on sheet 1768, moved by Senator Roberts, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. 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 Against no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Bells be rung for one minute. Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the amendments on sheet 1768, moved by Senator Roberts, be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, those left of the chair. I point to Teller for the eyes, Senator Rennick. I'm going to give him some experience. And Teller for the nose, Senator Pratt. There being six eyes and 40 noes, it's passed in the negative. As it is past 5.30 p.m., the committee will report to the Senate.
committee reports progress.